Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome so many of you to our second international conference entitled uh, Reflections for Climate Change 2023. We're of course here at the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. The aim this year, it's quite important, is to look at how we implement regulation when it comes to climate change. Now, Climate change is, without a doubt, one of our most pressing issues uh, currently facing the world, you might say, in the 21st century. The idea here is that alarming data, be it scientific, uh, be it research, is showing that the time to act more than ever is now. Now, the foundations for global governance when it comes to climate change have already been laid. You'll see that countries across the world have put in place uh, commitments, milestones, policies to fight climate change. Despite what's clear progress in some areas, we're still not where we need to be. So today, our Reflections 2023 uh, conference is all about giving a platform to talk about good practice. On stage with me today, you'll see a number of people. We'll have scientists, we'll have academics, we'll have researchers, students, activists, a real whole host of people to talk to you about good practice in terms of fighting uh, climate change. Now, you'll see some of the advances that have been made in various different sectors, be it the energy sector, the climate sector. You'll also see some of the challenges that lie ahead on this very rocky road to mobilizing people against climate change. My name is Rochelle Ferguson. I'll be your host today. I'd like to declare this Reflections 2023 conference officially open. Welcome, everyone. So to get things started, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Eric Labay, who's of course the chairman and the president of the, the uh, Institut Polytechnique de Paris and the École Polytechnique. Eric uh, would like to talk to us today about science and education, and particularly, Eric, I think you'll agree where Paris or IP Paris is when it comes to mobilising uh, in the fight against climate change. Eric, over to you. So good morning to everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome all, all of you at uh, Ecole Polytechnique in the Poincaré Lecture Hall uh, from this famous mathematician. And I want to welcome you see the ones who are in the lecture hall, but also the uh, older ones. I think around 450 are uh, following uh, the symposium online. So uh, welcome to everyone from wherever you are. And uh, we look forward, obviously, to a lot of interactions during the day. As uh, it was mentioned already, the, the climate evolution is uh, obviously profoundly altering our way of living, working. We are all aware that climate change represents a serious societal uh, issue, societal threat, and that we need to address and uh, go to actions in a very active way. This uh, conference reflection is a unique initiative, as it was mentioned, taken by Institut Politique de Paris. So, I remind everyone that Institut Politique de Paris is both old and new, uh, new since we have been created in uh, 2019, so four years ago, uh, we just celebrated the fourth anniversary, but it's also the alliance of five schools uh, working together with hundreds of, uh, or a few centuries of history, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, Ensta Paris, Ensa Paris, Telecom Paris, and Telecom Sud Paris, all these schools being obviously on our campus here at Institut Polytechnique de Paris. And our goal, it was mentioned, science and technology for common good. Uh, our goal is to contribute to the sustainable transition. And we want to bring perspectives, we want to bring solutions, and we want also to become an academic, uh, let's say, platform of exchange between all the stakeholders that need to come together to develop these solutions and make that happen. So that's why in this uh, second edition of Reflection, we want to focus on regulation as one of the key levers that needs to be uh, define, pull to mitigate climate change. As you know, it's a second edition of Reflection, because the first one was, in fact, in 2019. It was at, at that time, I would say, Ecole Polytechnique had uh, taken this initiative, because it was the 225th anniversary of the school. And uh, we committed in 2019, after contribution to 225 years of development, economic development, to commit to 225 years of sustainable development because the paradigm has a bit shifted 
and it was really put at the core of the school. And since it has been at the core of Institut Pays de Paris, the five schools together, to commit to, to this engagement. And since we have been, I think, among the first institutions to publish a climate plan, at least in France, I know many climate plans have been developed by many universities around the world, uh, but we, uh, we, we started pulling together uh, all our activities and putting really sustainable development at the core of uh, our mission and all the things we do on campus. And I'm going to say, in fact, a few words about that. I do believe, in fact, that higher education institutions have a role to play, and uh, in, obviously on global warming, a, a role to play on many dimensions. Since scientists have published their warnings on the threat of rising temperature in the 1970s, the higher education and research institutions have constantly been at the forefront of the battle. They have played a crucial role as they raised awareness, substantiated the reality of climate change, and provided guidance, advice, that led to significant commitments, such as those made by the international community at the Paris Agreement in 2015. The role higher education and research institutions are to play is even more important today, and they are instrumental to achieve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, defined by the, by the UN. The SDGs are interconnected, and they encompass various missions of universities, scientific research, research in social sciences, that provide new insights as we can harness to fight climate change. On the other hand, universities educate the future generation, already very committed to sustainability. And it is our duty to equip them with the necessary knowledge, competencies to build a sustainable future, and they will start their careers, and they are the future leaders of the society. At the European level, and we have been part of a major alliance called Eurotech, universities, the leading science and technology universities with EPFL, with TUM in Munich, with TU Eindhoven, DTU in Copenhagen, and Technion. Uh, we have been together also fully committed to the European Green Deal to develop a roadmap for a climate neutral Europe. During the last year uh, work, and uh, Polytechnic was the president or had the presidents of the alliance, we put sustainability at the core of the discussion. And a few days ago, I had uh, all the presidents were there, and, you know, reviewing our progress uh, in our work, and we had you know a lot of actions around sustainability, be in training, be in research, innovation, getting the European dynamic together, and we re restated or recommitted uh, to uh, integrate all the challenges posed by sustainable development into our training, be initial training, lifelong training. Uh, to continue to make advance at the, in the research, to go at the frontiers of the research uh, in order to achieve absolute sustainability, but also to develop you know, technological innovation, practical solutions to address these world's acute problems. Now, let me deepen a bit what are our levers. As I mentioned, we are committed, we want to make things happen. Uh, what are the specific levers that overall university pool, and in particular, we have been pulling at Institut Polytechnique de Paris. First, education. As I said, we educate young people on climate change issues, understanding both the scientific element, but also the social, economic, environmental implications they will take or they will have for their future careers. It is our duty to prepare them to adapt for a new world. And to achieve this, we can rely on high-level training programs backed by cutting-edge research. Our five institutions educate students on the challenges brought about by climate change and the importance of sustainable development. We have mandatory seminars that have been put in place on the scientific foundation of climate change, but also uh, we get now new certificates, specialization on these topics. The ultimate goal is to really put sustainable development in every course to draw from every scientific, economic, social science course the implications on climate change and how every discipline can contribute. Which leads me to the second pillar of what we have been doing, which is around research. And as we know, to solve climate change, we need, we need interdisciplinary approach. It's fundamental to get all disciplines to work together to provide the necessary infrastructure and resources to new discoveries and findings. Institut Politique de Paris has been an advocate, it's, at the, it's in the DNA of its school, uh, that interdisciplinary approach, interdisciplinary training 
is fundamental to progress. And this, our centre is comprised of 30 laboratories, 1,300 researchers from natural sciences, mathematics, physics, computer science, to economics, social sciences, and humanities. And we have launched, as a pillar of our work, a centre, in fact, four years ago, at the time of reflection, the first uh, seminar, uh, uh, interdisciplinary centre we call E4C, Energy for Climate, and we have been doing that with uh, our partner, Ecole des Ponts, uh, and their leaders of Ecole des Ponts are with us today also, as a way of engaging uh, around the energy transition, uh, primarily through research, but also feeding our education programmes and innovation. We have roughly 30 laboratories that are dedicated to four cross-cutting themes. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions, obviously fundamental to, uh, for the future, but also enhancing energy efficiency, implementing renewable energy distribution, and evaluating public policies. The researchers collaborate with industrial partners and combine expertise from social and economic sciences material sciences and engineering, applied mathematics, computer science, and geophysics. Some of them obviously are with us today, and Philippe Drobinski, who is the director of the center, will be one of the speakers during the day. And over the last year, E4C has published many papers, many publications, uh, contributed also to the first MEDEC report, the Mediterranean IPCC. In addition, and this is special, I think, to uh, Institut Point de Paris, uh, E4C has developed demonstrators on our campus, which also brings me to my next point around our campus. Because among our engagement and commitment, we want our campus, its building, our community, to develop new ways of living on the campus, new ways of energy production and consumption. In particular, one of the aspects has been to uh, develop these demonstrators through the research, through E4C, and also to develop some prototypes for green energy on our campus. For example, a prototype is piloting the energy consumption on one of the buildings. Another one is working on you know, en enhancing progress on CO2 capture and storage technologies. We have an electric smart grid uh, that has been installed on the Drake's Innovation Center, which is our startup incubator. And this smart grid was developed in collaboration with several startups and the support of the European Commission. We are also proud that the CIRTA that you may see when you leave the building, you know, on the other side of the lake, which is a major climate observatory, is on our campus. And one element maybe to, uh, uh, to share with you, as you would expect, uh, we have been monitoring many, many dimensions at the CIRTA for 20 years. One of them is temperature. And I can confirm that temperature has increased on the plateau at Polytechnic by 1.5 degree in 20 years. So 1.5 degree in 20 years. And so we see it in the report, but we see it here, we feel it, and our, uh, our observatory is one of the contributors, which really highlights, again, uh, you know, what trajectory should we expect, on which trajectory are we going to work over the next 10, 20 years, between now, 2030, and 2050. Campus-wise, we're also reviewing our uh, footprint, because we did a, an assessment of our footprint. We have put a, target of 20% reduction for the, between 2022 to 2026. And now we are uh, already, you know, have been reduced, uh, reducing 10% by 10% our energy consumption, both electricity and gas. And we're on the way of reducing by 20% between now and 2026. And moreover, as you may have seen, cars are no longer allowed uh, in the center of the campus. You can arrive on the campus by car but to try to promote uh, nice mobility and green mobility on campus, bicycle, electric cars, and simply walking, uh, which is great, uh, between the different uh, buildings and universities. Last element of what we have been committed to is innovation, as you may expect, which is a third pillar of what we do, education, research, innovation. And here our uh, Drake's center, innovation center, has been booming over the past few years. And green tech uh, startups represent now 20 to 25% of the activity of the center, uh, covering a broad range of uh, topics from uh, energy efficiency tools to new battery uh, materials to, uh, for electric vehicles. And uh, we want, obviously, to uh, uh, continue to energize the, you know, what is coming out of the lab or what is coming out of the, uh, uh, the student ideas, as well as the dynamic we have on the campus 
uh, on the plateau, in fact, itself, the Paris-Saclay plateau, where we have really uh, one of the best clusters in the world in terms of quality of research, and we need to drive and continue on innovation, in particular on green tech. Finally, as an engaged community, uh, we also need to transform the way we work, and every profession uh, on this campus has to change, uh, has to evolve, and we have been uh, re working with uh, all departments, administrative departments, uh, support departments, uh, obviously the research department and so on, to see how do we evolve to ensure everybody includes sustainable development in their thinking, in their action, see, you know, everybody has uh, something to do uh, to move the needle and then to make us succeed in our aspiration. And for example, we have today 50% of our purchases meet corporate social responsibility criteria, which has been a big, big work of the past few years, and we continue to uh, raise this aspiration. Also, each uh, employee of uh, IP Paris will be asked to attend a basic sustainability course on the transformation of their activities towards an ecological transition. So as you can see, Institut Pays de Paris is fully engaged to be an actor, uh, definitely engaged actor, providing education, research, innovation, transformation of its own operation to bring something and make a change, make a difference on sustainability and climate change. Now, let me conclude maybe by saying a word about regulation, um, because it's one element of, uh, of the drivers. As you know, the, um, uh, what we need to do if we want to succeed is to change our way of production and our ways of consumption. That's major evolution, maybe the, the biggest change since industrial revolution in the last 200 years, because a lot of things have to change. And for that, technology is at the core, but technology is not enough to drive uh, the transformation. The change of behaviors, the reallocation of capital, uh, the evolution of the jobs, transformation of what people are going to do is going to be critical if we want to succeed. And for that, regulation is one of the levers. And very often in economy, regulation drives a lot of the activity of the actors, uh, be the producer or the consumers. And so it's why we thought that this time we would take this element on which obviously we have a lot of scientific perspective and we'll hear from some of the researchers of Institut de Paris, but also regulation impacting all the stakeholders. It's important to have all the stakeholders together to discuss what uh, regulation should do or will do, uh, knowing that in regulation you can have a binding regulation, imposing things or incentivizing things, which I think is always an interesting discussion and I'm sure we'll have it today. So I believe, as I, as I just said, that the, uh, the shift that we need to have requires an evolution in regulation, be optional, be binding, uh, but in terms of the behaviors resulting from regulation, and clearly define an implemented regulation based on the learnings also of the research and new scientific knowledge are prerequisite for change. The involvement of the actors from the public and private sectors, as well as civil society, will allow to build long-term impactful regulation and policies. And it's why it's important to have the international community, all the national governments, uh, working with the different actors, NGOs, companies, scientists, through uh, different uh, bodies, groups of discussion. And I would say today, we uh, aspire to have a group of discussion to generate ideas and actions going forward. Climate change is a global issue that can only be addressed by working at all levels, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, and in particular, it is essential to strengthen international cooperation, ensuring the implementation of coordinated policies, including binding regulation, such as treaties. As an international institution of education and research, we have to, to produce scientific facts in order to guide public policies. I believe scientific expertise is paramount for decision makers, to enable them to make the right decisions. And you can count on Institut Politique de Paris to continue to provide this expertise at the frontier of the knowledge to ensure the best decision making. Now, in the program, we saw it in the incoming video, uh, we, uh, we see that regulation obviously impacts a lot of actions. And I'm glad to see that obviously energy is going to be a, is a key element, you know, uh, uh, energy without carbon emission. How scientific discovery and regulation can drive the aspiration we have on energy production. Finance, we know capital allocation is critical to, uh, to succeed in the transformation. 
and how can or should regulation impact this capital reallocation. The question about consumer is a, a, an everyday question. We are consumers. We have behaviors. How, you know, to which extent regulation is going to drive, impose, or incentivize a change in behaviors. I look forward to the discussion uh, from that standpoint uh, because it's, uh, we, we, we saw in the past few years some impact of regulation on behaviors and uh, in terms of the tax on, on, on gas. So uh, this discussion obviously is critical. And the last one, the session four, tell us more about the multi-actor element, which is uh, to drive the regulation, actors need to get together to see what are you know, the right level of regulation to make sure there is enthusiasm, if I may say, uh, to change behaviors and production. So I simply look forward to our discussion today. And uh, I want uh, maybe to, uh, to conclude uh, by saying that uh, we, uh, we look forward, obviously, to uh, make the uh, uh, Reflexion Symposium uh, a great place of exchange, great place of uh, ideas, propositions, perspectives. And uh, I want to uh, simply thank all those who have made this symposium uh, possible. Uh, the support of the Ministry of Energy Transition, Minister Agnès pannier runacher will say a few words after me. Obviously, all the speakers who have been coming from uh, very far for, for some of them, but all of them being here today um, is, is really great. I want to thank, obviously, the partner schools of IP Paris, the five schools, and Ecole des Ponts uh, for our joint work on, on E4C. Um, also, uh, BNP Paribas, who is one of the sponsors supporting the research of E4C and, and this symposium, the academic body and the researchers for their commitment, as well as the students who are taking part in the debate and uh, who are also uh, going to, uh, uh, to, uh, to share questions and perspectives later on. And finally, the organizing team, which has done a terrific uh, job in the last few months to organize and, uh, and get all of us here today, be in the room or uh, digitally. So again, thanks to everyone. I look forward to the debates. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to the debates, obviously, on stage, as well as around the symposium for those who are here today. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, Eric, a big thank you for giving us uh, some greater insight into uh, the work that's happening here at IP Paris. You spoke about sustainability uh, being at the core of things. Um, interesting, a lot of speakers have taken the time to come here today. Uh, it's worth noting as well that there are hundreds of uh, people who are tuning in uh, online uh, to watch uh, this event, watch our speakers uh, come up and, and share uh, this notion of good practice that we've spoken about. So many, many people uh, tuned in uh, via the internet. Um, sustainability at work, potentially. Well, they didn't want to take the train, the cars to come in. They're watching us uh, from the comfort of uh, their own homes or workplaces. So thanks again, Eric. Um, I'd like to uh, go to a video from uh, Agnès Pannier-Runacher. Uh, She's the Minister for uh, Transition, or Energy Transition, I should say, here in France. Uh, Agnès will be joining us, as I say, by a video link. Many of you will know she was nominated to the post at last May. Uh, since then, she's been looking at France's energy and climate strategy, and also looking about how renewable, renewable sources can be uh, implemented more effectively. So I'll leave you to watch uh, Agnès's video. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't be with you today, but I wanted to address you this message for this event that you dedicate to the crucial matter of the regulations against climate change. This topic is key because, as the IPCC's experts tell us, we are in a race against time to fight climate change and its consequences. As the Minister for Energy Transition, I carry Emmanuel Macron's ambition to make France the first major country in the world to phase out fossil fuels. To achieve this ambition, our strategy is based on two main pillars. First, reducing our energy consumption through energy sufficiency and efficiency. And regarding sufficiency, we are now heading in Europe with what is seen as the most advanced policy. Second, increasing our production of decarbonized energy thanks to renewable energies 
and nuclear power. Thanks to these levers, we managed to reduce by 2.7% our CO2 emissions last year. This is in line with our international targets, but we know that we will need to accelerate. At the international level, we are running for a great climate ambition. First, by being pioneers on the European level in the field of climate regulation, we recently adopted Fit for 55, the most ambitious climate package in the world. It will enable the European Union to reduce its emissions by 55% by 2030 and to reach climate neutrality by 2050. The 3,500 pages of legislation and regulatory measures provide a climate roadmap for every sector – transportation, housing, shipping, agriculture, industry. Furthermore, we need to maintain our ambitions at the international scale. In the perspective of this year's COP28, we must keep our 1.5 degree target alive at all costs. Therefore, we must abandon all fossil fuels. We are at work with our international partners, especially producing countries, to build ambitious commitments upon this matter in provision of COP28. This is a tough target. We must also give every country the means to achieve a fair transition and therefore we also need a funding big bang. This is why, in a few days, France will host a summit for a new global financial pact to help developing countries invest in their energy transition. Fighting climate change requires our general mobilization. So have a great event and let's keep working together. OK, so ultimately, uh, climate change, we can see, is a very... We'll get stuck back into our conference. Climate change is a passionate issue. There are many people, as you can see, that are, are passionate about it, who've got things to say. This brings us to a, a very interesting point, because uh, if I turn your attention to this uh, green poster over there, I don't know if I'll... Uh, you can all see it over there. Some of you will have done it already. If you do have a question, if you do want to participate in today's event, you are most welcome to do it via our question and answer section. So what you do, you take your telephone, you scan the QR code. At that point, you'll have the opportunity to type in your questions, OK? There might be somebody on stage that you'd like to answer a question to. There might be a general uh, response from the panel that you're looking for. If you go over there, you get your QR code, those questions will be filtered through to us, and we'll be able to ask them at the end of our roundtables, OK? We've got IP Paris students who are ready to come up and give those questions. Please ask those questions. It's an interactive conference, OK? so. We're going to get stuck into our first round table. The question is specifically on the energy sector and how developing science-based regulation is moving forward. Um, what I'd like to say is we're going to listen to a keynote speech, first of all, from Teresa Rivera. She is uh, the... Um, she is the Vice President of the Government of Spain. She's also the Minister of Ecological uh, Transition. She'll be sharing with us some of the obstacles that Spain is facing when it comes to climate change, and also how the country is approaching carbon neutrality, a goal that they're hoping to meet by 2050. Let's have a listen to Teresa Riviera. Bonjour, c'est un grand honneur d'être invité à participer à cette conférence si important. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this very important conference in this very important and tricky point in time. We are discussing about energy, about climate, about the prosperity, safety and equity in the humankind. How we can ensure that we all have access to modern sources of energy in a way that do not deplete the resources of the planet. This is a very important moment for everybody, but in particular for Europe. We are thinking how we can change our energy system, how we can draw lessons from, with who, what, from what we have been learning all along decades, and very much in particular during the last year, with the invasion of Ukraine 
and the impacts in the energy security and the economy. In a context where we have to respond to the main question mark, where are we concerning the uh, fulfillment of the Paris Agreement targets dealing with climate? The response is not very good. We have much to do. And this is very precisely what we want to push forward during the presidency of the Council of the European Union by Spain. We think that uh, we have learned a lot. We think that there are many things that we can apply from the time being. And we know that the Fit for 55 package needs to arrive to the final uh, solution, to the final deal, so to ensure that we, working together, are able to respond to the climate and energy crisis. This is a very important point that we could like to underline. I am convinced that it is much better to do it together, to build on our common infrastructures, on our complementarities, to build much more Europe according to the main drives, the main lines in the energy and climate policies, a real energy and climate European policy. The energy transition is not anything new. We knew that we had to push for a very deep transformation of our energy systems, but now it becomes absolutely urgent to do so. The fact that Russia invaded Ukraine did create this tension alongside the elements, the question marks on how we could ensure the supply of our needs, taking into consideration the high dependence from abroad. This is very interesting because, in fact, we count on the local capacities, on the local resources and the local innovation improvements that could provide a large share of the response that we need in terms of energy. So we know that we need to diversify our suppliers. We need to invest in much more renewable energy solutions to combine local and global needs in a way that provides profits for the local communities taking into consideration the need to ensure to save our uh, natural resources, our ecosystems, but also the local communities, the local societies, to invest in further innovation, in further performance of the renewable energy solutions. We need to strengthen our complementarities to be sure that we can connect our infrastructures. We need uh, to provide solutions that uh, could be applied whenever any disruptive event comes back again in our system, so that we have the flexibility to count on different sources, so that we count on the flexibility on count on different solutions. At the same time, we are convinced that the energy savings, the energy efficiency, being intelligent, being smart when using energy is the very first recommendation for anyone in the European continent and elsewhere in the world. This is something that challenges the public opinion. What does this mean, this very intense and sophisticated change in such a short period of time? And this is normal and we need to bear that. We need to understand that we need to provide a platform to shape consensus, to reach agreement among the local communities, among the investors, among the public institutions being in charge of promoting this energy transition. This is not an easy task, taking into consideration knowledge, social concerns, but also environmental and energy needs. This is why being sure that people can take place in this participative process and being aware of the need uh, to get the local communities the benefits that uh, the new investments may provide in the neighborhood is very important. What uh, have we done in Spain? We worked since the very first moment so to ensure that we could work on an energy and climate framework that could provide the basis for this decision for this discussion, for this um, understanding on how to perform in the time to come. There were technological goals, but there were also reflections on how we could combine the different capacities in the different regions. And this was open to the public contestation, to the public discussion. And this was the basis for what we did since the very first moment. And there are many things to be combined. Some of them need um, an agreement at the European level because we know that the needs have changed. We need to invest in renewable energy solutions, in the very proof uh, grid systems that ensure that we can transport electricity uh, whenever, wherever, and in a very secure manner. We need to ensure that we can count on storage solutions and the storage business case needs to be built around the regulation. We know that digitalization of the grid and security could be very important. We know that now it is not anymore five, six, seven, 10, 
100 plants. It is many thousands of small producers of energy that do count in the system and the grid needs to provide a safe system so to ensure that going backs and forwards do work in the electricity system. We need to electrify final uses to the extent possible. We need to work together at the European level so that we can keep on the investment so to develop new solutions to get rid of gas to the extent possible and as soon as possible whenever we use green hydrogen, to get used to facilitate access to other sources of renewable gases so to ensure that we can get into the circular economy solutions but also to facilitate the phase out of natural gas. To ensure that mobility is electrified as soon as possible in a way that it is affordable for the consumers. To be sure that consumers, citizens, should be at the core of our decisions, so that the just transition takes place not only for workers, but also for consumers. They can access to the benefits of this transformation as soon as possible. The risk in the investment decisions, ensuring a stable, stable, sorry, stable and predictable marketplace, facilitating the technology investments, ensuring that the academia do work not only at the technical level but also in social science so to facilitate this transformation that to a certain extent is a very relevant important cultural mindset change. Doing this together is the best way to get a success. Doing this in a fragmented manner is a certain risk to get a success. Well, you heard from T Teresa Ribeira there, doing this together is the way uh, that key to success. Uh, so says uh, Teresa, a very big uh, thank you to her. She is, is uh, the uh, Minister of Ecological Transition for Spain. Uh, let's get stuck in then to our first round table. Now, the key uh, message of this first round table is how to uh, develop science and new energy uh, regulation. Uh, I'd like to welcome on stage Valerie masson delmont She's co-chair of Working Group 1 of the IPCC and a climate scientist at uh, Paris Saclay. Uh, so up you come for us, uh, Valerie, if you would. Um, we equally have... We we can, we can applaud, absolutely. Welcome, Valerie. We have uh, Philip Drobinski, who is a director of the Energy for Climate Centre. Uh, welcome to you, Philippe. Laurence Taviana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation. Welcome to you, Laurence. And Estelle Braklianoff, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Viola. Welcome to you. Just a quick reminder before we do this, there is a way to ask questions at this conference. The way is, as I said before, scanning that QR code and then filtering your questions and our IP Paris students will come up later uh, to get those questions out. So there is a way of doing this uh, for our debate. All right, I'd like to start then with uh, Valerie, if I may, Valerie. You're a senior scientist, okay, a, a climate scientist. Um, in your field, it would be good to get a sense of how, uh, how successful informing policies and regulations are in terms of mitigating uh, climate change. So it's quite timely today because yesterday with a group of 50 scientists, we released an update of key indicators of the state of global climate, updating the results transparently grounded in the same methods and data sets as in the 2021 IPCC climate report, which is a, a, a reference uh, for the, the, the state of knowledge. And we show that global greenhouse gas emissions up to 2022 have continued to increase, but with a stagnation of the CO2 emissions from the fossil fuel sector. So um, what is really critical is that the effect on climate for CO2 is associated with the sum, the cumulative CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So if emissions stay at the same level, the climate effect continues to increase. And as a result from these increased emissions, what we see is an increase in, in global warming, now reaching 1.15 degrees Celsius. And we have also updated the estimate of the remaining carbon budget. So the margin, the window of opportunity we still have to limit warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
And in 2021, we estimated that remaining carbon budget to be 500 billion tons of CO2 um, and revised now due to more warming, due to human influence, due to more emissions and a better way of accounting for non-CO2 effects. Uh, this uh, remaining carbon budget has been divided by two. Only 250 billion tons of CO2, which is about six years at today's rates of emissions. So, what can I say about being su successful? <laughs> um, what we see is, uh, from in particular the 2023 IPCC synthesis report, is that, of course, climate action is progressing, but clearly not at the pace not at the scale required for governments to just be consistent with their own goals, um, limiting warming well below 2 degrees and close to 1.5 degrees. I, I want to get a sense from you, Valerie, how alarmed, you've given us a lot of interesting data there, how alarmed should we be by what you're seeing as a, a climate scientist? I, incredibly worried? I think uh, there are three main words I like to use related to the IPCC synthesis report, beyond the numbers I just provided. Mm -hmm. um, what is really striking is um, the widespread impacts of a changing climate in every region, the committed implications on the very long term, including sea level rise, due to already past emissions. And so the, the two words that first come to mind are um, the seriousness of the situation, mm -hmm. including, you know, facing limits to adaptation and losses and damages. And the second one is the urgency of changing pace and scale of climate action, not small steps, but really engaging into transformations mm -hmm. to include resilience to a changing climate, including for the energy system, and reducing emissions at a faster pace. And if we just look at France, the challenge for France, which is one of the 18 countries which has demonstrated the ability to reduce emissions for decades, including the accounting for trade and imports. The challenge for France is doubling the rate of mm. annual emission reductions in the coming years. So this gives just a sense of urgency. And the third aspect is through advances in effective governance, lessons learned from what has been tested and tried, uh, lessons learned from regulation that is known to work. Um, uh, we have options available to both strengthen adaptation in each sector and uh, to reduce emissions by a factor of two globally between now and 2030. And what is missing is finance, a gap of a factor of three to six between what would be needed for these options to be implemented and what is available in terms of climate finance. And I think effective governance is also key. Well, let's stay with this effective government, you, you, uh, governance. rather. You spoke about France as being kind of on the right track in some ways, as several countries are, but still globally uh, more needed to be done. How difficult is it, Valerie, to, meet, uh, to make a consensus when it comes to kind of shared visions and observations? Are we all on the same page? Are we <laughs> differing in some of our ideas of how to tackle this? Because that's key. So my experience in terms of uh, having all governments agreeing on something is from the approval of IPCC reports. Mm -hmm. and, and it has been increasingly challenging, in particular for issues related to mitigation. Um, and the last IPCC synthesis report, based on already agreed material, uh, led to 133 difficult discussions for all governments to support the main scientific findings, which are clearly grounded in evidence. And I would like to highlight the most sensitive issues for me hmm. during these approval sessions. The first one is related to all mentions of fossil fuels. So what is really clear is that cumulative CO2 emissions need to be limited to limit warming. This is a scientific fact. And it also shows that new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure is not consistent with Paris Agreement goal unless these emissions are very strongly abated. That, that's really a strong outcome of the report. But all mentions of fossil fuels were challenged, and there were introductions of vague words, as at COP27, such as unabated emissions instead of fossil fuels, or low emission energy, without accurate definitions of what it means. And this is a challenge in terms of reaching agreement between governments who have different interests 
including those highly dependent on fossil fuels. And the second example is about livestock. And it's very clear that the food system accounts for about a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And there are options for action at all steps, including shifting diets for both health benefits and environmental uh, benefits. And so instead of being able to write in such reports plant-based diets, due to governments where the agro-industry sector and meat export is very powerful, it was transformed to sustainable and balanced diets, which doesn't mean exactly the same thing when mm. you explain it uh, to a, a normal person in the street. So it gives, this gives a few examples where you can still see obstruction in, even in a scientific document, having plain language interpretation of what the evidence is. You, you know, you, you, you've in part answered some of my next question, Valerie, because I was going to ask you about, you know, uh, COP summits. So, for example, you, you made uh, reference to the, the COP15. We know that last week in Paris there was this huge UN summit uh, with 175 people, uh, 75 countries, I should say, here wanting to kind of sign a plastic treaty. There are big conferences taking place. For you, how useful are they concretely in moving things forward? Because there are those who think, well, these are talking shops, essentially. And, and asking questions about what actually comes out of them. For you, how useful are they in moving forward with climate change? I see these intergovernmental meetings as important to share at least a common state of scientific knowledge to inform decision makings. And then, if governments are not prepared before these meetings to make any progress or advance, then nothing happens. Mm. And um, two weeks ago, I was also invited to speak at the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, which for the first time, it's quite surprising, organized a climate day to the initiative of Finland. And there were numerous scientific presentations, and at least the diplomats from each country who have different geopolitical interests had a presentations of a, a common understanding of what is at stake. And then you have, you know, um, national interests that play a key role in what can be acceptable or not, despite, uh, for instance, Antarctica in that case, supposed to be an area for uh, peace and science, but it's increasingly challenged due to national interest, for instance, for krill fisheries or for very expensive and highly emitting tourism. So um, I just want to flag a few recent examples. I think that COP26 uh, was really interesting in a strong emphasis being made by the UK diplomats uh, on uh, putting science at the heart of many aspects. Mm. And it allowed to reflect, for instance, the rate of CO2 uh, emission reductions required to limit warming at close to 1.5 degrees Celsius for the first time in a COP decision. But this was a strong push from UK uh, diplomats to ground things in science. COP27 uh, put an emphasis on loss and damage, and this was informed by recent IPCC reports on you know, the advances in the science of attribution of high impact events for which you can now assess how much they have been made more likely or more intense uh, due to human induced climate change. And it also calls vice versa for science advances. Um, in 1990, first IPCC reports, it was very hard to know who emitted greenhouse gases. Emission inventories, and I think the sector where they are most reliable are the energy sector now, globally. There need to be advances for the land sector. Now with the conversation and um, financial mechanism for loss and damage, I think it also calls for an inventory of impacts and advances in recognized methodologies for loss and damage attribution to human-induced climate change so that policy needs are also best informed by robust scientific information. And, and so um, just what I wanted to highlight is the importance of the spaces for all governments to agree, but also the importance to have high ambition within each country and the need of civil society, the private sector, to be part of that momentum due to the fact that within uh, UNFCCC, one single government can block the consensus of all. It also matters not just to have this, but also alliances and organizations of higher ambition that lead by example and push forward and inspire others.
I mean, Valerie, um, as a climate scientist, there's so much to ask you. I mean, it's, it, it's vast. Um, a challenge for you, just a, a really kind of short answer, if you will. This is an extra question I'd like to ask you. What do you think should be first on the agenda at the 2028 uh, COP that we will talk about a bit later on? But I just want to get kind of a really short sense of you. It's what very simple. Agenda? Fossil fuels subsidies. And we can see um, with the invasion of Ukraine how much the temptation is huge for governments to subsidize fossil fuels in all, all countries, phasing out subsidies. And then an agreement on phasing out not just coal, but also oil and gas. And I, I think without touching that, uh, you would not see um, um, COP28 to have any significant advance. Okay. And it's an opportunity that it is led by a country strongly dependent for its economy on fossil fuels, but which has engaged economical diversification earlier than others. Okay, thank you very much for that, that succinct answer, Valerie, and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, Philip, it would be good to bring you in here, just as we kind of keep this momentum going uh, about uh, the energy sector and, and the kind of changes. I wanted to get a sense from you what you think will be a game changer uh, when it comes to, to tackling climate change. What's actually going to make the difference in your view, Philip? Well, thank you for this question. Well, game changer. Uh, for me, uh, the game changer and probably builds up on what Valérie said, is to have an implementation plan. Uh, basically, in the energy sectors, we have clear objectives. Uh, they are quantified. Solution exists. Uh, we have low carbon energy supply. We have smart energy management system. We have storage system. We have energy demand strategies. We, we saw that uh, during this winter. But there are a number of, uh, of obstacles. Uh, first, we have to convert an old energy model to a new one. Uh, with a centralized and uh, controllable production, uh, with an aggregated consumption to a more diffuse, distributed, uh, low carbon production, individual producers. You can be a producer with a, a PV panel on your rooftop. Um, there is also uh, regulation allows self-consumption. So we have a number of things that uh, should be uh, activated to uh, to speed up the implementation plan. And then there are also other obstacles that Valérie mentioned is the interest of each country, of course. Um, one issue with this new energy model system is uh, it involves multiple actors. Uh, we have uh, nation scale. I would not refer to even you know, European scale, but even you know, national, national scale. Uh, we have subnational uh, actors uh, in France, administrative regions, communities, and as I said, you can be a producer. Uh, so we have individuals, and we have to develop a, uh, a method to ensure compatibility with a national low carbon strategy, for example, in France, with the deployment of solutions in the on the ground with the community by the communities the administrative regions, and so on and so forth. And the tools do not necessarily uh, exist. And we also have to develop relevant governance that uh, make the link easier, more fluid between, let's say, the national, national level and the territories and the communities. And finally, I would say, it was also more or less mentioned by, uh, by Valérie, uh, we, we have to avoid silo thinking. Um, Energy impacts water, okay, which is needed, for example, to cool down um, uh, for cooling system. Uh, it impacts food, it impacts land, it impacts biodiversity. And so we need also to develop a holistic sy systemic uh, thinking uh, to avoid, uh, well, the maladaptation, I would say. Uh, uh, with cross-sectoral uh, approaches and involves all the, uh, the key stakeholders. Okay, so in terms of, uh, I'll ask you a, a next question about the chicken or the egg, okay, and, and your thoughts on what came first. Was it the chicken or the egg? So would you say that, you know, it's new regulation that's leading scientific discoveries, or do you think that it's scientific discoveries that are informing the policies? Which, which comes first for you? <laughs> uh, well, the question for, was for the first time. Now, I think we are in a, 
I, I hope, a virtuous cycle loop. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but so, well, my first comment will be self-regulating word is not adopted, adapted uh, to uh, climate urgency. Uh, we need regulation to enforce, to accelerate transformation. That's my first point. Second, and it was largely uh, uh, said by Valérie, facts, scientific facts are needed to support decision making. And that's where science comes into play. So they provide facts. Uh, they, uh, science uh, informs on facts at international level with IPCC, sub-regional level with the MEDEC, which was mentioned by Eric, so uh, for the Mediterranean area, uh, at national level with the Au Conseil pour le climat in France, or even uh, uh, really at the, at the level of, of regions uh, in France, we have the Groupe Regionaux uh, uh, d'experts sur le climat. So uh, there, we have, let's say, plenty of uh, assessments, scientific assessment at all levels, uh, which are really uh, steered to, uh, to, the, to, to decision makers, okay, with the uh, summaries for policy makers. So this is the first link, I mean, one way. But of course, the opposite way is also true. Uh, implemented or planned uh, 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 policies uh, are assessed um, by uh, a scientist following rigorous scientific approach. Uh, it, with, between two uh, IPCC reports, uh, these assessments enrich, especially in group three, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the reports, and so there is a back and forth uh, between science and policy. So mm -hmm. it's, it's no longer, I would say, a question of egg and chicken. Okay. Uh, and so I, but for this cycle to be virtuous, I think there must be confidence. And we saw in the past years and months, um, difficulties from the scientific community to convey messages, Absolutely. facts. And so uh, for this cycle to be virtuous, uh, we need to have mutual trust uh, for things to well, get but, better. But I think, I think you, you, you raise an interesting point, Philippe. We're not always speaking the same language. I'm not talking about who's speaking French or who's speaking English. I think we don't always have the same priorities if we're talking about kind of, you know, policy makers and scientists and how we kind of get them to have the, the, the same vision. How do you think that can be made easier? Is it about kind of more panels like this? How do we, how do we kind of get people on the same page? Well, training is key. Uh, we're, we're dealing with, a, with complex phenomena first. And I'm also uh, often interacting with policymakers, decision makers. Um, and when we address things in details, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to, I mean, we, we, what's the level of information uh, we need to convey for it to be operationalized? Mm. operationalized. And this sometimes it's tricky, indeed, uh, because it it's very systemic, very non-linear in the uh, scientific world, uh, and so we need uh, places where we interact. So yes, panels are key, uh, but small meetings. Just we we have to address a problem. How would what, well we have a problem to address? We can we, we we meet with decision makers, scientists, which will give the facts. There vision of the knowledge we have on this problem. And we, yes, we have to multiply this. Otherwise, we won't be able to implement. So bridging this gap between what the scientist is saying, but what the audience or the policymaker is actually hearing. Again, there is a, at times a discrepancy. Uh, you touched, Philippe, on kind of building these common frames of reference. Uh, the role of the IPCC, for example, is key in that. It's the ability to measure actions and their impacts, as well as enabling stakeholders. Is that the way that you offer uh, alternative solutions? <clears throat> For me, non-binding frames of reference are good, but are not enough. Mm. Um, there is a need for enforcing regulation to speed up implementation of adaptation and mitigation measures. And we saw that recently, two weeks ago, I think. There was this, you know, insurance, uh, the uh, insurance world. So in big insurers are part of an alliance, the Net Zero Alliance. And uh, so they were, they were under pressure by the US Republican politicians. Uh, and they fear uh, antitrust lawsuits uh, 
as they face criticism uh, to unfairly hit oil and gas uh, industry. So if there is no enforcing laws uh, that forbids clearly, and it was said, um, uh, of new oil and gas projects, uh, the actors will, be, will fear uh, on ground to, to move forward because there won't be legal uh, frame to act. And so for me, we, we really need regulation to enforce some actions. But enforcing uh, is so complex though, Philippe. Oh yeah, I, I don't see, <laughs> I'm not saying it's simple. <laughs> no, so you won't hear that word from me. Uh, and so regarding measuring uh, uh, impacts, uh, so can help identifying obstacles. Uh, but when you say alternative solutions, sometimes you have ill implemented solutions. Mm. That doesn't mean that the solution is not the good one. It's ill implemented and I think, for example, uh, avoiding the funding uh, of new oil and gas project is, uh, cannot be uh, achieved because there is a lack of regulation enforcing it. Um, and of course, yes, to their also uh, uh, measuring impacts can also lead to new alternative solutions. Just in terms of illustration, it would be good to have an idea of one of these ill-implemented solutions that you're talking about. What comes to mind when you think of something that hasn't perhaps been uh, implemented the way it should have been? <laughs> so what is missing? What's missing, you might say. <laughs> Uh, I, it's difficult to give you, uh, you know, what is mixing. As I told you, that there are solutions that exist but need to be implemented wisely depending on, on the sectors. Mobility, question of mobility. So uh, what, is, uh, what should work with batteries, what should work with hydrogen, what should work with uh, synthetic fuel? Well, that's... It. So uh, give... A, uh, uh, so we have to go sector by sector uh, needing energy, so to implement the, the, the most, let's say, suited and relevant solutions. Okay, uh, we hear about hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen everywhere, but green hydrogen everywhere it means a lot of energy and green energy to, uh, to produce this hydrogen. So hydro hydrogen can it be the solution for everything. Uh, so we, go, we have to go sectors by sectors and identify uh, in detail, and that's where uh, uh, we we have to mobilize all the stakeholders, uh, pro I would say sectors by sectors, uh, uh, problems to face by problems to face, let's say, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to address it the, the most properly. All right, Philip, thank you very much uh, for, for responding to those questions there. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Philip spoke about kind of mobilizing uh, the stakeholders, if you will. I want to get a sense from you whether regulating uh, policy, does that necessarily equate to uh, combating uh, climate change and, I suppose, reaching uh, net zero uh, carbon? So, of course, it's not because you have stated the law uh, at national level or European level, you know that at international level we have very weak means uh, to define laws. We are defining commitments and then we ensure at least we put pressure on each other uh, nation to implement that at national level. So that's the philosophy of the Paris Agreement. Huh? Every country has to define their climate laws to implement the commitments they made, in particular consistent with 1.5 degrees. But doesn't mean that, as Philippe said, that because we have a law, it is implemented. I had long conversation, for example, with a very bright African parliamentarians who were saying, we have all the laws needed in most of our countries in Africa, but if they are not implemented, we are not able to do oversight. And at that stage where there have been, you look at the commitments of many countries, there is more than 185 countries that have committed to net zero emission by 2050 or, or soon after. Uh, so the commitments are there. Commitment 2030 are still lacking, as uh, Valérie said. We are, we are really lagging behind. Glasgow was a good start, but not really in terms of uh, increasing ambition nation by nation. And what is lacking, and unfortunately, will ne probably not be delivered by, by this year. But then the problem of transparency and oversight and control is really, really important. And uh, I, I am unfortunately in these things since now 30 years, trying to make the climate agenda high on the level of politics. And you see that 
it's coming now uh, at a moment where, of course, it's there. Everybody, I'm very happy that in this institution, you are putting climate change at the core of your curriculum. It was not the case years ago, so it's good. It's good that in many students are protesting if they think that their curriculum is not enough and the policy. So that means that we are, the, the climate change is very high on the agenda. Yes, that some laws are biting, but now we see, uh, of course, uh, a pushback. And so we need the conjunction of policies and the policies at European level are almost there, um, mostly not in agriculture and food, unfortunately, but for the rest, uh, they have improved enormously in the last years and in particular last year because of the war. But we need the politics and the people. And as Valérie said, we need on top of that the geopolitics. And, and really we have had good phases and bad phases in, to this long fight for combating climate change since, what say, the convention in 1992 uh, or, or the Kyoto Protocol for what was a strong moment. But then you see that the, uh, we have high and lows. I can say it's very difficult to understand the situation today. Uh, we have a number of laws. They are not implemented, mostly not enough. The, I think the commitments were too broad on the long term, not specifically on the year-to-year -year emission reduction. And that, of course, the discussion we had at the high um, level groups that we have at the HCSA or that many other climate commit, uh, assessment committees are having at many, in many places. But then what we see is that each time there is, of course, a progress, like for electric vehicle, for example, or heat pumps, or renewable energy targets, you, of course, we are now suffering a lot of pushback at different levels. I am struck, Teresa Ribera, a very good friend of mine, is now fighting in his own country because of the push, a political pushback against the deployment of electric vehicles and against what she wants to say, which is a phasing out gas. You know, Spain has a lot of gas, not because they are producing that, but because they are importing it. So this, this is a politicizing. It's now climate change, it's a political issue at national level, and of course, it was the case already at global level. So I think we need consensus, but we need at least mobilization. And that's why now uh, the citizen mobilization is so central. Practically, as Philippe said, being actors, agent of the change, but at the same time pressing on the political level that uh, uh, climate change should not be, like it is in the US, for example, a totally polarized issue. Now it's about identity politics. When you are in the US and Republican, you don't believe in climate change. At least that's the official position. And you should not do anything about climate change because you should not touch on the oil and gas sector. It was not the case in Europe until now. It's become to be more tricky. You have seen in Germany lately, the last weeks, a pushback again, the a regulation, a law on banning gas boilers in houses and, and just replacing them by, by heat pumps. We see that in Italy on electric vehicle deployment and now, as I mentioned, in Spain. Uh, I think this begin to be, and it's very, very dangerous. It's just not anymore based on science, but on political and cultural battle, which is totally crazy, but it is what is happening. That's why the citizen has a key role at that stage. It was different until now. Myself, my colleagues, we have been fighting for the Paris Agreement. We have been fighting for regulation at European level or other countries. Uh, and that's very important and necessary. We have been welcoming the voluntary agreement from the financial sector, for the business sector, with of course doubts on how much this voluntary would, would stay. And Philippe mentioned the pushback in the US about these voluntary agreements, seeing that a number of financial investors are saying, oh, we, we, don't, we don't now agree with strong commitments in decarbonizing our portfolio. So, that's, and why? It's because now it has changed the field of the, what we have to do. 
And again, pushing more on regulation is important, but we have to work on the politics. L Lawrence, I, I hear you talking a, a lot about uh, the frustrations. I mean, and obviously all of our panel, your work is, you know, to be probably on a daily basis involved in, in working to combat climate change. For the average person who is maybe doing, doing their best, they're recycling, uh, they're watching their carbon footprint, they're, you know, maybe taking their scooter or their bike to work. Th there's a sense of frustration. We're doing all of this, but still, you know, the laws are in place, but not necessarily being implemented. How do you combat that kind of frustration and keep people mobilized and want to keep doing their very best to combat climate change? I think it's a, it's a real question. How do we get over that? Uh, one, I think we have a perception that people don't get it right, which is not true. They don't get access to the way to implement that. It's important you, to say. You cannot. If you ha don't have public transport, you can and you are living in the suburbs of any big cities, uh, you cannot but take your car. That there is no way. Uh, the same for the infrastructure for electric vehicle. But mostly, it's an issue of equity. When the Gilets jaunes <coughs> movement happened in France, and everybody said, oh, they are against the carbon tax. It's a movement of the people against elite policies, because climate policies are elite policies. It was not true. I discussed even with the initiators of this movement, and they were just saying it's unequal. And there have been very good work, by, in particular by your laboratory in the, in, in the Ecole Nationale Supérieure on the economic department that shows that the 1% the wealthier person have a carbon footprint that is 20 to 25 higher than the lowest income. And it's true in every country of the world. Of course, U.S. being well is on the high level. So the equity dimension is absolutely central, plus the ability to change your behavior. How you get, get healthy food when the, all the agricultural subsidies are based on intensive agriculture and the use of heavily uh, intensive uh, fertilizers and pesticides? How you can have cheap food affordable food that is a good quality when, when you look at the support in, for example, in Europe, everything is just in favor of the fossil fuel subsidies. Last year, in 2022, Europe spent almost 800 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel consumption for industry, for consumers, for the agricultural sector. How much money we have spent for the transition. So the problem of the consistency of policies and politics and the accessibility and the equity factor is the number one. You cannot ask people to have agency if they feel that there is a carbon tax on diesel or uh, on, the, on petrol, but you don't have carbon tax on flights. Even in, in France, we have a small one. How you can explain that the private jet doesn't pay any tax? It's just impossible to accept. And, and, and on top of that, uh, and, and of course, uh, and we are in a very difficult period, very frankly, so I understand the reaction of your students vis-a-vis -vis the oil and gas sector, why I understand that. All the COP28 preparation, how interesting probably it could be, is about oil and gas is part of the solution. When the International Energy Agency is repeating now from now the last five years that no new investment in oil and gas is consistent with a budget uh, limiting the temperature to 1.5 and the carbon budget. So I think there is this dissonance and it's not about cognition. Everyone knows what it's about. There is not a problem of science. It's a problem of consistency and honesty, in my way, inconsistent in politics. Governments are afraid to take strong regulation but because they don't have enough, I think, capacity to debate with the citizen and having an informed discussion with their societies. But equity <coughs> is a central condition for that. Teresa was explaining how they dealt with a coal phase-out that is now in the law in Spain. They did that preparing that with the trade unions, with the region, and in a way proposing the solution of, uh, in a way, transforming the work and the, and the ability of the region to, to transfer, to transition, before any dates of the coal mining closing. Equity, and then it's okay. In the northern region 
of Spain, people are just happy because they know what will happen to them and they, will, they are part of the solution. So this is really, really central. The good thing is, in a way, for Europe that the war in Ukraine has wake up. The investment in solar uh, energy and in wind energy last year were skyrocketing. We have doubled uh, the investment in solar only last year, uh, slower in the wind sector, but coming on. And there is a sense that energy security and climate are coming together. And that's why I hope there will be more consistency in general. You raise a very good point, Lawrence, about this idea of consistency, and I just want to kind of unpack two things that you said. The first is this question of equity, uh, which is, is, is key, and then this kind of double standard, and you said, you know, that the private jet doesn't necessarily pay the carbon tax. People don't understand that. You know, how come I'm, you know, having extra uh, money added onto my, my bill when I pay for my ticket, but somebody who's got a, a great deal more money isn't? I think that that's a real problem. A lot of focus has been placed on, uh, you know, the need to embrace cleaner energy sources, right? You made reference to countries who have a real difficulty doing that, who are not able necessarily to move away from fossil fuels uh, quite that quickly. It's easier said than done. How uh, would you say that these diverse opinions kind of play out at the EU uh, level? So the fact that some countries are able and others are struggling because of this lack of equity that you've made reference to, Lance. Well, it's true that when you look at the global perspective in Europe, still 45% of the energy produced, electricity, pro the power produces out of fossil fuel sources, in particular coal, in particular for the eastern part of Europe. But this is, that, that's why the, the global context, of course, is very important. This has changed and why, how politics and geopolitics are mingled with this. Talking to the Polish actors, only about climate change didn't work because the coal region were very strong and the government has invested a lot towards these regions. Then, talking about air pollution make a huge difference because then a number of cities like Warsaw or Krakow, for example, Poland, is a big, you know, is a big laggard into climate policies in Europe. But then, the Polish citizen began to say, wow, coal is very, very bad for our air pollution. And, and that has made enormous progress. And then the war happened. And then the dependence from the gas and from the coal from Russia for Poland means that renewable energy was the solution to energy security. And because they wanted to cut all the provision of oil and gas to Europe, not only to them, but for the region. And so that has changed totally the discussion in Poland. So I think we have to understand all these factors and see at least on what factors we can, we, can, we can use to accelerate the transition. And really, the Ukraine war has been a turbocharger of the energy transition in Europe for, of course, unexpected reason. Even if the Russia situation on climate change is really dire, as Valérie knows well, because now the permafrost and all this, just a, just a catastrophe. I was discussing in a group with President Zelensky yesterday afternoon because of the dam. Uh, disruption and the ecocide that is happening now in Ukraine. I think uh, climate now, change and security are totally <coughs> linked. And uh, I appreciate very much what you said, Philippe. We could not say we'll repeat the same mistake like we did, for example, for ozone layer. We have a, a big advocate here in the room. We went from CFC to HFC, and we haven't understand that we have to have a systemic approach. And we need now to have a systemic approach on biodiversity, water, food, etc., because everything is linked. And I think if we, even for renewable energy, if we follow the same extractive model than we had from the past, the raw materials, the rare earths, will create many more problems or as much problems in a different biodiversity, human rights, it's already happening in Congo, for example, so we have to think differently. And I think it's essential that in this new generation of innovation, we think systematically, systemically, and with the stakeholders, as it was said before.
Laurence, we, we spoke a little bit about uh, Valerie and, and Philip about uh, this idea of a shared vision. And it would be good to get a sense from you uh, about how we go about getting this shared vision. You gave an example of Poland. You said, you know, when we spoke about fossil fuels, we didn't necessarily get the engagement that we might have wanted. Whenever, when we spoke <coughs> about air pollution, it was the declic, people suddenly sat up and took notice. Is it about finding a narrative that resounds, that resonates uh, with political, uh, with particular countries before uh, we, we try and get the shared vision because what interests Poland might not be what interests uh, Kenya, for example, or what interests India, for example. Do you see what I mean? Do we need particular narratives before we can get a shared vision? Well, it's very important. Narrative is everything, you know, because we have to shape expectations. And uh, I think on the, what is really new and shared is a narrative on climate impacts. It was not there. <coughs> People didn't feel it. Now you don't see any head of state that would not comment on the impact of climate change at home. And that's a big uh, game changer in my view. The second thing, is, which is true, is the narrative on the you know, a green future was always very, very technical. Uh, and e even in the climate community, which now I'm part of, uh, we were talking about, you know, electric vehicles and uh, tur wind turbines and solar panels. That's not a narrative that can incentivize people to dream. Right? It's very, very technical. It's useful, but not, not really a, a future. So the future, that's why the future has to be embedded in the agency of citizens. That's why I feel that decentralized energy is a very, very important <coughs> democratic element. What I think, and I was absolutely fascinated by an article by Martin Wolf, which is, of course, a, a journalist, uh, an editorialist, uh, very well known in the Financial Times, and not, uh, you know, not a revolutionary one by far. And he was saying, we know we have to solve the system, the, the problem of climate change, through citizen assemblies everywhere. I was puzzled. You know, I have been chairing the committee from the French Citizen Assembly on Climate. It was as a strong experience for me as was uh, leading the negotiation for the Paris Agreement on Climate. And why? Because when you give the space to discussion, to information, to citizens, the platform you were talking, they elaborate the narratives themselves. And that's why we have to open discussion, debate, democratic discussion, is really the condition for the solution, so the, for the, all the actors, for the societies, whether it is in Kenya or in France or uh, in Czech Republic, anywhere. Uh, it, it is because of that. So I think that maybe that the politician would understand they cannot dictate that from top down. And you know, have been in the prime minister office a number of years, and you see that you are, of course, the object of many pressures, and you have to, in a way, try to uh, find a line between all these pressures and interests. So that cannot solve for a quick energy transition or an ecological transition. You need to have the society uh, not only demanding it, but acting for it. You know, governments are very rarely uh, ahead of the societies. That doesn't happen. Uh, so I think, uh, the, and that's a huge thing for, universities being the place where you, you contribute to the education and the, in a way the agency of all students to go further and be the one talking and be in pushing that form of more democratic decision. I don't see any other solution than that this one if we want to be at the past. And no, when I see that, no. many countries in Africa you see, which are supposed to cling to fossil fuel, it's always the government statements is more rarely the youth movement statements. And we can see that all the time. I think you raise a really interesting uh, point about democracy and, and certainly this question of uh, citizens' assembly. I just want to put this to the, to the audience. A, a show of hands if you would or have perhaps already participated in a citizen assembly where you kind of get to put your point across <coughs> to climate change. Have you already or, or is that something that you'd be prepared to do? A show of hands if that's something that you might participate in. Okay, so... 
So most people might be interested in doing that. A, a, a perfect time to just remind you that, of course, our conference today, our second international conference entitled Reflections for Climate Change 2023, is interactive. That barcode up there, or QR code, I should say, is waiting for you to click and send us a question, and our IP Paris students uh, will ask those questions in about 20 minutes' time. So please do uh, get your questions into us. Thank you so much, uh, Laurence, and we'll have a chance to kind of talk together a little bit later. <laughs> I, I do want to bring in a, a, a different perspective now. Estelle, you, of course, work for Veolia. In terms of infrastructure, it will be good to kind of walk us through what companies like Veolia are doing uh, to kind of mitigate climate change. How does their role play out in all of this, Estelle? Um, thank you. Before answering this question, uh, you know, you're, you're right, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I would be like the representative of companies in whatever way. Uh, although Veolia is a very specific, you know, spot because we, of course, have our own impact and mitigation and I will explain what we do. But actually part of our, our, our role and actually our mission, our purpose is to help cities and companies to decarbonize. Uh, so it, it's part of our mission. Um, just wanted to, to I, I couldn't agree more with a few things you've said and uh, on the, how do we accelerate because it looks to me like it's exactly what we're talking about in the last uh, half an hour or so. Uh, you know, policies are needed, uh, certainly companies I think are and I'll explain how we could contribute uh, and citizens are absolutely paramount to actually accelerate. And actually, let's be honest, they put pressure on the, the politician, they put pressure on companies, and, you know, and in the end, you know, it accelerates the pace. So we've, uh, we've conveyed a survey with Elab on 25 countries across the globe, on 25,000 people, all type of social backgrounds, uh, and all the large, uh, co large um, countries you can think of, from India to Australia to the Gulf, and so on and so forth. And the conclusions are super clear. In terms of the realization that, in a way, we have a problem as the humanity, that's it, tick. I'm not saying it's 100% and we still have a lot of effort to steal, but there is an element of compared to five years ago and 10 years ago, and it's probably the effect of the COP, you know, that, you know, plus probably the effect of events, uh, because it's very different to think that there is a problem than to live through a big fire here uh, or the drought in France last summer. And suddenly people click, okay, this is happening now. Uh, and the question we've asked, uh, uh, probably more interestingly, is, you know, uh, uh, are you ready to, to make something about it? You know, and what are the conditions for it? So by a vast majority, people in the world tell us that they're ready to make some effort. Uh, they're, they're ready to contribute and they've understood that the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of acting now. So that's the good news. Uh, but they tell us that there are some conditions to act and to make those efforts. One is exactly what you said, equity, shared effort, uh, and not opposing you know, those and these. Uh, the second one uh, is that there is no, uh, I mean, the health, uh, and again, to your point, you know, is some uh, teaser for action which is even stronger than many others. Uh, when you talk about the planet or when you talk about you know, your son or daughter, uh, health, you can imagine that one had an impact on clicking, which is much, very much more powerful than the other. And the third thing, and that's where I wanted to, to, to come to, is the fact that they, they're not so sure what they can do. In a way, they want us to talk about solution and what they should do, what they can do. So let's be concrete. So yes, we have a problem with Gomba Marwin, I think they've understood uh, to the vast majority. Uh, but okay, what can I do? If it's just, you know, to turn off the lights when I exit my, you know, apartment, they have understood that it's not enough. So I think to explain what are the t type of solution that they are uh, at display for a citizen, for a company, for a city, and at whatever level is absolutely critical. Uh, and the first condition is they want that it's efficient and consistent. So the, uh, the kind of trendy communication tools, which is 0.01% of the solution, they've understood that it's bullshit, sorry. Uh, so they want to understand you know, what the scale of it is and can it you know, make a difference. So I think that's a very interesting you know, confirmation, probably, to everything we've said about the, how do we speed up. Uh, companies have a role to play. 
so I run a company which has you know, this dual element of we have a footprint, we, ha we emit CO2 if you want, and of course we want the trajectory to go down, and we're helping our customer to reduce our CO2 footprint. And uh, I will talk about the, the second, but of course we wouldn't be uh, talking about that if we were not applying to ourselves, if you want, you know, what we are uh, trying and do. And a good example was, you know, coal. We've inherited from coal fire plants uh, in Eastern Europe, which are uh, uh, supporting a district heating scheme. Uh, so basically it heats uh, houses when it's minus 10 in the, uh, in the winter. So the let's just turn it off is not an option, you know, like uh, you have an essential service behind it. Uh, and by the way, district heating is much more efficient energy-wise than you no know, individual heating, but that's another story. So that's it. Uh, we had another uh, solution, easy one, and just wanted to share what are the, uh, the situation when you're on the company. Uh, would be to sell it, probably more to a private s somebody or whatever, uh, which therefore wouldn't be, would be totally under the radar of all and everybody. That's an easy solution. That's not who we are, uh, but that's an easy solution. So in a way, I would always be super careful about banning this and that if it's just to find it somewhere else which is less under the radar. That's my piece of, I don't know, like uh, experience that I wanted to share. So we decided to invest, and that's massive. It's 1.5 billion uh, until 2030, uh, 2030 uh, so in just a few years, uh, to get rid of that in Europe. And we've already invested for 100 million, and we've changed uh, one in Braunschweig, uh, actually, this uh, winter, and another one Cherov in, uh, in Czech Republic. So is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, but actually, we're putting our mouth, uh, where our, uh, word where our mouth is. And I think that's uh, super, super important uh, to walk the talk and actually do. And as you said, not in 2050, because it would have been super easy to say, OK, I commit to a net zero in 2050, which, of course, we do. But I don't think that's enough. There is an element of timing. What do we do in the next 10 years? What do we do in the next 20? What do we do in the next 30? So having some like, if we can do something now, let's just do it. Uh, so that's uh, the first bit of it. Uh, of course, we've done a lot on the methane element as well. And uh, the reverse is actually that we're helping our customer to decarbonize. 14 million tons of carbon we've helped our customer reduce just last year only. And how do we do that? Uh, through uh, recycling plastic uh, instead of uh, you know, producing out of oil. This is minus 75%. Of course, it's best if you don't waste plastic at all. But once it's done, you know it's better to be recycled. Uh, by replacing you know, uh, fossil fuel by you know, uh, you know, renewable uh, type of fuels that we produce, for instance, from uh, non-recyclable waste or wastewater. And I will multiply the example. So I think uh, consistency uh, is important. Uh, and think how we could speed up uh, with involving companies as well as the citizens. I mean, you spoke at the beginning, uh, Estelle, about, uh, and we've been speaking today, about getting uh, people on board. How do you disseminate this information so people are aware of the kind of things that they can be doing to be greener, to you know, be promoting greater uh, m m green mobility? How, how does your company do that? Uh, we, we do it uh, directly. We do it via, you know, like uh, elected uh, members, you know, at city level, at national level. Uh, in a way, we provide the materials. A company like Veolia provides the technical innovation uh, solutions, uh, and then we talk and talk and talk about it. Uh, so we've launched, for instance, a few weeks ago, uh, um, a specific uh, scheme. Uh, which is a bit like the eco watts, uh, but the eco watt of water, because we've discovered in France that we may be lacking water one day, and it's uh, the effect, of course, of uh, global warming and, and other stuff. Uh, long story short is we've put all the materials we have about how to save water at home in an industry, in a way, to the general public. And, you know, and I've signed a few partnerships with uh, cities here and companies there uh, to kind of bring them with us. Uh, so, do I have a magic wand? No. Uh, do you have a kind of um, fighting spirit with some optimism into it? Yes. In a way, I, uh, I'd rather that if, if the, the impact of all that is, okay, we don't have the solution for everything, so let's, let's just quit, would be the worst outcome possible. 
so I'm more of a, okay, we have already something available here, so let's act on it and let's act as quickly as possible with me more my, my motto, probably. And the second element is, uh, and if you, I talk, of course, as a company's perspective, uh, you've mentioned the money, the lack of money. Uh, it's a glass half full, half empty, uh, in my opinion. As in, there is plenty of money which is not used uh, to be uh, connected with, let's say, green project, to be a little bit uh, generic here. Uh, is it enough if we were to do everything we need to do? Probably not. Uh, but there is a lot which is not used. Uh, so my question is, how do we already, you know, like uh, scale up uh, this? And uh, we have two uh, hindrances to this money being used. Uh, one is uh, is the fact that this money always wants, or very often, wants to be in the green, not in the greening as in uh, not in the transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you bet by, I don't know, 80% CO2, you still have 20% uh, of CO2 remaining, and a lot of those funds are allocated to only kind of neutrality altogether. I think there is a mistake here, which is we need, we need to understand what we should do with what we have already. We have already cities which are existing, so I can dream of a of 100% of uh, uh, energy positive building in, uh, in the greater Paris. I could dream of that, but we already have an existing base. So my question is, what do we do with the base to do you know, the trajectory down? Same goes with industry. Should we close all the industry we have in France or should we transform them to, again, uh, reduce their footprint? I'm a great believer that we should transform them and help them transform. And at times, uh, there is a lack of understanding that the importance is actually the trajectory down rather than you have a, the perfection on one side and the baddies on the other, if you want, so what uh, which you is saying, quite important. What, what I hear you saying is, you know, work with what we have ultimately. If I had to summarize what you were, rather than kind of scrapping things... And, and speed up. And, and speed up, absolutely. How does that tie in with national policy? I mean, is there a kind of meeting? We've spoken about discrepancies, uh, you know, different ideas, different visions, and having a hard time marrying them up. How does what your company is doing uh, fall in line with national policy? Um, so, uh, national policy, international, as in EU policies, are absolutely needed. You know, we need the framework. We need to know what the ambition for the country will be in the energy mix in the next, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, and to make bets. So, in a way, stability and clarity of the framework is paramount for companies to invest. Uh, otherwise, if you think that in six months it's going to change and go into another direction, you will wait for things to be stabilized. So polities, stable and implemented, you know, it would be the counter example of your uh, African example, which you've just mentioned uh, earlier on. So uh, in, I can't remember which country you, you mentioned. Uh, so stability of framework is important. And the second one uh, is um, uh, probably simplicity. Uh, because uh, if a policy uh, and pragmatism uh, Policy is important, as in, okay, this is a target of CO2 in France uh, in, say, 10 years. Then the how is as important. Okay, how do we get there? So you have, you know, like a sector by sector uh, series of policies which needs to be consistent. But then simplicity. Uh, okay, you know, you have a lot of subsidies, uh, and the good ones, if I may, uh, which needs uh, years and years of procedures to get are impossible to understand and at times you know like uh, you need four years now uh, to connect biogas to the gas grid in France. Okay, I'm talking about biogas, so uh, not natural gas that you extract. Is it absolutely you know like uh, what we can do best? Probably not. So in a way we need uh, consistency over the long term uh, and we need simplicity of accessing to those policies and then we need the citizens to be embarked, we need NGOs, uh, and we need companies to implement as long as this signal is clear and consistent. I mean, of course, uh, the citizens on board, and again, that, that's something that, that, that Laurence was talking a great deal about. Uh, Eric LeBay earlier spoke about uh, sustainability being at the heart, and particularly at the campus, IP Paris. 
Um, in terms of sustainability, what kind of solutions are being found uh, in the work that you're doing? And I think you've touched on some of the challenges, but if you could give us a concrete kind of obstacle uh, that you're working to overcome, that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I said, you know, we need to be concrete if we want people to be on bark, so I will be. Um, so uh, if you talk about energy, uh, a few things. First, uh, the best energy is the energy uh, you don't consume. So uh, avoid uh, sparing energy. Uh, and energy, so a typical building in Europe, when we put, uh, we are able with sensors and digital and monitoring of the buildings, the large ones, say hospitals and public buildings, to save 15, 20% of energy by monitoring the building more closely. So uh, the digital can help. So that's one, uh, avoiding to spare energy. A second one, uh, think about heat and not only electricity. Uh, basically, the energy consumption is half heat, half electricity today. Electricity will be uh, higher, but we have a lot of spare heat, uh, which can be used uh, for industrial process and others. So think about heat and spare heat and uh, have the look back. Uh, and then you have, uh, what about the alternative source of energy you can think of? Uh, and of course, everybody can talk about uh, solar panels or, or, or wind turbines. I will talk about uh, less known things. Uh, one is uh, non-recyclable waste, uh, which of course, you know, uh, is only a part of it because what's recyclable should be recycled, that's a priority, but you still are left with something. You'd better, you know, do something with it and instead of putting it into a landfill, you know, producing energy out of it. Uh, Another one will be the biogas. Uh, same if you equip, equip uh, you know, with methanization uh, units, uh, all the, um, what you can do in France on wastewater treatment plant and, uh, and energy from waste, it's 25% of the Russian gas we used to import in France, which can be replaced by biogas uh, with just those two elements. And so we're talking here about uh, local energy, decentralized energy at a city or industrial park level, uh, which can be decarbonizing thanks to, in a way, local source of energy. So it ticks the box, of course, of being renewable. It's not perfect, it still emits CO2, but we're, have all the examples I gave are minus 60, minus 80% compared to the, pre, the, the level before, if you want, of CO2. Uh, so it's, it's renewable, uh, it's local, uh, and it's affordable to the social element we've discussed earlier on. Uh, and the local element is paramount in the geopolitical world we, we are talking about here. So I think, you know, those examples are uh, very important. Okay, well, thank you very much, Estelle, for responding to those questions. Uh, Laurence, Philippe, and Valerie, uh, I'd like you to stay with us here on stage. Uh, this is a time where we check, uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether all this is working well. Uh, our Q&A session that we've been talking about, your questions that you've been, uh, you know, uh, nicely kind of filtering in uh, to us. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, up to the stage to ask those questions, Alicia Bassier, she's a, a PhD student at IP Paris in economics, specializing in market design and uncertainty for investments uh, in electricity production capacity uh, for the energy transition. Uh, Alicia, thanks very much. Uh, she's joined on stage by Margot Minaret, first year student in the engineer program at Enster Paris, a, uh, a member school of IP Paris. She's also, uh, quite interestingly, the president of the forum ASTA, an IP Paris association organising a responsible forum uh, every year. Um, let's uh, get questions from you, both Alicia and Margot. I understand that some have been filtered in uh, just for our, for our panel today. What can you tell us, ladies? So, first of all, thank you for the round table. It was really helpful. And for our questions, we try to take into account the public remarks. Margot, will you speak into the mic yes. just so we can? Thank you very much. Sorry. So our first question is about green hydrogen, which is often presented as a miracle solution uh, to manage the intermittency of renewable energies and new mobilities. But as you said it yourself, Philippe, it cannot be a solution for everything. So what do you think of low-tech options and how can we implement regulations on that? I, I just want to check, were you all able to hear that question? Yeah. Green hydrogen? Green hydrogen. And it's an open floor, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever feels, you know, compelled to, please do go ahead and answer. So, so maybe I can start hydrogen. Uh, <laughs> now, regarding um, I, I, first, 
it's not because hydrogen is not a solution for everything that it can't be a solution for something. So, uh, and definitely we're dealing, it's true for energy and probably for many transformation of our society, it will be a mix of solutions. Uh, there's no miracle solution and uh, regarding hydrogen, it may be probably a, a good vector, energy vector for let's say heavy transport, heavy mobility. Uh, def my feeling is that it's, uh, uh, it won't be true for, for, uh, uh, for uh, aircraft, for um, flights, uh, probably more synthetic fuels, uh, and for individual cars, probably uh, batteries, even though in the field of batteries, innovation comes out every day. Um, so that's a key message that we are, we need to act in a situation where nothing is stabilized. So there is a lot of transformation, innovation everywhere. So it's, it's difficult, we have to admit that, that to choose on which solution we, have, we, we invest on. Uh, so that would be, a, that would be a, a key. So regarding regulation, I would say that it's probably out of my expertise. So how do we regulate hydrogen? I'm, I'm not sure I'm able to answer, but anyway, so uh, the, 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 we have really to uh, address which sector needs hydrogen because the hydrogen you want to produce should be green and it needs a lot of energy. And so of course, the energy that you produce with renewable energy that could be directly into the uh, electric grid will be diverted and go to, uh, to produce hydrogen. So, and as I said, we have to think uh, in a systemic way when we deal with renewable energies, we're also uh, dealing with land footprint. So, uh, which is higher than, uh, let's say, more conventional uh, energy production systems. So we, there are many needs now. Uh, we electrify many things. Um, and so we have to, uh, to, make, to, to evaluate the synergies and trade-offs we have to make uh, so that uh, producing green hydrogen uh, is sustainable and meets, uh, uh, meets a need. Thank, thank you for that question. Margot, Elisa, yes. do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, please yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add something because the question was about regulation. And I've seen that there have been recently debates in the UK about the um, um, commercial um, um, distribution of uh, personal house gas heaters labeled hydrogen ready. And this might give a sense that if you buy a gas heater, then in the future it could be decarbonized using green hydrogen. However, I understand um, at, at scale, this will not be available. So it could lead to a lock-in where people install new gas heaters and will still use fossil gas on the very long term, the life uh, time of the heater. In that case, I would think that regulation, at least in terms of labeling and information to users, would make sense. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Thank you, Philippe, uh, as well. Elisa, did you have a question for our panel? Well, the question will not be, do I have a question, but how many do I have? So <laughs> Good, good news. I will try to be synthetic. <laughs> uh, as it was already said, many ambitious objectives are currently being pursued at the European level for electricity and energy production. That includes decarbonization, but also energy independence. We talked about Ukraine crisis, nuclear phase out, ensuring a competitive market, so according to you, do you see any of these issues as a priority? And do you think we should tackle everything at once or instead maybe focus on one issue at a time? Laurence, do, do you want to answer that one? Go ahead. Um, one, it's a very good question. Uh, so there is a, normally the ideal way and, and you should find an instrument of regulation for a particular objective, that's the theory. But then, you know, things are not like this because regulation are not implemented fully. And it's very interesting to look at the, the 2020 package of the EU, the, the old one. That was, of course, uh, the carbon markets, was the emission trading system, who has a certain objective in terms of emission reduction because of the carbon budget. Uh, allocated, and then you have the renewable energy target. The two were in total contradiction, meaning that there was too much of the targets of 20% of renewable energy in the package compared to what was uh, aimed at by the ETS. 
And in a way, what has happened in terms of what has happened in Europe, finally, was that the renewable energy target was dominating in terms of regulation of commitment, what finally should have been obtained through the ETS. So in a way, it seems totally inconsistent. We should have one instrument and one objective, which was really to tighten the carbon budget. But in a way, people are in the political, they have many critics we can make to them. But at the same time, they are realistic. And you know, uh, you have obstacle for one thing. So if you play with many, you have a little bit of chance to, to get there. So I think, uh, again, it's confusing. Uh, and people can play, there is a playbook for everything. But I think the good thing is now is a picture of we, and anyway, we don't have time anymore. So the, the things that we have to address the different issues altogether, and in particular, it was good to address the reform of the electricity market, which is not there for the moment, because it was in a way uh, totally taking out the, the, the idea that the renewable energy was cheaper than gas, at the contrary, because people were paying the same bills or even higher. So I think that seems to me a good thing to really talk about the whole transformation, to have several objectives, and to bet that finally maybe one of them would succeed, even if the other one would be un undermined. It's not logical from a theoretical or an economic point of view at all. It's again the theory. But in practice, finally, I felt it was practically relatively useful. Relatively useful. Philip, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I will do down, oh, build on that. Uh, the, um, no, what was really disrupting in the last Repower EU directive is that the demand side was, for the first time, really included in uh, energy policies. Uh, sobriety or sufficiency and this highlights the fact that if we want to go fast we have to mobilize first the citizen technology will come finally as was said uh, it's it's probably a longer uh, time scale but we add uh, due to the uh, Ukraine war we had to act quickly and so uh, demand side uh, was uh, included uh, so another call to act quickly. Thank you, Philippe. Go, go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, I wanted to add a new dimension to the points that you have touched. And we've mostly addressed regulation with a view of basically um, uh, decreasing fast enough emissions now and uh, creating the feasibility conditions to reach net zero on the longer term. Um, but regulation also matters in terms of the legal framework associated with adaptation. And it's really difficult, in fact, to have in law the possibility to in, uh, inform today's decisions through plausible futures. So having a reference framework for adaptation as being currently developed for France, I think is really important so that we avoid further crises associated, for instance, with um, water scarcity or further crises due to the growing um, biogeophysical constraints in a warmer world, in particular biomass availability. And I want to put a, an emphasis on that because there's also this use of biomass for energy, methane, biomethane production, but also biomass for heating, biomass as a feedstock to replace the use of fossil fuels in different contexts. And we need to be really very careful about um, uh, current trends and having probably stronger regulatory frameworks is important. In France, we've lost by half the carbon sinks from forests. Finland is struggling at the European level due to too intensive use of forests for Finland and in France just due to increased mortality, slower growth of trees because of a changing climate. So including these dimensions, a reference framework, uh, uh, scenarios of, on different time horizons, implications that will also um, be faced by the energy sector, um, I think is another dimension of regulation that's only starting. So much insight from our panel uh, today. Did you want to add something? Uh, Margot, another question perhaps? I think we've probably got time for two more questions. What do you think, Christine? Two more questions before we, we wrap up. Do you have another for us? Yeah, go ahead. So as students, we often ask ourselves the question of how uh, to manage a responsible career. So we may also wonder whether it's more effective to pursue a career as a scientist or as a politician drawing up regulations on the subject or even to sit on company boards. 
So what advice would you give to your students with these questions who want to go into the energy sector? Super question there for our panel. What do you think? Do you want to go ahead, Estelle? Yeah, I guess seat on the company board is nice, but working for a company to actually build everything we've talked about, uh, I would say, uh, would be a very nice start in my opinion. So I guess uh, we need all of that, uh, probably. Uh, and we need science as well. So I'm a great believer of it's, uh, it's great. We, science won't solve everything. But without science, there is no way we, we can do any of everything we've talked about. So, uh, and then, you know, all the career you mentioned, you know, can have a role to play. I would just emphasis on the working in a company uh, can, be, can be one scenario which, is, uh, which should have a very big impact. Just to give you an idea, in Veolia, we measure the impact the the success including in the in the um, incentive scheme every year of all our managers uh, with a few indicators half of them are financial uh, actually four of them out of uh, 18 are financials the other 14 are non-financials and of course we have a co2 uh, embedded into that so in a way we measure are we being successful if we help our customer decarbonize uh, this is a very important indicator to, uh, to be. So uh, uh, if you want perfection, don't join a company. If you want to be participating into, uh, into actually uh, helping the trajectories to go down and, uh, and actually uh, greening the universe, uh, maybe you should consider. Okay, anybody else on that question? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say uh, scientists do not implement. So uh, uh, if you want to act uh, it's well as citizen I can act of course uh, but it's not our role to implement I mean we are, we're here to no. inform to support uh, decision-making and implementation and in finance uh, industries uh, administration are here also to implement administration with regulation companies by deploying solutions and so on and so forth so I would say we, we are every all these people are on one earth, as we say, uh, uh, our uh, uh, Republic president. So uh, uh, we have a role to play. So you just have to choose the one you want to play. Yeah, one word about science, um, and especially the experience of a PhD thesis. It's unique. Three years to, deep, to go deep into a topic, to understand the state of the art in a subject, to learn the rule of science, you know, peer review, the rigor, the methodology. I think this is extremely powerful as a training, whatever you want to do later on. It's hard, <laughs> you're struggling against yourself, but the relationship you have with evidence is different. And if you choose to have that experience, then you can also change your path and work in the private sector or work in, in the policy sector. And actually, I personally think we need more young people trained in science to go into uh, uh, advisory boards, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, advisors of, of ministers and uh, public administration, high-level decision-making. Excellent point, absolutely. More people, yes, filtered in at that trajectory. Uh, yes, Laurence, a final word from you on this question. Yeah, I, I think uh, you can go everywhere to have a successful career and, and defend your ideals. Uh, in any place is good. I think what is important vis-a-vis, -vis in particular, the economic and the business sector, is very interesting, and, and in a way, at the end of your university curriculum, as, as you have, many of you have said at the end last year, uh, when they were receiving their diploma, that they don't want to follow the business as usual, but they want a change. And this demand for change, and, and certainly Estelle knows that, it's a very strong push for companies to accelerate the change, because then you have your employees just asking for change and being active. And I think <clears throat> when I look at many companies now, they are, if they don't present opportunities for that change in terms of the real job they are doing, they are, they are losing candidates. And so you have a power there, very strong one, which is your talent, your training, and I totally agree with Valérie this element of the thesis and is now welcome in French companies, which is great. Uh, but then you have a power which is, we don't want to work for anything, we want to work for the change. And I think that's a message that I think responsible uh, CEOs are now listening very carefully, I'm sure. 
They're acting, not yeah. only listening. Ninety-two <laughs> percent of all employees in Veolia, uh, and I'm including even operatives, you know, say they understand that they contribute to ecological transformation and would recommend uh, their families or, or relatives to work in the company. So again, it's not perfection, but uh, hopefully we're not only listening, we're trying to act. Well, there you have it, Alicia and Margot. The power is in your hands. Were you aware? Did you know that? Y you do now. Maybe we'll just take the final, final question from Alicia um, before we wrap up our first round table of the day. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to go with a question related to science and its impact on political decision maker coming from the academic world. That's a question that is really something for me. As you may know, to assess economic and financial impacts of climate change, academics often use complex models like integrated assessment models, system modeling, very complex model that even the scientists themselves debate in between them. And this model often includes many sources of uncertainty, such as electricity demand, future weather, carbon price, and often, as a solution, they propose different scenarios as a, real, as a result. But we've seen in the past year with COVID crisis, Ukraine crisis, that sometimes we might have unforeseen events that were not predicted by those scenarios. And do you think that political decision makers use this uncertainty to wait instead of acting? And what happens if they believe in the wrong scenario? What's the worst that can happen, according to you? Valerie, I see you nodding there. Why don't you, you set us off on that? So last month, IPCC ran a workshop on scenarios to take stock of what was uh, taken into account from the available literature to inform the assessments and, and thinking of the lessons learned and how it could be advanced in the future. And there were representatives of governments who also explained how they develop and use scenarios to inform their own decision making. And there are companies who develop their own scenarios, right? to inform decision-making and mid- and, and, and longer-term strategies. Um, I would like to, to not just address the uncertainties you mentioned, but another dimension. Um, the most uh, touchy issue and the most challenging issue in the scenarios used for global climate projections or um, emission mitigation pathways, I think the most difficult topic is equity. And most of the scenarios at the global scale have been developed by few groups of scientists worldwide with um, a too limited representation of scientists from countries in the global south that have different perspectives on equity, development, sustainability. And so I think one advance that will come in the coming years uh, will be uh, a better accounting for issues associated with equity. Then there were, of course, also discussions related to how, to, um, how these idealized and scenarios based on a number of explicit assumptions can be reconciled with reality, can be reconciled also with the quick responses to specific shocks or crises, pandemic or Ukraine war. And to that, I don't have a, an, an answer myself. I would like to build on that because uh, since, in particular, the moment in 1997 where we craft the Kyoto Protocol, the economic modeling was very dominating on the solution, in particular because there was the idea that if we could find a global carbon price, the problem will be solved because it was particularly treated as one externality, not across the board. Now, of course, things are more complicated, but still, we, you see that the, one of the last uh, Nobel Prize in economics has been given to Nordhaus, which is a famous economist. We have seen Nordhaus from 30 years now, uh, defending the uh, model of optimization to know what will be the right economic optimum and the global temperature. His assessment, even it was three years ago, and it's even in the recent papers, is that an, optim an economic optimum will be a, a, an increase in temperature between 3.5 degrees to 4 degrees. So, like something is not working there. <laughs> And uh, the other colleagues who should have had the Nobel together with him, Martin Weissman, uh, said, because of the uncertainty you were referring to, you can have major catastrophes, we cannot, which are, you know, you cannot go back, you cannot optimize, it's a risk management. And this is for the moment 
I think it's very difficult, for, at least for the economic literature, which I know better, um, that just to, to put that in the normal, in a way, working methods. And uh, it is a very big area of innovation, and I know that the group three is really working hard for all these reasons that Valérie mentioned as well. But there is, a, a, of course, a, a problem in the structure of the theoretical model that prevent to look at the reality, and you have men, and uncertainties are part of this, but as well, the idea that you cannot optimize climate. That's not true. And because of the, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the rate of wealth, what we call the actualization rate. So, so I think it's really a flow, and this flow, I, I insist on that, because this flow has prevented us to go faster and faster enough in the global negotiation, because there was always a good thing to say, we will do it later, because it will be less costly. And that is, that has cost, that is costing today the impact we are seeing. So it's a, models have a big influence, and they should be really uh, assessed correctly. But, so to come back on that, there's a huge need for tools to inform economic decisions, to better account for um, the impacts of multiple climate hazards, not just you know, a linear relationship between uh, growth and uh, temperature, which is ridiculous, but accounting for extreme events, impacts on food insecurity, malnutrition, implications for you know, just skills, uh, limits of a changing climate for physical activity outside in some regions of the world, and hard limits, water, biomass availability in a warming world. It's not there yet. We need economical tools to better account for the costs of adaptation. Just think of coastal areas, one billion people, many large cities. The cost of relocation, just think of that. It's not yet included. So this is needed. But yet with the tools that are available now, and not just Nordhaus, more complex tools, the last uh, 2020, 2022 mitigation report from IPCC concluded that it's um, um, economically worth, in terms of cost benefits, to limit warming well below 2 degrees. 1.5 is more challenging because of the pace of uh, uh, emission uh, reductions on the very near term and implications associated with, for instance, extreme poverty. Okay, I think uh, we might uh, wrap that up there. I'd like to say thank you to Margot and Alicia for coming up and sharing those questions. We really appreciate it. And of course, what does that mean? The good news is that our QR code is working perfectly. We love it. That means for the other roundtables coming up, you'll be able to get your questions to us. Just before I let you go, little little game, I'd just like you to give us just one phrase on an overriding message that you absolutely want us to take away today. So you might say uh, most of the solution is in science, for example, but we've had so many good sound bites coming from you. What, what's the last message that you want to leave us with as we end this roundtable? If I start with you, Estelle, and only one phrase. Oh, the game is you're only allowed one phrase. Speed up with all existing solutions. Speed up, okay. Speed up and include everybody. Speed up, Population, include everybody. Regla uh, reglementation, as well as companies. Okay, speed up, include everybody as well as companies. Laurence, the same challenge to you. No fatalism, no optimism, just action. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, yes. Philippe. Uh, trust and training. Trust in the training. Trust and training. Trust Train. and training. Okay, well, we've got these really compact, lovely. Okay, go ahead, Valerie. Think differently, and in addition to what can be done now, prepare the major changes needed towards net zero CO2, and for that, integrity matters. There's a UN high-level experts uh, report from last November for non-state actors like cities, like companies, with very simple integrity principles for net zero CO2 strategies, and they should be implemented. They should be implemented. It's been an absolute pleasure. Estelle, Laurence, Philippe, and Valérie, thank you so much for our first round table. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, well, we'll just wrap that up there. Um, just to say that uh, we've had a, a wonderful time for the first round table. Uh, it's now, now time for lunch in Le Grand Hall, I'm told. Uh, don't forget, our next round table will be kicking off at one o'clock. The topic will be uh, green finance, and we'll, we'll see you then. See you back soon.
Hello and uh, welcome back. Uh, just before the break, you got a chance to listen in to our first round table of today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our second uh, round table, which is focusing on uh, green finance for you uh, this afternoon. What is green finance? Well, it's ultimately uh, essentially a loan or investment that looks at environmentally positive activities, so how you know, investment can be done in a green way, ultimately. Um, the question that we're going to be asking today is, is uh, green finance regulation at the way forward, and does it actually add value to business? And of course, uh, this fight, uh, mobilizing people against uh, climate change. Uh, before I introduce our panelists uh, who will be up here with me today, I just want to remind you again about the interactivity of this event. You saw that it worked really well in the first half. If you do have a question, and I know a couple of people grabbed me outside and said, look, you know, I'd like to ask this. I directed them back to the QR code, okay? As long as you put your questions in, they're filtered through to us, and you have a real chance of uh, our IP Paris students coming up here uh, to get those questions to our panel. So it really it is working well for this interactive conference today, our second uh, international conference called Reflections on Climate Change uh, 2023. Uh, to get things started, I would like to welcome uh, to the stage Jo Tyndall. She's Director uh, for the Environment Directorate at the OECD. Uh, Joe will be fleshing out some ideas for us about the urgency to act when it comes to climate change. She'll also be specifically outlining the OECD's approach uh, when it comes to mobilising finance for climate. So Joe, if you'd like to join me up here, I shall let you take things away. Thanks very much, Joe. Good afternoon, uh, bon après-midi à, à tous, et merci de m'avoir invité à, à parler sur ce sujet très très important. Uh, I will speak in, in English, but I understand you have uh, translation. And I now have uh, a PowerPoint presentation, which is great. Um, it is my pleasure to speak to you today on one of, if not the, most critical enablers for reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement, and that is delivering finance uh, for climate action. Now, this is finance at all levels. It's domestically, it's internationally, um, and the multiple vehicles of delivery, whether it's public finance, uh, multilateral development banks, central banks, other financial institutions, right to the level of uh, the private sector. So it's a massive subject. Uh, we are at a serious crossroads when it comes to bridging the finance and investment gap and ensuring we meet global net zero emissions by 2050. And as I'm sure you are all aware, failing to deliver on this objective truly risks failing our planet. Before I speak about what we're doing at the OEC to drive this agenda forward, it's important to take a step back and remember that first and foremost, we do have uh, the legal framing in the form of the Paris Agreement uh, for work on climate change. And that is a very powerful political statement of intent that sets temperature goals, uh, that are underpinned by nationally determined contributions, by a ratchet mechanism for ambition, uh, and by transparency, as well as, of course, financial goals, which I will touch on today. Now, each successive year, IPCC reporting confirms that the problems are worse than we thought uh, and uh, that climate change is moving faster than we had thought. So governments now have to do everything possible to limit a global temperature overshoot beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that means reducing emissions quickly. Now, this graph uh, um, is important. It, it relates to the most up-to-date evidence on climate system tipping points. And it shows that we are already entering the warming range at which potentially catastrophic impacts become possible. So the massive and rapid scaling of finance from all sources 
uh, is the critical lever to safeguarding our planet and to staying the course for net zero. It really matters that we limit both the uh, extent in terms of degrees Celsius and the time frame for any overshoot of 1.5 degrees. You can see if you uh, um, do more, we are going to uh, uh, face more of these tipping points. The first port of call, of course, is mitigation to kind of stop the fire um, at its source, if you like. Uh, and uh, finance has to be directed to that. But we've already reached a point where there's a certain amount of baked in global warming uh, with uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, that, that uh, is going to force us to spend money on adaptation as well. Now, despite what this slide is telling us, there is at least some good news. There is enough money in the system to make this happen. Uh, it's just that a lot of it is misdirected. And what's needed is the activation uh, to their fullest potential of all enablers for driving finance into investment, projects, and activities that are going to make sure we can transition to net zero emissions and build our resilience to the impacts of climate change. So, this uh, um, slide indicates there are two broad building blocks uh, to make this happen. First, we track and measure climate finance. That is the flows of finance provided and mobilized by developed countries for developing countries in support of the $100 billion goal. Uh, second, uh, is the efficient operation of the mainstream financial sector. That means shifting financial uh, market practices so they're working effectively to allocate capital in ways that are in alignment with the Paris Agreement. So digging a little bit deeper um, into the first building block on uh, climate finance, at the request of donor countries, the OECD has been measuring progress towards what is a politically really important uh, goal of um, $100 billion annually being provided in climate finance. And we've been doing that since 2015. So just as a, a reminder, at COP15 back in 2009, developed countries committed to a collective goal of providing and mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020 to support climate action in developing countries. And this was reaffirmed and indeed strengthened at the Paris COP um, in 2015. Our tracking helps drive accountability amongst the developing country governments on this commitment, and it shines a really important spotlight on current levels uh, of global climate uh, public finance, including the levels of mobilised private finance. Our most recent report that's reflected on this, this uh, graph uh, uh, indicates that in 2020, and remember this was the initial target year uh, for that $100 billion uh, goal to be met, in 2020 total climate finance provided and mobilised by developed countries reached 83.3 billion. So that meant it fell short uh, of the goal by $16.7 billion. In addition, the private climate finance mobilization we can track has stagnated since 2017 and actually declined in 2020. So there's a clear gap that donors need to address. And with the developing world suffering the brunt of the impacts of climate change and calling for much needed support in mitigating emissions, there really is no time to waste. So mobilizing private sector finance is critical to this. And when it comes to the levels of finance needed to achieve the global uh, transition to net zero emissions by mid-century, uh, we can't get there otherwise. The energy sector is going to require, and this is just the energy sector, uh, is going to require an a, annual investment of four trillion US dollars in clean energy by 2030. 
less than seven years away. Public finance alone can only ever be a drop in the bucket uh, towards that. Uh, so it won't be enough to get us across the line. But it can be a catalyst, and it's important it's used in the right way. There is considerable scope uh, to use public climate finance much more effectively to support the contributions, uh, uh, the conditions rather, for private investment. Many green technologies, particularly clean energy technologies, are already commercially viable. And the International Energy Agency has produced uh, reports that indicate solar energy, for example, for the first time, is the cheapest form of energy, even cheaper uh, than fossil fuels. The remaining hurdles to uh, investment can often be overcome with limited intervention from the public sector by providing the right policy environments and just enough public finance to de-risk investments. So this is all about crowding in rather than crowding out uh, uh, private investment. Our anal analysis shows that blended finance, by which we mean the strategic use of development finance to crowd in commercial and other finance, that blended finance can play an important role. However, it needs to be scaled up and deployed more effectively to target the underlying barriers to investment, of which there are quite a number. Now, we also need to rethink the role of donors and multilateral development banks. The MDBs have been highlighting the need for increased resources, they want more money, uh, from their shareholders to more effectively mobilise private finance. While donors, on the other hand, are stressing that existing resources can uh, and should be used much more effectively. Well, there is validity in both arguments. More public resources are certainly needed, but the current deployment of resources is not optimising private capital mobilisation. And these are the areas where the OECD is providing support and analysis. We're currently preparing, at the request of donors, detailed analysis on mobilising private finance. And this focused analysis is going to be ready for release in the lead up to COP28 at the end of this year. Um, you can see uh, the, the uh, uh, key areas we plan to cover in supporting mobilisation here on this slide. I hope Yes, I'm hoping I'm on the right uh, uh, slide there. Uh, and we'll come back to this later. So, shifting global financial markets, moving to the second building block, it goes without saying that the net zero transition requires a whole of financial system response. We can't deliver on finance for climate change without shifting the broader mainstream financial sector from grey to green, if you like. In ensuring efficient market practices are driving climate-aligned finance flows. And that would unlock an entirely new order of magnitude in the scale of finance going towards climate action. Here, the OECD's work includes analysing the alignment of investment approaches with climate obje uh, objectives, and in particular, ESG reporting. Well, that's a relatively new concept. It's been rather stakeholder-driven to date, um, but that is changing. I have included uh, some of the outcomes of this analysis on the slide here, which is quite a complex one to, uh, to have a look at. Um, but just to note that our work has raised questions as to the usefulness of these ratings for investors particularly when it comes to the environmental pillar, or the E, of, I, of ESG. For example, high scores in the environment pillar of ESG ratings are not always correlated with lower levels of greenhouse gas emissions. The intentions are not being matched by the outcomes. And sometimes the planning isn't even there. Now, the OECD um, has provided policy guidance to support governments strengthen ESG inve investing and climate transition practices. 
Uh, and what we've therefore focused on, given these problems, is developing high quality disclosures, metrics, ratings, targets, and frameworks. The OECD recommendations on ESG focus on improving the transparency and credibility of ESG rating methodologies and promoting market integrity. Really important concepts there. They encourage global comparability and quality of ESG metrics and approaches. Uh, for example, through mandatory disclosure, and that is starting to happen, happen um, for a number of governments. Importantly, the guidance calls for a science-based uh, so, sorry, sorry, calls for science-based interim net zero targets to ensure that transition plans and supporting material are robust. Credibility is absolutely essential for the effective allocation of much needed capital in support of climate action and the effective operations, operation of markets as a whole if we are to achieve a sustainable and truly resilient transition to net zero. So um, effective allocation of capital in support of climate action has to extend to aligned action at the firm level, at the business level. And that means activities in support of reducing emissions and building resilience to climate impacts. For this, the OECD has developed two important legal instruments to drive this forward, both of which have recently been revised to strengthen climate-related commitments. First, on the slide there, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises on responsible business conduct. This is the only multilaterally agreed and comprehensive instrument on RBC that governments have committed to promoting. The uh, sorry, 2011 version has been revised and was formally adopted just this week, uh, approved at the Ministerial Council meeting uh, held at the OECD. It now includes clear expectations for business on action related to climate and biodiversity loss and specific recommendations for, for business in conducting due diligence on a range of environmental risks and impacts. These expectations relate not only to the direct operations of a business, but also uh, activities across the supply chain. So in other words, it extends to the, the so-called scope three activities or emissions. The guidelines are already being well reflected into law. For example, through taxonomies, due diligence legislation, and regulations for disclosure. The second uh, um, example, the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance are an important international standard for policymakers in evaluating and improving the legal regulatory and institutional framework for corporate governance. And these principles have also recently been updated to include a new dedicated chapter on sustainability measures. Now, um, it's a well-known adage that uh, we cannot manage what we can't measure. It's an adage that has the advantage of being true. Uh, and shifting the focus of um, the mainstream, climate, uh, fin uh, mainstream financial sector to alignment with the, the Paris goals on mitigation and resilience will not be possible without measuring and tracking. And this is the commitment reflected in Article 2.1c uh, of the Paris uh, Agreement. Investors and financial institutions are increasingly committing to Paris Agreement alignments. Paris Agreement alignment, what does this mean? Many of the metrics and underlying methods being used to give effect to commitments lack consistency, and they provide little evidence of any real economy impacts. In fact, our analysis shows that uh, uh, at best, 
current efforts are leading to little or no decarbonisation in the real economy, and at worst, are giving both markets and policymakers a false impression of progress. So having um, what's known as a greenwashing effect. To be sure, we make real progress in financing and mobilising finance for climate and in a way that leads to real impact at the firm level, improved and consistent metrics and methods for measuring alignment are essential. So the focus on uh, environmental integrity or credibility, particularly when it comes to greenwashing, is a key pillar of our work in transition finance. And by transition finance, we mean finance to support companies, particularly those that are operating in hard to abate sectors uh, in moving to net zero emissions. Concrete, steel, uh, a couple of examples. Now this concept of transition finance is uh, gaining traction, leading to a proliferation of diverse transition finance initiatives by both government and industry. However, for um, transition finance approaches and related financial instruments to be robust, they must be based on credible transition plans. And this is central to uh, uh, the focus of our guidance on transition finance. And that provides 10 key elements for credible corporate transition plans, highlights areas where more transparency is needed. And those 10 uh, elements are listed on this slide. Now, before I conclude, I just want to make one final point. I touched on efficient and well-functioning markets as necessary for enabling aligned climate finance flows. But it is important to remember they will only be able to function in this way if we all work within our planetary boundaries. Climate change and biodiversity loss, um, it's increasingly evident, are two sides of the same coin. You cannot implement durable and robust solutions for one without taking on board the other. And with biodiversity and ecosystem services underpinning all economic activities and human well-being, the destruction of biodiversity at an unprecedented rate, which we're experiencing at the moment, is posing significant risks to both the economy and the financial sector. And despite this, biodiversity-related financial risks, dependencies and impacts are systematically mispriced by the financial sector. And that's going to have to change. And addressing this challenge, the OECD is developing a methodological framework to help central banks and retail banks assess biodiversity-related financial risks. Now, this includes a, a recent OECD report uh, referenced there, mapping existing approaches for assessing biodiversity-related financial risks impacts and dependencies. Uh, and we will be working uh, to follow up on the finance goals that were reflected in the Kunming Montreal Global uh, Framework that was agreed at COP, the Biodiversity COP 15 last year. And I should note, incidentally, that of course for climate and biodiversity, we're talking about the same pool of money. There's not a, a, a sort of a, a different approach. So we have to work in ways that are, are, um, have synergy and, and are well coordinated. So looking ahead, in closing, I would like to remind us all of the importance of being positive, of focusing on the opportunities. In the beginning of my speech, uh, I highlighted that there is enough money in the system to bridge the critical climate investment gap. To make sure the money goes to where it needs to, to go, our work centres around the two key building blocks I've discussed today, the need for tracking progress on climate finance and their flows, and the need to shift global financial markets to enable the efficient allocation of capital that is aligned with climate objectives. And all these efforts have a critical focus on mobilising private sector finance. 
I realise that none of what I've mentioned is going to be simple or easy to implement. And this uh, runs counter, unfortunately, to the pace of change uh, that the climate crisis demands. But I, what I do want to assure you is that there is progress. And there is progress across all of the areas for action I've shared with you. Not only is there progress, but these building blocks represent core priorities for our work right across the OECD. Uh, there's internal collaboration, whether we're talking about tax, uh, economic department, uh, development cooperation, uh, financial affairs directorate, etc., etc. We're looking at it in a holistic way from a whole range of different perspectives. And what's more, uh, we are only going to see further opportunities to capitalise on these efforts. I've just put a timeline uh, on this slide to show a few of the big political moments coming up um, with, uh, for example, the next one. Uh, well, I'm going to bomb this afternoon for a brief visit for during this um, uh, annual meeting. Uh, and the next one later this month is uh, the, the Climate fin uh, Finance Summit being held here in Paris. Uh, I will mention COP28 as just one example, though. Three of the main negotiating targets for COP this year are finance-related. First, the negotiation of a new collective quantified goal for climate finance as a follow-on from the 2020 $100 billion goal. Here, negotiators are going to be discussing both a target amount and where the money is going to come from. Second, the Loss and Damage Fund. Negotiators agreed to develop this funding arrangement at COP27 last year to provide financial assistance uh, to vulnerable countries, those experiencing the most severe impacts uh, of climate change, whether it be slow onset or, or um, disasters, that are, um, fall outside the bounds of adaptation, and they're not covered by current funding arrangements like the, the um, Green Climate Fund or the, the Global Environment Facility. The focus this year will be on how to operationalise this loss and damage fund, and discussions are going to cover, again, sources of finance, who will contribute, and who will be eligible to receive funding. And the third area is reform of the existing financial architecture. These issues are linked uh, to much of what I've already mentioned today and also, of course, going to be a focus for the upcoming summit uh, for a new global financi uh, financing pact hosted by President Macron. So, the watchwords I want to you to take away um, from this are urgency, credibility, coherence and consistency of approaches. And that is what is driving uh, the OECD work to, to try and help bring some order out of um, the slightly chaotic world we have out of there. I'm going to end there uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to uh, the panel discussion. Thank you. Joe, thank you uh, very much indeed for detailing the OECD's uh, approach. It was particularly insightful to have a look at some of the uh, instruments and the standards that you're working to. And of course, uh, your buzzwords there that you left us with were, were very uh, interesting indeed. Uh, you did say something which I thought was interesting, Joe, about the fact that none of this is simple. It's complex. Uh, speaking about uh, green finance investment is, is not going to be simple. We're going to attempt it uh, nonetheless. So let's uh, begin our session second roundtable uh, of today. I can uh, welcome to the stage Patricia Kreef. She's a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique IP Paris and deputy director of uh, the Centre for Energy for Climate. So Patricia, if you'd like to come up to the stage for us, a warm welcome to you. Uh, wonderful you're here. Uh, we have, in addition to Patricia, there's Peter Tankoff, who's a professor of quantitative finance at INSEE Paris, IP Paris. Uh, good to have you with us, Peter. Uh, there's Paul Schreiber, a senior policy advisor at Reclaim Finance. Uh, Peter, if you'll come up for us as well. Uh, Pierre Alex Binet, head of institutional and regulatory affairs at La Banque Postale. Welcome to you, Pierre Alex. 
And then we have Virginie Vitiello, who is head of socially responsible investing with the uh, Caisse de Depot. So welcome to you as well, Virginie. Okay. Do you want all right, so we have a slightly larger uh, panel this time, but less less time, in fact. Uh, so, Patricia, I wonder if we could uh, kick off with you in terms of question. Uh, we're uh, unpacking, I should say, the complexities of green finance. Just give us a sense. What exactly is, is green finance? How does it work? So, um, basically, most has been already said by Joe, so I would just uh, um, highlight and, and uh, build upon, up, upon this uh, wonderful uh, uh, keynote. So what uh, green finance, uh, climate finance is about is really integrating uh, climate risk into financial decisions. So as has been said, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex process. Uh, climate risk in general in economics is, is defined by two main dimensions, the physical risk and the transition risk. The physical risk uh, amount to the, uh, the events, uh, the drought, the flood, and things like that, uh, the increase in the heat temperature that will affect economic assets, and the transition risk rather come from uh, the policy measure that we have to uh, uh, adopt, the behavioral change that will also uh, uh, perturbate the, 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 the system and the economic uh, decision. So it's, a, it's something complex that also takes uh, a bigger perspective when, uh, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Joe Tindard, uh, you integrate this uh, analysis and decision within a broader framework of sustainability, meaning environmental but also social and governance uh, decisions. So uh, sustainable finance, uh, green finance is part of sustainable finance, which is a, a quite complex um, uh, uh, dimension to, to, to evaluate. I mean, we know, it, we know it's complex. There are also a number of obstacles uh, which arise ultimately when we want to implement uh, specific green finance projects. Uh, walk us through some of the obstacles that you, you're bound to meet on your way when you want to uh, you know, move forward with green financing. So as main obstacle, I would, I would say there are two big uh, obstacles, uh, uh, to my view. The first one uh, relates to the kind of paradox that we are seeing in the form that uh, I mentioned earlier, sustainable finance. Uh, this uh, and green finance has developed a lot uh, in, the, in the recent past. You know, if we, if we go back to the early uh, 21st century, only at most 10% of the amount of uh, funds that was invested in financial markets incorporated an environmental or social or governance decisions. In 2015, at uh, the time of the Paris Agreement, it was uh, up to 20%. And nowadays, it should be around 30% of the money invested on financial markets that would incorporate a kind of sustainability uh, uh, dimension. In France, let's focus a little bit about France, which is considered as a pioneer market uh, for sustainable finance. You know, um, uh, we, we would be around 45% of the amount invested uh, on uh, financial markets. Uh, allocated to, to green or sustainable uh, funds. So it seems quite popular, but there is a paradox because when you um, ask people what is green finance, what is sustainable finance, half, I mean, or, or, almost nobody knows it. I mean, people, retail investors, they really, uh, uh, they, they really consider it as an important uh, element, as a crucial uh, dimension. Uh, like seven out of 10 person uh, that are surveyed, for instance, by the French authority for a, a financial market, declare that they really want their banks and their insurance to incorporate such dimensions, but only 20 or 25 percent of the people surveyed believe in the credibility, it's something that was uh, highlighted by Joe, in the credibility of such decisions. So popularity is a bit paradoxically also the, an obstacle because there is some doubt and skepticism about uh, such strategies. Is really one uh, uh, um, euro out of two really sustainable? There are some doubts and greenwashing also is, uh, is uh, behind that. And the second main obstacle I would, I would highlight is the impact, the notion of impact. Claiming that you incorporate, integrate an environmental dimension is not a proof that you really have an impact on the climate and that you really change things. So you need to have three important aspects to have an impact. You need to have, of course, intention to change and to uh, improve the, 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 the climate uh, risk. But you also need to prove 
uh, your impact. So you need really to, to the measurement issue of uh, uh, assessing impact is very important. And you need to have um, a, a theory of change that really shows that it's because of your investment that things have changed, that you are not just uh, greenwashing your strategies. And you, you also need to have strong evaluation and, uh, and um, exposed uh, uh, measurement uh, uh, and you know, um, transparency about, about that. And th that is something we are really lacking, especially when uh, Joe presented the different uh, uh, ESG scores and the correlation between different raters. We see that the correlation is, is uh, low, meaning that for the same dimension, for the same issue, for the same companies, different raters would provide different uh, uh, scores. So that's, uh, that, that's uh, also part of the, of the, of the problem. There's a lot of I interesting points there raised about you know, scepticism, about the fact that you know, transparency is key, and that uh, sometimes ESG targets are not always uh, matching, up to, uh, you know, uh, matching up to one another. Uh, you spoke about investors there. It would be good to get a sense from you, Patricia, about uh, what uh, regulators and investors could do uh, to kind of better include the climate risks uh, into uh, financial issues, because it, it's not always done uh, to the best uh, possible uh, level, is it? So I will focus here to answer your, your question on one specific uh, uh, actor uh, um, concerned by, the, by, by your question, which are regulators, and in particular Central Bank. We had uh, uh, the privilege to hear uh, Christine Nagard a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago t talking about the uh, European Central Bank uh, strategy for uh, uh, climate change. And so I think it's important because the need for central banks and for regulators to mobilize uh, finance uh, around uh, and against uh, uh, climate change is really new in the political agenda and in the regulatory agenda. It is something that really comes uh, since the Paris Agreement, so it's something that uh, really um, matters because climate change actually is a threat both to economic activity and to financial stability. And the, the fact that uh, uh, documenting, showing that uh, uh, climate change is a threat to financial stability is something that really uh, uh, is really recent in the, um, in, in the agenda. And uh, for instance, uh, if I uh, go back to the French case, the, the, in the mandate of the uh, um, Banque de France, in the uh, report, the yearly report, the, 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 the governor of the, of the uh, French uh, banking regulations uh, really um, explicitly uh, uh, address climate change issue, uh, saying that contributing to assessing, reducing, managing the impact of climate in the real economy is really uh, uh, part of the mandate of central banks, which is something uh, 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 quite new. Now, wh what would be the, um, the main tools for that? So, uh, one, I mean, not only recognizing climate change as a threat, but also uh, acting is, is, a, is a very big challenge, especially in a time where uh, infl inflation is, is rising, which is a core, a core mandate of the, of the central bank. So we really need to, um, uh, to uh, consider the different possibilities that a regulator has to, uh, to address climate change issue. I would, just for the sake of simplicity, highlight three main first uh, things. First, assess assess the impact of uh, climate change on the economy and on the financial uh, system. And here, central bank and supervisors are really well placed to, uh, to uh, understand the, the, the dynamics uh, uh, of uh, the interaction with financial system, to assess the consequences at the macroeconomic level, and to improve also public knowledge. I've mentioned the, 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 the popularity of uh, sustainable finance that is sometimes uh, lacking. Second part for regulators is to advise. Uh, supporting framework through dialogue, expertise, advocacy, uh, and uh, feed uh, and advise and, uh, uh, you know, help also private investors do it, and act. The last part, of course, to address climate change from a supervisory perspective is really to act uh, through macro-monetary measures, through uh, uh, monetary policy operation and financial policy measures. So in all the dimensions, in all the... Uh, the actions of, uh, of a central bank. This is what uh, uh, the European Central Bank uh, is doing. It is also what uh, all the national central banks are really planning to, planning to do. I mean, I'm deliberately kind of accelerating my next question. I'd hope to kind of do it a bit later, but I know that you have to, to get off, Patricia. I, I want to think a little bit about with the number of climate-related uh, 
issues, disasters, you might say, uh, taking France, for example, in certain parts of the country, we could see the cost of uh, climate-related claims go up, and essentially premiums in relation or off the back of that could, could rise. How do we remedy that? So that's, that's a very good point. I, I will follow you and uh, be, be brief on that. Uh, the, uh, when, you, when, you, when it comes to assessing the impact of climate change, uh, uh, what supervisors do is that they do a climate stress test. And so uh, this exercise was done in France. It is done at the European level. It is done in, in the UK as well. And for the French, uh, for, for the French case, that I've witnessed as, a, as a, um, a vice president of the Sustainable and Climate Commission of the French Prudential Authority uh, uh, um, of Supervision of Banking and Insurance Sector, what we've seen is that um, the, the cost of uh, weather-related events could actually amount to increase by five or six times between 2020 and 2050 meaning that if those costs of uh, drought, float, heat waves, and so on, uh, in certain departments uh, um, uh, would, be, would to be priced in the premiums of, uh, of insurers, uh, insurance premiums paid by individuals would rise uh, by 130% in the it's coming huge. years. So that's really, 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 really huge. It, it can go from 3 to 7% per year of increase in price. And here we touch a very important uh, aspect, is that once we assess, advise, act, uh, there is also the social acceptability of, the, of it, and um, the social dimension of all those climate-related events are really tremendous. This is what we call the just transition, the fact that we need to take into account both the environment and the climate uh, and its translation into financial decisions, but also the social counterpart of it, and the fact that inequality uh, really raises as the climate uh, change is not addressed, and there are two types of inequality to be addressed. Huh? The, the climate risks are not distributed equally, evenly across people. And it's all often the, the, those people who have the less insurance means, the less capabilities to protect themselves that are hit by such, uh, uh, by such events. So we are really facing a complex issue also as to the uh, balancing between environmental and social uh, decisions okay. and impacts. This uh, question of equity coming up uh, uh, once again, Patricia, I know you, you, you have to leave us. Thank you so much for answering those questions so uh, wholeheartedly for us. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I, might, I might just uh, swap seats with you, perhaps, Patricia, then, if that's the case, just so I can see the panel and, and kind of have a look at you while we're, while we're speaking. Thanks again for coming in. Um, Peter, if it's OK if we kind of pick up from where we left off, the, the message that was left with us by Patricia was this question of kind of equity. I, I want to get a sense from you about the benefits of green finance. Who benefits and, and how? Well, green finance is a uh, finance uh, which is there to, to finance the environmental transition. So who benefits from green finance? Well, to a certain extent, uh, investors. For example, green finance, I think, is important for retail investors who want to, to go green, who want, would like to finance the, the green transition. And so then green finance will allow them to somehow uh, invest in to fund the projects that they would like to fund. And then the environment will, uh, to a certain extent, if uh, things are done right, the environment will, will also benefit from, from this funding. Then, of course, green finance also involves uh, uh, evaluating climate uh, and maybe biodiversity-related risks. And so from a better understanding of these uh, risks, the whole economy stands to, to benefit because, uh, as Patricia mentioned, environmental risks, climate-related risks, are a threat to economic and financial stability. So if we're able to control these uh, risks, then this means that this will allow us to, to control, uh, to avoid future uh, financial and economic crises related to, to environmental transition, to climate change. So the whole economy also stands to benefit from green finance if it is done correctly. On the other hand, if it is not done correctly, if it is... Uh, uh, if there is, for example, greenwashing, then green finance can, in turn, create a crisis or with so on. 
I mean, greenwashing is a huge issue that I know we'll speak about with our, with our panel. How do we, again, begin to remedy greenwashing? Are there kind of any quick fix solutions to avoiding uh, the capacity to, to greenwash? Or is this just part and parcel of green finance? Well, there is a legislation at the European level that has been prepared to avoid greenwashing, but I think the best way to avoid greenwashing is disclosure, is uh, to improve uh, various disclosure frameworks. For example, uh, at present, disclosure for, no, is not compulsory for all companies, so smaller companies do not disclose, disclose for example, their carbon emissions. And also, carbon emissions, is, uh, it is not enough because we do not only need the current carbon emissions, but we need a way to estimate future carbon emissions, to evaluate the transition perspectives of, uh, of firms. We need to disclose, as was mentioned in the keynote, the, the transition plans of the companies. We need, need to be able to check whether these uh, transition plans are credible. And uh, also, to avoid greenwashing, uh, there are tools that can be developed by us as researchers. For example, uh, recently machine learning artificial intelligence tools have been developed to analyze, for example, company reports, because sometimes the information is there, but it's just difficult to get. And these artificial intelligence tools can enable us to, as one said, weed out the, the cheap talkers, talkers by looking at uh, what they actually, actually disclose. Yes. So would you say that one of the ways of getting around this greenwashing that you've made reference to and helping financial institutions to best use green uh, investment is one of the ways by reducing the possibility of loopholes? Because there are loopholes that you can get around now by, for example, not declaring certain things. Mm. Can we lessen those loopholes? Yes, uh, and uh, exactly by improving the disclosure frameworks, this can be uh, one of the objectives of this is to reduce the, the loopholes because the more information is in the limelight, so to say, the, the less uh, possibility of using loopholes there will be. Also, the data that is disclosed by, disclosed by the companies should be made publicly available. And there is uh, also an initiative that is in preparation, NZPDU, Net Zero Public Data Utility, whose objective, uh, objective is to make this disclosed data, in particular on carbon emission, publicly available, even uh, for free. Because right now, uh, environmental uh, data is uh, sold by data providers mm -hmm. who, for example, uh, estimate uh, or collect carbon emissions reported by companies and then compute some ESG ratings. And there is a big problem in the industry of uh, divergence of these ESG ratings and other uh, indicators. Also, for example, net zero uh, portfolio temperature measures, they diverge among different providers. If you take, this was also, I think, mentioned in the keynote, if you take uh, several providers, you will have several different numbers and you do not know which ones, which ones to trust. Here also, regulation is, in my view, uh, necessary in order to make these frameworks more robust. We've spoken today about inflation and the fact that it's sky high. We've spoken about uh, COVID and also the war in Ukraine. Now, those have all been, I think we all agree, particularly difficult uh, to navigate. Uh, central banks have said that kind of owing to these uh, situations or, or issues, that the energy transition investments have been put to one side and have been, in some respects, less effective than they might have been. How do we come back from that? And I suppose I'm asking, what are the avenues that we can explore to kind of bring this back to the, the forefront? Well, first of all, one of the impacts of the crisis that we have seen, in particular in relation to the war in Ukraine, was the acceleration of some energy transition investments because of the, uh, the Russian gas is no longer available. And it is important that these uh, investments uh, do not lead to carbon locking, for example, if mm -hmm. we build new liquefied gas terminals. We must make sure, for example, that they can be used in future for liquid hydrogen. Now, regarding your question specifically on uh, inflation, I think, uh, well, green transition is sometimes uh, said to be uh, inflationary because, of course, you need to raise the carbon price, so this will uh, lead to increased prices of uh, other goods like commodities, for example, metals that you need to, to construct uh, uh, new wind power plants, for example. But also doing nothing is also inflationary because uh, climate-related uh, catastrophes will uh, lead, for example, to reduced scar scarcity of food supply that will also lead to higher prices. Now, what can be done in the present inflationary context? Of course, 
inflation leads to higher interest rates, so it makes investment uh, more difficult. It's costlier. But, uh, and also renewable energy investments are sometimes considered to be more risky than the traditional investments, so they can be hit, harder hit by this inflation effect. In order to avoid this, I think uh, one needs to work on reducing the risk premium, for example, using blended finance or maybe some public guarantees for these renewable investment uh, projects. This can reduce the, the risk premium and therefore reduce the cost of investments. Also, what, what do you mean, sorry, Peter, what yeah. do you mean by blended finance? Will you be kind of a bit concrete on that? It's uh, like public-private partnerships mm -hmm. where the state offers some guarantees to private investors to allow them to invest more easily. In so it's the, more attractive. Yeah, more attractive. And also, another thing that I wanted to add is maybe it's a good uh, time to invest into some energy efficiency projects because because of the inflation energy prices are, are going up mm -hmm. so this creates and i see this in orsay in, in my town this creates an incentive for people to reduce their energy consumption by investing into energy efficiency and this can also be very uh, very beneficial all right, interesting, Peter. Thank you uh, very much for responding to those questions there. I'd like to kind of stay on this wave and, and, and bring Paul in here. Uh, this idea that you might mix the financing that you use or essentially, you know, look at other avenues uh, when it comes to uh, exploring uh, green finance measures. Give us an, a sense, Paul, of an efficient green measure, because it's fair to say when it comes to green finance, there are a variety of ways, as Peter was evoking, that this can be implemented, right? Oh, yes, totally. So um, I think I, I would focus on two main and essential characteristics that any good green finance measure should meet to truly be green and contribute to the, the transition. The first one, and it's probably the most difficult one and the one we don't really see today, is actually tackling the issue of a whole system transition. Mm -hmm. So what we have seen so far is the development of a class of assets, allegedly green, and I will come back on, on that point, uh, but we haven't really seen a transformation, a transition, a shift in the global allocation of financial flows. And the problem is, that's what we need. Uh, if I can make a comparison, if you look at the development of the energy sector historically, you can see that the new sources of energy have only been added up to the old one. They didn't really replace them, and that's even true for biomass, which is the oldest one we have. Um, it's also true for renewable energy so far. Renewable energy so far hasn't really been placed. Fossil fuel, it only adds up to it. Um, and that's what we do with green finance. We finance adding up new, allegedly green things on top of not so green, lots of things. Uh, so tackling the whole system transition is definitely the first criteria I would, uh, I would uh, think is, is essential. Uh, just to give you a few data that could help you uh, figure out how we are today. So since the Paris Agreement, you had the 60 biggest bank in the world that devoted uh, $5.5 trillion to fossil fuels. Uh, it was still $668 billion in 2022. So it's still quite a lot. Just a um, bit, yeah. And uh, if you look at the ratio uh, for this financial institution, the ratio between renewable energy investments, not only renewable, but what they call clean, so it includes some not so clean things in there, but still clean energy investments to fossil fuel investments. The average ratio for EU institutions today would be about 1.1. So $1.1 dollar spent for every dollar spent on fossil fuels. And the IEA says in 2030 should be five. So much more. It should even go to nine if you take into account the investment in demand. So all of the efficiency investment that Peter mentioned. Um, so tackling the whole system transition, we are not there yet. And it's not uh, what most of the green measures you can see are talking about. So that's a, a big problem that we have. And the second dimension, the second essential characteristic is the one we already started to touch upon with the things like greenwashing is just ensuring that what we call green is actually green. And you already have lots of good points made on that issue, notably regarding SG ratings, for example, which are a great example of that. Uh, but you can find lots of other examples. You had green bonds financing coal at one point. You still have green bonds today financing airport expansions. You have sustainability bonds financing uh, new pipelines. So that's, that's basically, I mean, I don't need to explain why it doesn't work. <laughs> no, um, so any green service, any green products 
should be uh, actually based on science and sh we should ensure that it's truly beneficial to the transition. There is actually a pretty good report from the European Supervisory Authorities on the concept of greenwashing that just was just published. It gives a pretty good and complete definition of the issue. If it was implemented today fully, it would be a big problem for lots of financial institutions. So just a, a big warning on that and uh, also some hope that it will be better in, in the coming year on that specific point. Do you, do you think, is it realistic to, to think that green finance will, you know, as you've just outlined there, become really green at some stage without these kind of, you know, afterthoughts and, you know, investments that perhaps don't stand up uh, to what they really should be? So, uh, uh, is it realistic? That's a good question. Uh, I think it, it could become much greener. <laughs> That's the first point. Will it be totally green? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's a proper word that we should use, but I, I definitely think there is lots of margin for progress. And I can take some concrete examples to, to, to exemplify on the points that I'm making. So one good example would be the state of the green bond market. So the green bonds today is probably the most widespread type of green assets that you can find, green bonds. Uh, and if you look at the data for S&P Global, you had uh, 775 billion in green bonds in 2022. It's, it's a lot. It's also uh, um, has to be compared with more than uh, 5 trillion, 550, uh, 5 5.3 trillion in vanilla bonds, in standard bonds, so not green bonds. Uh, also, if you look at the same numbers from CBI, Climate Bond Initiatives, which is supposed to be much more drastic in the way it labels green bonds, the number of green bonds drops to 500 billion. So huge gap between the S&P number and the CBI number. And the CBI number itself, the 500, is not actually what CBI considers aligned with a green definition. It's, 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 it's lower. So my point is, uh, with this example, it's pretty straightforward. It's first, it's not at all the whole system transition I'm talking about here. It's only a pool of green assets. And second, we don't know if it's actually green, and it seems it's not for a big part of it. Uh, so that's the example of the green bond. You can make another example with, with sustainable funds. Looking at the French sector, which is supposed to be leading on, on, on that front, you have about 71 billion uh, in sustainable funds in, in, in France. Uh, without a clear definition of sustainable, just funds that are allegedly sustainable. Uh, it's 1.8% of the outstanding amount for investors in France. If you look at the Greenfield label, this drops to, to 12 billion. And the Greenfield label, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you actually have clear criteria on should you invest in, in, in such sector, you have criteria to target green investments, you have criteria to exclude fossil fuel. So the number drops to 12 billion. Just another example that shows that we have a, a, a quality question, but we also have a huge volume question. And we need to really have a, an approach that brings those two together. So bringing together quality and... And uh, I would say quantity, but it's more completeness, the completeness of the approach. Quality complete list. We've been speaking a lot today about the need to either have a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach, that is to get all actors on board. Uh, specifically, we're talking about green finance. What would you say it will take to get uh, your kind of your larger financial, uh, regulatory financial institutions on board and your local agencies? Is it complex getting those both on board for the same projects? Um, I don't think it's that complex. I think it's actually a very top-down process. Today, uh, how it works is the most influential thing we can do is change the rules, the legal rules, also changing the supervision. It has been mentioned several times, but we already have seen in the past, for example, when you have changes in risk regulation, prudential regulation to financial institution, it can trigger swift changes in the affectation of the allocation of portfolios. So changing the rules, definitely the first step, so it's it's very top-down. Um, and then also inside the financial institutions, the process remains a bit top-down. So the strategy is usually defined at group level, the sustainable strategy, uh, and then implemented by the various branches. Sometimes the branches, they do have a little room to navigate. They can create their own initiatives. Uh, in France, we had the example of, of branches, for example, in Credit Mutual, that set up a specific lending facility for building innovation. So it's, it's a good initiative. Uh, but it's an initiative that fits into 
a global plan that was set up at the, at the group level. So it's always kind of top down. So I'm hearing from you a cautious optimism. I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and I know that there are several, two students, in fact, that have questions for you, so I don't want to hog all of your time. Pierre, Alex, if I bring you in here, um, in your opinion, is a bank's principal role, or what is, I should say, a bank's principal role when it comes to energy transition? What would you say? Um, the business of, of banks um, is to, to allocate capital following the risk appreciation. So in my opinion, uh, the banks have a major role to play um, in, in the to energy transition. Um, it's a major role to play and they have to, to provide capital, service and also to, to and especially to transform the business model of uh, the, all the economic players. So for me, um, it's not easy. It has to be done very uh, uh, strict conditions based on uh, scientific recommendations. And also it means that banks has to exit totally from uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, regarding all the scopes, one, two, three, and, um, and to provide um, uh, services, resources, informations, um, financial informations to, um, to all companies uh, to, 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 be, to be able uh, to, 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 to implement their, their transformation plan, plan uh, as effectively as possible. I mean, there'll be people listening in to you, Pierre, Alex, who think, well, you know, what does the borer have to do to qualify, if you will, or to be eligible for green, green finance? You know, that people thinking, well, am I eligible? Uh, I've got a project in mind uh, that I'd like financed. How, what do you have to meet in terms of a borer to get that uh, investment? As I understand, there are two parts to your question, the accessibility of our, all the sustainable products and uh, also how to qualify uh, our products. So, uh, and also uh, what, what we do uh, to prevent greenwashing because uh, so the, you, you, are, you have the accessibility and also the how to qualify. Because um, greenwashing is a fierce enemy of sustainable finance, we have, um, we have to, the, the, the question of how to qualify our product is a, a key question. So at La Banque Postale, we, we have uh, defined um, very clear and applicable um, uh, inf inf data information to, to, to better qualify our offer. We are a mission-led company, so we have uh, one purpose and some uh, environmental and social objectives in our status. So one of our status is to um, uh, is to have 80% of our new offers uh, considering as citizen, because the Bank Postal is a citizen bank uh, by 2025. What does it mean? Mm. It means that we have to, uh, to how to be uh, identified as a, a citizen. We have a, a ESG checklist. All the new offer as uh, to meet at least. 50% of the criteria of this ESG checklist. Um, it's a mandatory tool to... Why just 50%, Pierre Alex? Is it because the criteria is so, so difficult to, yeah. to meet? Because only 50, because um, no, absolutely no products can, uh, can match all the, f the, the, total, uh, the total criteria. Because Not even the best product in the world? You have some characteristics of the elements to... 50% uh, it's, a, it's a big, big, um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge threshold for to be, to be identified as a citizen. Uh, because you, for example, you have uh, some very specific, very, uh, very, very, uh, very specific um, in uh, financial tool and um, no, no one tool can match uh, all the criteria. Does the bank have to meet 50% of the criteria as well? Or yes. do they have to go over that? Uh, we, we want to have 80%, um, but for one tool, for one product, for one financial product, it has to match at least 50% to be sure that um, it's, um, it's considered um, as a, an ESG product with the risk and impact associated to the, to the product. So it's just for the, um, the basis, the timeline is, uh, the baseline is uh, only to, uh, to have 80% of our new offer as considered as citizen, but we have also um, a sustainable social and uh, 
uh, impact products to, to go even further. Uh, and to go back to your question about the green loan um, and also the quality and the, the balance between quality and accessibility. So we have our green loan. It has to meet at least one of the six um, um, goals of the European taxonomy. Uh, just to say about the regulation, the legal framework, um, we prefer to have legal framework to qualify our offer, but when the regulation is not as precise as I would like to, it's better to, we, ha we are forced to, to, to write our own rule, our own doctrine. That's the uh, checklist ESG. So to be green, one product has to meet at least one of the six, um, the six objectives of, of the European taxonomy, and um, we, we, we therefore uh, allocate the, the, the loan to a project defined that complies with taxonomy, but with a minimum of 300,000 euros. That's a very important point, because it's a threshold that is, very, is much low, lower than the, the, the market medium average. And so that means that we have a green loan that is accessible and also that complies with taxonomy. So quality and uh, accessibility. Uh, to sum up, uh, for us, it's one of the, our tools to democratize sustainable finance in the territories. Pierre-Alex, just a, a quick response for you on this one. In your view, from where you, you're sitting right now, do you think green loans are as accessible as they could be or is there still some uh, headway to go? Green loans are accessible um, for um, uh, green loans and are accessible for those who, who want to do it. So there are there. We, we, our role as a bank is to accompany our clients to uh, to make it possible. Um, today, um, our role to La Banque Postale is to to help uh, territories, but also um, uh, hospitals, also uh, SMEs. Uh, and individuals to, to, to can have uh, uh, green loans. Green, uh, so um, we, we, um, all our expertise now is concentrate to, uh, to develop this project uh, on the ground. So it's, for us, it's totally accessible compared to the, to our, uh, to the other banks. Uh, of course, we have to, to do better and to, um, to, 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 to shape it better for, for a better price for, to, to democratize all these tools. Okay, Pierre, uh, thank you very much for responding to those questions. Uh, Virginie, last but of course not least on our panel, and there'll be uh, some questions from our audience as well. Um, for sustainability, uh, Virginie, to be successful, the environment, social responsibility, I know you're head of uh, social responsibility, plus the economy, they all kind of need consideration. We need to be kind of thinking about those. Can a financial organisation really claim to, to meet all of those requirements? Thank you for the question. Um, as Joe uh, Tindall uh, introduces, um, there is uh, co no clear correlation with uh, ESG criteria and the success of the financial. And so uh, we need a financial actors that really have a role to play, an active role in transforming the economies by integrating environmental and social issues into the processes. And so um, at Caisse des uh, as we support public policies and work to promote economic, social, and sustainable development, this is a priority for us. Um, for example, we have allocated 31 billion euros dedicated to environmental and energy transition between 2020 and 2021. And um, so at Caisse des we are both uh, a public development bank uh, where Bank de Territoire and BPI France mission is to finance and develop businesses uh, to make the region more sustainable, more connective and more inclusive. And also we are an asset manager we, um, where uh, we manage French people's savings. Uh, we buy equities, and corporate bonds and sovereign bonds that meet also uh, ESG criteria. And so to, to have a robust uh, ESG and investment criteria, we have developed an uh, investment charter since 2014 that has been uh, updated last year, where we integrate, we have like three pillars, ESG integration, stakeholder dialogue, and exclusion. 
And so we have reinforced uh, this year the exclusion list and also the stakeholder dialogues. And uh, it will be applicable for all of our um, activities in July this year. Um, also, uh, for, for example, um, we have developed uh, internal tools. Um, it's uh, to make the decision, investment decision now, every uh, important, I would say, material investment needs to be screened through this tool uh, since this year, uh, so that we have the same level of, uh, I mean, uh, criteria between ESG and finance, since it is really new also. Um, I also, I need to point out the regulation. The Article 9, uh, 29 of the French law on energy and climate laws uh, is uh, also get, get, getting a, a level up uh, because a uh, financial institution needs to be transparent and uh, on, on, on Biodiversity, climate, and ESG risk I need to report this year all of those. And so I'm sure you will see a difference between last year's report and today's report uh, in, in every financial institution because you need to be more transparent. You need to communicate not only the good uh, data, but also the bad data, <laughs> I would say, like the, the brown exposure. And, and this is a really important uh, shift, I, I can see. Um, yeah, uh, so, but of course, to, to, to high up uh, ESG at the same level of finance, sometimes you need to, to have a you know, lower return on investment. I mean, uh, if, if you want to uh, make an impact, you, uh, you need to, for example, we have, we have seen some projects in uh, waste ma wastewater management or um, waste management or heating network uh, that are project we finance, but uh, that are important for the territories, but with uh, lower returns. I mean, you spoke about, uh, what, what did you say? You said that ultimately we need to report the bad uh, data as well as the good data, which is fair, and you, you touched on virtually this idea of transparency. I guess my question is, how do we kind of reduce the temptation uh, to kind of greenwash? How do we get financial institutions away from wanting to just so show, as you said, the good data, but not the bad stuff? Your thoughts on that, version? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to go back a little bit from the history of ESG and, and, and uh, I think it's really started in 2015 with the Paris Agreement and at that time a lot of communication were made and saying uh, uh, you need to report, and you, need to, you need to say that you are green, you need to, you need to show off. <laughs> and, uh, but um, it's, it's not, I, I don't think, I've seen this, I've seen this move, I've seen uh, also um, competencies uh, inside uh, financial institution to to strengthen and and um, and and now I can see that uh, for example uh, we cannot communicate our commitment result without very, very being very precise on, on on the scope for example we may, we need also to be rigorous and transparent on the different flows and uh, we cannot only communicate on what we do well, we must also report on the, all of our activities to account our exposure to bronze sectors. And that's also the recommendation from ESMA. And um, I can give you also the example of uh, uh, the uh, SRI label um, that has been some controversy. Um, and for that, I think we need to go back to the definition of greenwashing, okay? Greenwashing, because it's a label, it's not a greenwashing label. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the greenwashing terms refer to the act of communicating action in favor of the energy transition that have not been kept or carried out. And uh, for example, if a fund manager announced wrongly that it did not finance fossil fuel, um, the SRI label does, however, lend additional credibility to responsible investment. So I think also there is a need to uh, better address 
um, transparency and definition to what is greenwashing. Okay, so better address transparency. The deeper we dig, the more things we realise we need to, to regulate, right, Virginie? Um, I'm just conscious of the time. I'd like to, at this stage, thank you all for answering those questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome on stage Ekaterina Gush and also uh, Lena uh, Monas. Uh, they are uh, students of the uh, Institut Polytechnique de Paris and the Ecole de Pont. Uh, welcome to you, ladies. Um, don't forget, these are the questions that you've been feeding through to us. Um, so, you know, we're making this an interactive conference. Again, this is an open kind of floor, so do feel free, you know, if you do want to answer the question, it's up to uh, you. Um, if we start with you, Ekaterina, uh, what would you say is the first question that you, that you have? Sure, actually, sorry to disrupt maybe your order, but maybe I'll hand over the first one for Lena, if that's all by right. All means, by Great, all means, thank you. <laughs> so she'll kick it off. Okay, go okay. ahead, Lena. So thank you, first of all, thank you all for this very interesting panel. And uh, my question had to do with, uh, in your view, uh, whether uh, financial institutions saw green finance rather as a constraint today or rather as an opportunity? And uh, what, 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 were, what were your thoughts on that? Thank you very much. Right, so I don't know who would like to respond to that on the panel. Did you all hear the question okay, or should we repeat it? Uh, we didn't, maybe, Lena, if you just read it again a bit louder for us. Oh, uh, sure. Thank I'm sorry. You. Uh, so my question was whether today green finance was seen by financial institutions as rather a constraint or rather an opportunity. Peter, do you want to respond to that? This question is better addressed to professionals, okay. right? All right, fine. Either Paul or Pierre Alix. Yes, sure. Um, Go ahead. For me, it's both. <laughs> Sorry, but um, I can't arbitrate. But uh, for, for me, it's, it's a constraint. Why? Because um, we have more regulations. We have more. Uh, efforts to report to to make it uh, more consistent, and um, and also now we have we live a very fierce competition in the ESG markets, and in the reverse it's an opportunity. Why? Because um, because we we have a lot of uh, a very uh, new uh, new markets emerging, um, and um, and now we. We have the deep depths to 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 in our invest area of investments to to have a, a, a better structured um, to have bigger uh, project uh, to finance. So uh, because banks investors want um, projects to finance, now we have our, the, the 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 supply uh, uh, calls to 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 to, be, to to bigger project, and it's it's an opportunity for financial players. Okay, so you say a bit of both, a bit of a pain, but equally there's some uh, some room for be opportunity there. Because it's getting mainstream, and when when something becomes mainstream, uh, you have uh, both uh, the drawbacks and the advantage. Okay, interesting. For, for the society as a whole, it's clearly an opportunity to do something to save the planet, so to say, right? Of course. It gives it us, maybe it will enable us to attract sufficient private capital to to finance the energy transition. Okay, interesting. Uh, uh, the next question then from Ekaterina. Sure. All right, so this one will be a bit, a bit more uh, zoomed in and I'll ask it in two parts if that's all right. So the background is considering the many EU reporting requirements coming into force aimed at standardizing and facilitating climate related disclosure to not just be a burden for these regulated entities but ultimately help investors make informed decisions such as the sustainable finance disclosure regulation or the corporate sustainability reporting directive or even zooming in on uh, green financial products as I believe Paul brought up uh, green bonds or is a green EU green bond standard. My first question is, are corporates and financial institutions empowered to accurately report? Uh, what are their pain points and uh, what can be done to address them? And the follow-up to that is, how will regulators verify disclosures are indeed quality and therefore meaningful to public and private stakeholders alike? Thank you. Anybody on the floor want to take that question? Or, or the first part and at all? I didn't catch everything. Yeah, Sorry. perhaps it, if we just read it again, just the first part we'll go with, Ekaterina, just so we make sure everyone's kind of got the, the first part of the question. Do you want me to repeat it? Please. Sure. So, are corporates and financial market players empowered to accurately report on these disclosure requirements? Uh, what are their pain points and what could be done to address them? 
I don't know whether Virginie or... or I can start. You want to go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, about the disclosure regulation, first, so of course, you had a big gap between e the EU perspective and the non-EU perspective. On one side, CSRD, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is yet to be translated into uh, the technical regulation, which is called ESRS, so we will see what's in there. It's not yet published. Uh, and on the other side, the ISSB work, which is an international body working on a voluntary uh, standard, which is much less ambitious than the European one and much, much narrower in the way it addresses climate. So you can remember basically that ISSB on one end is very much about financial materiality. Does it have an impact on me financially? And the EU tries to look at this dimension, but also as the potential impact I have with my activity on the environment and climate. Um, so looking only at the EU one, because the other one I think is, I mean, the definition itself shows it, it's not sufficient to fully take into account climate change. It's, it's, it's progress still, but it's only about financial risk, so it, it's limited progress. But the EU one, um, it's a regulation that is based on the comply or explain logic. So you, you have to report on it. You can also report that you don't report and justify why. Uh, it's also a regulation that contains lots of, of good indicators, potentially, including on the transition plan aligned with the 1.5 targets. But I can totally report that I'm not aligned with the 1.5 target. The, the regulation itself doesn't mandate me to be aligned. It's, it's just a benchmark, kind of, for reporting. So uh, it, it's definitely very good progress. Lots of good information for investors to, to, go, to go find in there, but also not enough. Uh, when it comes to actually aligning the activities with, uh, with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the final impact of this disclosure regulation will depend on other types of regulations. For example, we have a, a discussion today at the open level around corporate due diligence. And in the corporate due diligence regulation, you have an article about transition plan. If such article would be in the final text, you would have a much stronger requirement to actually have aligning transition plan adopted by companies that fall under the scope of due diligence. It's only one example. You can put that in several regulations, also on the prudential side, so more related to financial risks. You can give more weight to your disclosure regulation. Okay, thank you very Just much. Just to, to comment quickly yes. on the second part of the question, how to check the accuracy of these disclosures. I think for this, we need public databases that, for example, researchers, people like us, can scrutinize and detect some irregularities, or maybe compare this data to data obtained from other sources, like satellite data, machine learning, and then this can be also shown to check whether there is something wrong with this or this data set. Right. And maybe one comment. Yes, or, go ahead. Sorry, very shortly. Um, on CSRD and the re extra financial reporting, it's essential, it's key to, to implement uh, all the strategy of uh, sustainable finance in Europe. So it's a shame that it's um, adopted only at the end, uh, after we, we have to disclose, we have to define and to disclose something uh, on an information we don't have because CSRD is, has not been adopted uh, yet. And also it's a shame that we we are still in the, um, in the discussion on the, on the granularity and the ambition of uh, all the indicators. Um, I think now we, we, it's done, we have all the indicators, we, we have a, a level in ambition, we have to go, but we have to move forward, and uh, we, st we are still on, in the debate on uh, what, uh, what, what would be better for this indicator, and of course it, it entails a, a lower ambition at the end. So. That's my two uh, adding elements to the discussion. So the debate goes on, the debate uh, continues. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Ekaterina and to Lina for coming up and sharing those questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, ladies, for doing so. Uh, also, a big thank you to our panel, so to Peter, to Paul, also to Pierre-Alex, and of course to, to Virginie. I asked uh, the people at the end of our round table to give us kind of this major takeaway. Just a few words, just a few words. Um, on you know the overriding message that you want us to take away today. It can't be long. It's cheating if it's long. It's just a few words. Okay. What would your overriding uh, message be, Peter? What do you what do you think? Well, there are several messages, but maybe the short one is uh, okay. We discussed green finance and sustainable finance, but it's important to remember that finance cannot be green without being sustainable. Oh, like I like that one. Okay. Can't be green without being sustainable. Excellent, Peter. Thank you, Paul. 
Uh, I, w I would say basically stop developing fossil fuels. Okay, so it's very straight to the point. It will solve a lot of problems. Uh, Pierre Alix? Thank you. Like that, I can I can have more time to. <laughs> <laughs> You've gained uh, two words there. Two words. <laughs> no, um, no. Banks are in the middle of the road, and uh, because we're banks are better equipped and uh, maybe um, highly regulated, so we can move uh, very fast. And uh, that's my last word. <laughs> so give banks more time. Is that what you're saying? We need more no, time. No, no. We, we we need to be to be to go fast to go faster. Okay. So let's speed things up. Okay. Thank Sorry. you, Pierre Alex and Virginie. So two words, I would say uh, engagement, um, to have a strong engagement from the top of, of, of the company or the financial institution and transparency. Okay, strong engagement and transparency. On that note, uh, that brings us to the end of our second uh, round table. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, so you heard it there. One thing is clear, uh, the real need for sustainable finance, but it's anything uh, but simple. You open one door, another uh, is opened, and more uh, criteria needs to be met to ensure that it's sustainable and really green. Um, this brings us to our third round table, which is on market regulation and consumer behavior. Um, can you imagine a world without laws, without regulations? No doubt, uh, as we've said already today, it would be extremely chaotic. We do need uh, that regulation. To avoid the chaos uh, within the market, we need market regulation to be implemented. And to exert that oversight, we need to uh, prevent uh, certain undesired, or you might say unfair actions. Uh, for our third round table, I'm joined on stage by Serge Abidboul, board member of the uh, French Electronic Communications Regular Authority. Uh, welcome to you. Hello there. Uh, we also have with us uh, Natalie Stubler. She is the uh, special advisor on deca decarbonisation for uh, Air France KLM Group. Uh, we have Thibault Verger. He's vice president of the French Competition Authority. Isabelle, hello to you. Isabelle Spiegel, uh, global head of environment at Vinci. Hello to you. And last but not least, we have uh, Pierre-Jean Bengozi, a research director at the Ecole Polytechnique IP Paris. All right, I shall change seats. I want to sit at this. Why don't you sit, you sit there? You're welcome to, to sit there. <laughs> ha, oh, it doesn't matter, honestly. It's no, it's no problem. Thank you, Serge. Very kind. Ah, it's true. I need, do need my water. How are you feeling? How's the conference going for you so far? Enjoying? Yes. Yeah? All right. If we uh, start with you, uh, Serge, the, the theme today, uh, of course, is looking at uh, conference, kind of, not conference, I suppose, looking at regulation. You work on a regulatory uh, board. Uh, talk to us about why market regulation is so uh, important. Why is it beneficial to consumers? Why do, why do we need it? Uh, why is uh, market regulation uh, important and beneficial to consumers? I mean, why is our work useful? That's what your question. Uh, the, the telecommunication markets, that's what we regulate, is a service market in which uh, end users are mainly consumers and companies. It's important to regulate the sector to ensure an effective and loyal competition between operators to benefit end users with high quality service and innovation at attractive prices. I tried to put all the, the words there. In more trivial terms, the role of regulation is to prevent the market to turn into a jungle. So we want to protect consumers, we want to protect smaller companies. Uh, now, the second part of your question is uh, how do we associate the consumer with regulation? We, we do it in a very standard manner. First of all, we interact with consumer uh, associations because they know the, the issues. Uh, we have regular exchanges with them, we have meetings, uh, we do public consultations, as we are forced to do actually by law, and, and things like that. Uh, we also have developed tools for informing consumers. So for instance, uh, uh, the French people may know My Connection, My Connection Internet, which is a way to uh, essentially know what, uh, where you are, whether you can have internet connection and what quality. Uh, the same thing for mobile telephone with Mon Réseau Mobile, so the idea is very simple. If you inform the consumer 
then the consumer, the consumer will make better choice and drive the market in the right direction. Uh, something we started uh, in uh, 2017 is something called uh, J'alerte l'ARCEP, I alert ARCEP, which is an online reporting platform that allows consumers, businesses, and authorities to inform us. Uh, they inform us of malfunctions, uh, they inform us of uh, the problems in their relationships with operators. Uh, that's for communication operators, postal operators, and also press distribution. Uh, so we want the consumers to be to behave as a, actually concerned citizen by giving us uh, information about what's going on. So for the operators, is a incent it's an incentive to, to, to do a better job so that the, the consumers do not complain. And for us, it's very important because it gives us uh, a lot of information, small signals, low, low quality signals, but also major trends, evolution. So we actually know what's going on. And that's very important because if we want to regulate the market, the first the bottom line is that we have to understand the market. Well, absolutely. You spoke about kind of trends and evolution there, which I think are key words, Serge. Ultimately, consumer behavior changes. It doesn't stay the same. And that's why, you know, uh, people like you are uh, essential. Uh, Eric Lebet spoke to us earlier about, you know, young people being at the heart of IP Paris and really helping to drive the agenda forward. I, I want to think about recent changes in consumer behavior, uh, specifically where sustainability is concerned. Have young people, do you think, influenced uh, or force the industry to kind of change what it has on offer? It's, it's, uh, it's an important question, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, so optimistic. I mean, All like right. when you, you, you see really young people, they, they really uh, you know, have more opinion, they're more concerned with sustainability than the rest of the population, but the, also, the entire population is actually uh, is getting more concerned about the topic. But now when it gets to choosing and, 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 and deciding, uh, it's, it's a bit different. For, for, for uh, the digital world, there is a tension. There is a tension between you want more connectivity, you want all these great gadgets that come up to you and that you really like, and at the same time, you are concerned with uh, sustainability. You, you've heard that, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the digital technology is uh, having some very serious negative impact on the environment. It, it does have some also positive impact, but, but it has a negative impact as well. So people are, are really uh, concerned, but uh, I'm not sure they, right now they, they, have, they are informed enough to know what the right thing to do. And I think that's what we see also as an important issue is to inform them, educate perhaps them. Now, from the point of view of, uh, uh, in your question, there was also how do industry react to that? Yeah, it's a uh, change in offer. So the, the clear thing is they react strongly with more and more greenwashing. And that's, uh, that's, that's certain. Uh, now, if you talk to, to people in industry, they, they want to do things. You, you find really uh, uh, a strong desire by many people in companies to change things because they're concerned, maybe because their kids are telling them that what they're doing is just not proper for the, for the world. So they want to change things. But at the same time, the companies have to make profit, and that's their, their role. And that's, uh, so, so you have tension also inside the companies between who, those who want to go for more sustainability and those who look at the book and say, well, you know, if we do this, uh, we're going to lose market share because our competitors don't do that. So I, I think uh, probably industry is at, at the core of the solution, but I think regulation should guide them by, by putting uh, uh, rules that they, they have to follow. Uh, I think Sad. Ex expecting them to to just by miracle turn into uh, green companies, I have, I have doubts. Okay, so no miracles, no uh, magic wands. Serge, so we're going to speak a little bit more about uh, market regulation and where you see it going. Uh, for the time being, though, I want to bring Natalie in because I know that there's a, a time constraint. Uh, Natalie, um, we spoke a little bit about evolution and change in consumer behaviour with Serge. Uh, the avian se aviation sector is, is, is your sector. It's going through a real transition. It's really evolving. Uh, changes are ongoing. The actual thing, oh, the the task, I should say, of decarbonizing the industry. I think it's colossal. Your thoughts on that? Yes, it's, it's a huge task. I, I cannot hide it. Uh, but it's not because it's huge that we should not do it. There, there is no choice. The entire industry has committed to net zero by 2050, as it's a bit far 
some of us have already committed to uh, closer um, commitments. Uh, for my group at France KLM, we have committed the mine stone in 2030, which is quite close. Huh? Uh, so we have committed to um, um, a KPI, it's minus 30% of CO2 per passenger kilometer. It's usual KPI used also for our industry in 2030 when we compare to 2019. If we look at the past, when we were between 205 and 219, this famous reference, and because after there was a COVID uh, crisis, we have decreased by 20% this uh, carbon intensity. So less uh, number of years to reach it by 2030, and even a bigger decrease uh, uh, to, to achieve. So it's quite a commitment, I would say. Oh, Natalie, I, I'd love to, to stay more. I know you have a very important event today. I hope you don't mind me sharing. Your son is graduating, so you must get off. <laughs> Let's let you go. A very good, big congratulations to your family today. Yes, Thank you very but, much. But I can just elaborate. Oh, oh, if you have time. The, yeah, a bit on, on the few levers. And yes, it's true. My son is having his graduation at the same time. So it was not, uh, it was not so easy for me to split. To be here. But uh, I will run. Uh, just to, to give a bit of example, because yes, the... the, 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 the the word greenwashing has been also pronounced. And what is important for a company is, is to show what is, what is done. So I'm not going to hide what are the levers used to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. There are mainly three for us. The first one is a fleet renewal, uh, for sure. Aircraft manufacturer, engine manufacturer, they are making progress in the, the use of uh, fuel. Uh, and, and that is key. Uh, for example, if you replace uh, 737 uh, NGs by a 320 uh, Airbus NEO, you gain minus 15% of fuel consumption and so for uh, CO2 emission. And there are a long haul aircraft, you can gain up to 25%. So this is uh, important. This is quite a uh, huge, huge amount of money. Uh, we were talking also this morning from uh, Violia, which is in uh, the, the investment of the company. It's required kind of two billions per year to, uh, to do this, uh, this change. Uh, but, but it's the first, uh, the first uh, lever. The second lever, I would, uh, I would say it's operations. Operations, what is it? Uh, to make our flight operations the most efficient, the ground operation the most efficient. There, the figures is around 5%. It looks maybe small, but, but it engages all our staff all our pilots, all our flight dispatcher, or our ground ops, uh, ground operation uh, staff. So this is quite key. Uh, we have engaged also a, a nice collaboration with, with a French startup for, for, for my group, where they help us to, uh, to use all the flight data to monitor our best practice in eco-piloting, or even to change the way we, the aircraft is climbing. So there we made some progress. It's 5%, but we, yeah, we take it. We take every point, as we know, that it will be uh, super difficult. Uh, and the last part, and it is recognized, is sustainable aviation fuel, uh, because there is not so much levers to, uh, to use in our industry. So uh, this is quite key. Uh, and this is, uh, this is new, this is developing. This is where the regulation is entering, to, to make the link with uh, what you were saying before, with this uh, use of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, France was uh, ahead with uh, an obligation of incorporation of 1% already in 2022. And the European regulation, uh, we, we think it will be voted, it's not yet voted, but there will be, there have been a consensus uh, in the last trilogue. Uh, they will uh, push us to use uh, a 6% by 2025, by 2030, sorry, 2% 2025, 6 uh, by 2030. Uh, and then we will climb, we will climb a lot, up to 20 by 2035, so, which is a huge increase in five years. Uh, and of course, the regulation is, is giving a, a framework. And... Uh, as to reach our target I was mentioning before, we will go beyond this regulation. Our intention is to use uh, worldwide 10% uh, of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Is there any downside to the state sustainable aviation uh, fuel? 
Uh, yes, it's, first, it doesn't exist in this quantity. So uh, these, uh, this production uh, has, to, uh, has to be realized. Mm. So of course the regulation is giving signal that uh, uh, this, uh, the production has to be realized. So that's important for, for us. And then of course, uh, we will have the, the entrance uh, of the production. So as a biomass, if we are talking about biofuel, or uh, either um, electricity, if we are talking about e-fuel. E-fuel is made from hydrogen and CO2. So, of course, uh, these are part of the equation. Uh, uh, we need that, we need this production to cope with the regulation, and for those who want to go further, uh, that will be important. And as any product w which doesn't have any production today, this is super expensive uh, so far. So, of course, this also raises questions toward the, cons the consumer, the, our passenger. Uh, today we are already engaging them. We have put in our fares a small surcharge to take into account what we are doing today, because already today we are uh, using this sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and for sure the key question is, is then uh, the reasonable price, even we know it will be higher than the kerosene, uh, to make sure that the, the consumer is, uh, is willing to pay. Today we are engaging our corporate customer, cargo, our passenger, uh, to help us to reach that and uh, join our SAF uh, Sustainable Aviation Fuel Program. And we are also proposing it to uh, our B2C uh, customer uh, to take part of it. Uh, but yes, it's a start. So here we, you see the, the link between the regulation and also what the companies can do. Uh, but for us, it's the start of a long journey, I would say, in, the, in this uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, the start is quite promising, uh, what we did in 2022 already, by uh, putting 42,000 tons of SAF. It looks a bit small, but it was already 17% uh, of the worldwide production. So, yeah, it was for us an encouraging um, start for this uh, the, this reach and the, uh, this goal to, to we, we need to reach by 2030. Okay, Natalie, thank you very much for, for sharing your insight with us uh, today. Thank you so much. S thank you, and I'm escaping to my son graduation. Sorry about that. Just checking uh, with us at time here. Uh, Pierre Jean, uh, the, the, the note that Natalie left us with was this idea of uh, regulation. I want to get a sense from you kind of how effective you feel uh, European regulation is when it comes to kind of convincing industries that they need to be offering sustainable goods and services. How, how far do they go in getting uh, you know, uh, industries to, to do that? I should say that maybe completing the, the, the point made by Sir that in the final in the final analysis, the object of the regulation is, is always the const, the customer or the, or the citizen. And when we speak of, of efficiency, uh, <coughs> uh, the question is how we measure this efficiency. Is it the efficiency towards the, the, the citizen in general or for, for each uh, consumer corresponding to, to the various activity? And, uh, and from this extent, the, 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 the point and the difficulty for, for European but also national regulation is that, in fact, especially in sustainable development, but in, in all the activities, the externalities are very important. The externalities, which means the, the um, complementary effect or the, the, the complementary impact. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges is precisely to, to be able to measure and to incorporate such externalities in the evaluation. And from this point of view, uh, the, the regulation toolbox uh, has an essential need to be able to draw on and to mobilize the, the production of information and data and uh, metrics and ratings and, and KPIs, uh, as, we, as we already uh, uh, discussed earlier, and in order to make such externalities visible. And from this extent, first, the role of the science and the research is very important. And uh, <coughs> In, in, in this perspective, the, the example of IPCC is, is really emblematic and paradigmatic in the sense that it, it contributes to, to produce re, uh, information. And therefore, the, the European regulation has also to go 
deeper into this capacity to produce data. And uh, in, in RCEP, uh, they are speaking of regulation by data. In order of providing data to the consumer and to the citizen, help them to make its choice more easy and more adapted to the to the to integrating this uh, the externality I mentioned. And the other point I should uh, uh, underline in, in, in the way to, to make European regulation more efficient is the capacity to develop cooperation amongst, uh, among the various regulators at the national level, and not only speaking of international uh, organization uh, or European organization. So the, the title of the, of the conference today is uh, uh, Together for Action. I don't remember exactly the, the under title, but it's exactly that. It's, uh, <coughs> and, 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 and the example of uh, uh, the approach of sustainable development in telecommunication is also interesting from this viewpoint. And uh, RCEP in telecommunication has been able to develop an analysis of the uh, impact and, and uh, environmental impact of the telecommunication. And this has been, in, in the second time, uh, adopted at the European level by the other regulator in order to develop a, a collective and continental approach. So I think this is a point. And Pierre, the, so, sorry, yeah. I, I'll cut you. I'll just no, let no, you and, finish. And the third point I, I would like to, to, to also to underline, in order to go deeper and, uh, and uh, with European regulation, is not only to create some specific measures, incentive or constraint, etc. It's, uh, but it's also be, has been said this morning, is to create a systematic change because, uh, in fact, the the the, uh, the action in order to support uh, regulation of the sustainable development is not only to to create constraint to a specific company or to a specific uh, industry, but also to change all the structure of the ecosystem, of the supply chain, of all the, the actors contributing to producing goods and services. And this huge change gives, of course, to ex ante regulation a very important role. And I'm not sure that from this extent, uh, the, the, the Europe, but also more globally, all the institutions at the international level have been able to take such systematic change into consideration. I want to get a sense from you about the, the consumer. You know, we have the adage that, you know, uh, the customer is always right or the consumer is always right. It, in this day and age, do you feel that the consumer still has a certain amount of power? Or are they kind of more subject to, to changes and, and regulation that's taking place in the market and, and not necessarily an active participant in that? What's your, your thought on that? No, they could have the power, but they have the power to decide and they have the power to pay for a specific service. But the consumer have, and it also has been said on a different way today, they, they have, there is some kind of inconsistency mm -hmm. of the way, if, if they are thinking as a citizen or if they are thinking as a consumer. As a citizen, they are willing to reduce the, the effect of, uh, of industry on the climate, on the heating, on the biodiversity, and so on. But as a, city, uh, as a consumer, they will try to find a lower price, uh, complete coverage, they will want to travel, and so on. And this is a main difficulty for the regulation, but also for the political industry, uh, uh, orientation, to be able to reconcile these two perspectives. How, on the one hand, to provide an overall transformation, a overall view of the desirable change, but how also to implement such uh, huge change into small decisions that help the consumer to take and to, to the decision. And, and, and this is why I say, uh, when I was speaking of a regulation by data, providing ratings, providing metrics, providing KPIs, providing all the data helping the consumer to change his mind, not only uh, incenting him to decide on the price or, or the desirability of a service, but also to, to decide on alternative uh, criteria. Okay, thank you very much. Atiba, I want to stay on that same kind of idea. Um, you know, uh, Pierre-Jean spoke to us about uh, helping the consumer, these incremental steps, helping them to kind of uh, change their mind or make decisions. What are the principal ways that we can use or that are being used to make consumers aware of the sustainable products that are at their fingertips, essentially? How do we let them know what's out there? Yeah, I think that's a... That, that's a key question because consumers often find it difficult to identify the right product. So 
could mention, so there's a recent survey that has been done on um, UK consumers um, on sustainable products, and half of them uh, explained that one of the reasons why they did not adopt a more um, sustainable lifestyle was that they felt they didn't have the right information on the, uh, uh, the kind of products that were available. So right. information is really key. Uh, so it's difficult for me to tell exactly how information should be transmitted, but um, one, one thing I can mention is the work we, well, competition authorities have been doing in the past um, when fir firms have been trying to hide the information from the, uh, from the consumers. And I can mention two examples we, uh, we had. So one is a, it's still an ongoing investigation, but um, uh, it's been in the, in the public domain for, for, for a while now. So if you, uh, if you have teenage kids, you've probably uh, all heard of uh, BPA-free uh, BPA uh, plastic uh, bottles for babies. Uh, so that has been banned. So BPA has been banned um, in food containers for babies uh, for, for a while, but uh, a bit later, it, uh, the, a decision was taken to ban it in all, uh, in all food containers uh, after 2015. Uh, and so what firms, so BPA is also used, uh, so it's used in plastic, but it's also used to produce um, um, epoxy resins that, are, uh, that, that can be found in the, um, in the linings in your tins for canned food. Wow, okay. Um, and so firms have been uh, uh, colluding on trying to hide information from, uh, from the consumer on the, uh, uh, on the quality of the product they were uh, selling so as to be able to wait a bit more before bringing to the market this uh, uh, these new products. So, so, so what do you say it's co consumer or market regulation that brought to light the fact that these things were being hidden? What, how did it come to the forefront? Well, decision will be made in a few months, so I can't tell exactly what's, uh, uh, what's in the case. First, because I don't know the case, but, um, uh, but the, the idea is exactly that. So is we try to, uh, uh, to intervene and, uh, and stop firms from hiding information from, uh, uh, from consumers. So we had a a similar case a few years ago on uh, linoleum floors, uh, where again firms had committed together not to communicate on the uh, uh, on, on the uh, env uh, environmental quality of their products, so as not to compete on that dimension of the uh, uh, of the product. So lack lack of information is clearly uh, is clearly an issue for consumers, and uh, and we have to find a way to uh, uh, to go around that. Uh, I think one of the the other issue is the lack of trust uh, for consumers. So we've been talking about uh, greenwashing for a while, but uh, so again in that survey, uh, something like half of the consumers uh, decided that they, uh, they feel they can't really trust the information they get on uh, sustainability claims or that sustainability claims is not by firms is not going to change exactly the, um, uh, the, the, their view on products. So lack of trust is a, is a clear issue. Uh, the question is how we can help consumers, how we can firm, help firms to build uh, trust. Um, and, and there, there's a trade-off between uh, uh, letting firms uh, make the claims they want on their product and be able to compete on that dimension of, the, uh, uh, of their product, also to allow them to bring a new product faster, or, or, or maybe they don't all want to do the same, uh, uh, the same type of innovation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, creating common uh, ways to label products or to advertise products uh, is also a way to build trust for consumers if they know there are labels they can, uh, uh, they can trust. But that can only work if uh, market regulators, so especially consumer protection agencies in that case, uh, have the power to go and, uh, and check what is really done in these, uh, in these labels. I mean, staying, uh, Thibault, with this idea of trust and kind of gaining, you know, credibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the consumer, does data help uh, when it comes to consumers and how it influences their choices? Does it play a big role in your view? Well, I think data can help, and what Pierre-Jean mentioned on, uh, so on providing ratings to consumers uh, is something that can help if they can trust the ratings. So uh, it's been used in many industries uh, for a long time, but again, we've seen uh, firms play with the uh, uh, play with the ratings. There, there's been a lot of economic work uh, done 
both within some of these uh, uh, um, digital platforms that have been using these ratings uh, and in many markets to see how to, uh, how to better design the, uh, the ratings. So we know that if uh, anybody can, uh, can rate products uh, and you can check whether they've even tested the product, uh, it becomes difficult to trust uh, for consumers to have any trust in the, uh, in the data that they observe. Uh, but at the same time, you, uh, there are lots of difficulties in some of these, uh, on some of those platforms where you want consumers to have used the product, but you don't. Consumers are rated, so in many of these uh, many industries, both the consumer and the firm are, are rated. So you don't want a collusion to take place between the two sides, or you want to make sure that uh, one of the side cannot threaten the other uh, to punish back by uh, giving a bad rating for any reason. So I mean, I guess that dissimulating information and hiding uh, what a product is from consumers is, is, is dangerous. I guess one of the ways of combating that would be uh, speeding up the commercialization, speeding up the production of kind of high quality sustainable goods. How do we do that? We've spoken today about accelerating, but it's easier said than done, Thibault. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, so. I think where we, I think Pierre Jean mentioned that. So many consumers claim they 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 might be willing to to pay more for sustainable products. So uh, I think again, so there's a study in the uh, Harvard Business Review that mentioned uh, uh, a survey where two thirds of the consumers claim they are willing to pay uh, to pay m more for sustainable products. But when you see what they actually do and when they have to pay for for a product, only one out of four is uh, actually buying more sustainable or more expensive products. Uh, so that's a, a first difficulty. Um, and at the same time, firms are not willing to launch sustainable products if they are more expensive and they don't meet the demand. So, um, so we have to find ways to, uh, so we can see that a bit as a chicken and egg problem at the same time. So you, uh, you. You, you want the demand to be there, but the demand will not be there if, there's not enough pro if there are not enough products and consumers are not going to buy if they don't see the, if they still have uh, uh, other available options that are cheaper. Um, so there are many things that can be done, but the trouble is, uh, and were, the discussion was in, in previous panels, is it also has to be acceptable. So one way could be, uh, so we mentioned carbon pricing and, uh, and redistribution this morning, but if uh, consumers or citizens don't trust government to redistribute, uh, they will never accept uh, uh, the carbon taxes. Uh, you can incentivize consumers. Uh, so we've, we've seen that uh, in many markets, so you can get subsidies to renovate your house. Um, but then you also need the supply to be there. So we, well, well, what we know is that if the supply is, in, is insufficient, and you have a big boost in demand because consumers uh, get incentives to uh, uh, get subsidies to, uh, to, to, to renovate. The only thing you will see is prices will rise. Uh, firms, existing firms will pocket the, uh, the, the subsidies and consumers will not pay less. So, and, and consumers will not pay less, which means that in the end, the, the actual demand will not have increased. So the market will still be will still remain small. So This is what I was going to say, with inflation as high as, high it is, as it is, uh, purchasing power has obviously got to play into this as well. You know, people simply don't have uh, the money that they may have had to, to, to give to certain products as, as they may have had in times gone by before inflation. Yeah, no, exactly. So you need to find a way to have these products come up quickly, at very often at sufficient scale, so that uh, uh, you can produce them efficiently and, uh, and maybe prices won't be that much more expensive relative to the others. So some of uh, strong regulations that will ban some of the existing product is one way to switch. But uh, you also have to be careful that at the same time, it's not going to lead to very expensive, more expensive products coming up to the market and consumers being uh, uh, really unhappy about that. Well, Thibault, thank you. Thank you very much for responding to those questions. Uh, what's clear, Isabel, is that innovative uh, solutions are necessary if we're going to uh, move forward. Uh, with the climate uh, emergency of increasing urgency, how do we ensure that the, those innovative solutions on sustainability stay at the top of the agenda where they should be? How can we ensure that that happens, Isabel? Uh, yeah, that's a huge question indeed. I think uh, 
it's been a lot of like, years that we are talking about climate change and accelerating. And when I uh, listen to scientists, uh, it's been really a long time. They are all saying that. And at the same time, when I uh, attend to conference like this one and a lot of others, there's still a we need to, we have to, we have to, and think about, and, and we, there's still a hope to find the best uh, solution. And my, my first message is that, yeah, we still need to innovate, clearly, but there are also a lot of solutions and things that are actually uh, already uh, there that could be uh, applied. And the way we do it uh, within our company, with Vinci, is really to split a bit this, because environment is already really complex. We talk about climate today, but we know that we have resource, biodiversity, water, etc. And if you want to bring all this information together to, to make decisions, it's already really complex. So at Vinci, we said, okay, well, let's focus on the existing uh, solution. And that's already complex to implement because it still needs behavior changes at least. And this is for our reduction targets by 2030, for instance. So we said, okay, let's uh, have targets. But with our star those targets, we are uh, listing some action plan that are uh, actually something that we could implement. I'm not saying it's not it's easy and it's not more costly and etc. But that's a clear plan where we know more or less where to act, and that's one part. And here it's a summary of key actions like low carbon concrete or materials, like decarbonizing uh, the fleet of vehicles. Uh, moving on, uh, on our motorways, for instance. And in addition, we have a structure called Leonard, where we uh, keep putting money uh, and time and etc. Uh, dedicated to innovation and foresight. And I'm just telling you to have a clear message to all our, our leaders. First, at Vinci, we said we want to focus on reduction of emissions. That's the first thing, and we'll see later about new technology to keep reducing, so after 2030, so like hydrogen, and that means that we start investing into hydrogen, but that's not something which is absolutely necessary, a necessity to uh, already achieve our, our first milestone of reduction. And then uh, carbon capture and storage, for instance, that's also something that we tweet more in our uh, innovation uh, system. So we had to split a bit the structure and to work clearly closely uh, with a, a world partnership. Um, so what environment is uh, bringing also, it's the urgency, the emergency uh, to act that you are reminded in your question. And for that, it means that it, it doesn't make full sense if Vinci is working alone. So we need definitely the visibility from regulation, uh, but also uh, to partner. Uh, to partner with other industrial, uh, with all our ecosystem, to make sure that we do not waste time uh, into uh, developing this new innovation or just implementing what is actually already available. I mean, we've spoken a, a lot today about kind of how we, um, how do we communicate those goals, whether they're sustainable goals, and how do we, you know, let consumers know what's available because sometimes, as we've realized, they're just not aware of what's available to them. How uh, does your company uh, look at communicating its sustainable uh, goals? Well, we, we are talking a lot about uh, the need uh, of transparency and communication, etc. And again, I come back to the fact that environment is not so easy. So we want to address that with a lot of transparency, clearly, uh, but also explaining what we do. Uh, so definitely, yes, we set up goals. That's the way to uh, put all ourselves into action. And that's something that we did four years ago. So we are four years after 2023, when I can already show uh, some actions that we took some, uh, so again, low carbon concrete. We're starting with one uh, specific concrete that we pulled without any cement. So 90% reduction uh, CO2 emission in our own building, in an our own, own sorry, headquarters. Um, and, and then, three years after, I am with uh, 26 uh, at least uh, specific projects where we had similar approaches. So it's not exactly the same level of uh, decarbonization, but it is really the way we are scaling up, at least going one by one, uh, making by the, the, the action, uh, by experimentation, uh, the proof that it's working also for tunnels, 
for uh, social housing, uh, for hospitals, etc., etc. So really making this demonstration. But what we need is really if we want to scale up and that it, it's becoming the new standard, well, we need clients, uh, our customers, to really uh, not be afraid of asking us to implement that. So, so that's why we need to communicate first about the calls, the goals, but also the performance and the results of what we are doing. Um, and, and also uh, never hesitate, and regulation can help, but at the same time, too, too much and too precise regulation is taking so much time that it is also a burden uh, where we'd like to focus on the performance. And, and clearly what's happening currently on, uh, with all the, the, the regulation coming from the Green Deal and all the standards that everybody is trying to put together is that sometimes I am a bit afraid that we are losing the strategic part. So with Vinci, we know why we're do, doing that. I mean, we, we decided really to be proactive in the acceleration and the taking into account of the environment. It's a strategic priority from the group. And that means that we know where we can really influence. Uh, so that's why on materials, that's why on the traffic on motorways, on the traffic on the airplanes, for instance, we can have a certain level of influence, not wall for, for sure, on bringing new uh, technology for sufficiency, for instance, in terms of uh, energy efficiency. That's also areas so where we know where we can act. And here, yes, it's up to us to make the demonstration of where we stand and share, because also the return on and experience is really uh, key to uh, first help others uh, to copy paste because yes, in environment, we do not have time uh, to be uh, too much in a competitive mode. The solutions, there's not one unique solution, so we need to share and really put them uh, all together. And, and yes, that's, that's where and why we need to, uh, to communicate definitely on uh, where we stand. We've heard the word the big T several times today, transparency. Uh, Thibault spoke a lot yeah. about kind of credibility and gaining that trust. Again, it's so complex. <laughs> Why should consumers uh, not be skeptical today with, as we've been saying, you know, so much greenwashing and so much dissimulation of real information? There's certainly a natural skepticism. Yeah, yeah, there is. And as a company, uh, we're not the one uh, who are the most trusted uh, by uh, our customers, uh, by citizens, etc., etc. So it's up to us also to bring together the right ecosystem of uh, advisors, scientists, academics, etc., uh, etc., et to, to help us here. I, I can just tell you on the environment impact assessment, for, in for instance, Vinci is uh, financing a, a share uh, lab research and environment, Vinci Paritech, for 15 years. So it's been 15 years we are working on getting credibility in the way we are making decisions, developing solutions, etc., on environment. So that's, that's just one thing. But the way we more uh, specifically put, into, put this into practice uh, again internally was that three years ago we launched uh, environmental awards. So that was to say to our people, we have targets by 2030, but what we need is that everybody uh, can take action from now. So the first year we take action. The, the 55 finalists, uh, in fact, were fully assessed through a multi-criteria approach. So mixing environment, but not only climate, climate, biodiversity, water, resources, and an economic approach. And that was a way to show and to make sure that, okay, even if one thing is good for at least one category, let's say, uh, reduction of uh, emission, it, we do not have another uh, category uh, like resource management. For instance, we're hearing a lot uh, of questions around uh, the electrification. Do we have enough lithium, for instance, and other uh, minerals or materials and metals uh, to cover the big electrification field? So that's a way that we, we did it. But then, coming to marketing, uh, I told you about low carbon concrete. So we have to make things also simple. I mean, the full life cycle assessment approach has been done. It's known, it has been reviewed by academics on one side, by experts uh, from consulting uh, on, on another side. But the way to communicate to our customers has to be also a bit simplified. So it is indeed low carbon because the message uh, is clear enough like that. So that's a way. 
Okay, Isabella, thank you very much. I was just uh, looking at the time now. Do you want to give a full 10 minutes of uh, questions from our audience uh, that we'd like you to respond to? Uh, so can we uh, be joined on stage, please, uh, by uh, Ulysses Collet and Mathias Gilbert. Uh, they are from uh, the Ecole de Pont Paris Tech, and also uh, Mathias is a first-year student in engineer program at Insta at Paris. Welcome to you both on stage, gentlemen. Just a quick reminder to our panellists, this is a kind of an open floor session, so feel free to chip in if you'd like to uh, respond to some of our audience questions. Uh, what's the first question, gentlemen? All right, I'll be asking the first question. So first, I'd like to briefly thank all our guests for all these enriching and diverse points of views. And I'll quickly jump into the first question. Uh, it will be about advertisements. So today, the customer is being bombarded with the overwhelming amount of advertisement, which is in direct contradiction to all uh, what whistleblowers uh, claim to be uh, as degrowth of consumption, the advertisements being um, signals to consume. So how is it possible to guide uh, the customer um, through these two different uh, incentives, um, how, how to help him make a choice, whereas there is a battle being fought between the two messages um, which he is confronted to? So guiding the consumer. Uh, would you like to come in on that one, Serge? Uh, yeah, I, I, I view that as a, a, a bit as a, a role of the regulator because we are somewhat neutral. We are the service of the consumer so that we can develop a relationship with consumer where there is trust. And uh, so, so for, for, for me, it's, it's, a, it's really a major part of our role is to gather information, to gather data, to gather expertise so that uh, the consumer can come to us and find information about us. Um, we, and, and for that, we cannot do it uh, alone, of course. So, for instance, we, we work a lot with uh, uh, ADEM, the uh, Agency for Environment. Uh, we work with academics. We, we try to get the more neutral uh, opinion on the topic. And, uh, and for instance, we, uh, we uh, as I said, we've gathered a lot of information about the environmental impact of the, of the digital world, uh, digital technology, first on the telecom, and then thanks to a, a new law, uh, we, we also can now get data for all across uh, telecom, uh, technology, uh, digital technology. That's also the, the thing to see is we need the law to give us the means to acquire this information and this knowledge. And uh, I also encourage you to, to read a report that we wrote with RCEP, which is an, an evaluation of the impact, uh, the, the uh, impact of the digital technology in uh, precise year, which was uh, 2019, and forecast pre provisions for 2030 and 2050, which is dreadful if we don't do anything, right? I confess I started that report, so very interesting indeed. Um, any, anybody else like to, uh, to answer on that question of kind of guiding uh, essentially the consumer? Yes. yes maybe. Uh, just a small point. Uh, I think the difficulty for, for the customer should be, uh, and we discuss, firstly, to be able to understand and to have trust in the information, the rating, uh, and the ranking which is uh, provided. And of course, in this extent, the regulator are very important. So, so guiding them is also providing uh, trustworthy information on the one hand. On the second hand, it's also to help them to to understand the, the complexity of the situation. Speaking of sustainable development, is it speaking of biodiversity, speaking of heating, uh, speaking of pollution, speaking of carbon emission? All these points, of course, are interrelated, but they are not necessarily in the same direction. If we are substituting the plastic with, for example, the glass, is it clear that cleaning the glass call for water, so is it so, so good for water reduction of consumption good question. Or, or not? So this is a kind of explanation of the situation which is important to guide and to orient uh, the, the customers. And we had an example this morning uh, regarding the situation in Poland, where they are very, uh, very dependent from the, the fuel and, and gas uh, uh, consumption. And speaking, that, speaking them of pollution, instead of uh, heating uh, and climate change, it's much more important to change the, 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 the consumer habits 
rather than just speaking of climate change in general. So it's just ex uh, two illustrations for me. Okay, interesting. Yes, Isabel, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick point as well, because regulator has a clear role here, but at the same time, we are a provider of infrastructure. So what we think as well is that it has to be easy, uh, first or feasible, even easy and even fun. So that's part of a new story uh, that we need to bring together to consumer. So we, we should not think about only reducing the bad things that we are doing, but really bringing something much more positive, you know? So like uh, taking a, an electric car on a motorway, it has to become first feasible, easy, and then fun. Uh, so that, that's the sort of thing that we'd like to put uh, clearly on the table. Yes, Thibault, you want to add a, a final word on that? Yeah, no, I think you... I totally agree. So th there are two things. So one, we, we don't want to stop firms from being able to advertise the quality of their products. And that's very important that they can freely advertise the different aspects. So it might be difficult for consumers to really uh, understand that, okay, they are better on one side, but uh, there might be negative points, as uh, uh, Pierre-Jean mentioned, for, for some of the products. And so the only role there for regulators that I can see is really to uh, prevent any clear uh, greenwashing claims. And there, firms have to be punished and, uh, and, and named and, uh, and whatever. But uh, otherwise, you, you don't want to, to have them constrained to be too close, on, uh, to, to all have to advertise on the same dimension. So you really want to, to let them choose the way they advertise their products. And so you mentioned this, uh, so electric cars, and, uh, and they are fun, and that also relates to bringing the new products to the market, uh, question that you had before, and I think that's where firms also have to find the right way to, uh, to convince consumers. So uh, one of the, so you mentioned electric cars, but part of the success of Tesla is not because they advertised on being electric cars and, uh, and no emission, it's uh, more being on the on the uh, innovation they were bringing, that they were still fun cars to drive, and, and when they buy a car, that's what people are looking at, so more than on the emissions, very often. Uh, so if you start from banning firms to, uh, or banning car manufacturers from advertising on the, uh, uh, on the performance of the car, that might also uh, uh, maybe make it more difficult sometimes to convince consumers to switch. So we have to be careful there on uh, exactly what we, how we want to intervene in markets. I think it's a, it's a key question. We spoke earlier about uh, kind of guiding the, the narrative to make sure that it engages uh, the, the consumer. Um, gentlemen, as you can see, our panel are absolutely fired up, rearing, uh, rearing to go for the next uh, question. Okay, so uh, we, want, we were wondering about technological fix which is one of the most promoted way to answer the climate crisis and adapt to current carbon footprint regulation. But it's one scientists want the most about because it's passive. It doesn't change the consumer's behavior nor its engagement. Also, these are considered as the cornerstones of the, economical, the ecological transition. To what extent, to what extent uh, should regulation involve or focus more on the consumer's behavior and engagement, maybe to um, awake him to be a real ecological citizen rather than a consumer. That question over to our panel. Um, okay, so one thing that can work in some cases, and uh, so behavioral scientists have been, uh, uh, have been looking at that, is uh, uh, so peer effects or social norms uh, can play a role. So consumers are not all the same. Some are, uh, we will adopt new products or more sustainable products uh, much faster than others. Uh, and, and if what your neighbors do uh, becomes important to you, then it might, that might be one way to switch uh, larger populations. So one example um, that I can mention, so in, uh, so in Canada, in one city, uh, so the, the municipality was trying to push uh, uh, people to stop collecting uh, uh, grass, clipping, grass clippings after uh, mowing their, uh, their garden. Uh, 
because then they had to collect them, they had to bring them to a landfill site and so on. Uh, so they tried to convince people to do that and uh, only very few, uh, very few local uh, uh, so people were, uh, were switching. Um, so behavioral uh, decision scientists from, uh, from the local business school uh, uh, intervened with the, with the municipality and they started going door to door to see people uh, and to just give them flyers saying, okay, your neighbors are doing it, you can also do it. And so that put pressure a bit on consumers and some people, so within two weeks, uh, intake had, had, had already doubled. So very often it's just, uh, you, you have to convince a small share of consumers to do it, to make the switch, and, and that, that's, and usually the, the ones that are more likely to switch, so that's not necessarily extremely expensive. And then building on that, you can, through peer effects or social norms, so maybe for your concrete that's also, you get examples and the other firms will be tempted to, to do the same switch. They, they realize that that's the way we should do it and then people will switch. But, but that takes time and it's very often you have to be careful how you design it, but, uh, but, but that's something that can be done. And if I may uh, just add indeed that uh, the worst thing uh, that could happen is to say that it's not my problem. Uh, I'm, I shall await regulator or companies to do that or my neighbor to do that or etc. So it's put back all this energy because I think everybody agrees that we need to live within the limit of the planet and decently and etc. So bring all this energy into action even if it's small action to begin with. Okay, Serge, I know you wanted to say something and perhaps... Well. Yeah, yeah, because we, uh, you know, with all the studies we, we did about uh, the, the uh, environmental impact of the digital world, we, we realized that some basic things that the consumers could do were actually of humongous importance. And uh, I think it's, it's a question of uh, informing them, explaining it, and it, it takes time, it requires energy, and maybe we, we pray not doing it enough and uh, the government, everybody should do it, it also the, the telecom companies. The first one is uh, the time span of, of a telephone. You know, in, in France, it's about two years. This, this is ridiculous. Uh, a telephone can be used much longer. Now, if you know that 80% of the energy that is used, so just looking at the, at the, at the energy, but there are all, all the other dimensions, but just the energy, 80% of the energy that you use for a telephone is for fabrication. Only 20% is used by the normal usage. So when you hear that you should send less emails, okay, send less emails, but it's marginal. The real thing is keep your telephone longer. Mm. Uh, use, the, use your Wi-Fi and not mobile, mobile communication. So th there are very simple uh, uh, citizen action that can be taught that would help us uh, reduce dramatically our uh, carbon footprint. But keep also all the other stuff as well, material and, and everything. So keeping the telephones longer is, is a good start. I know you want to come yeah, in yeah, here. No, yeah. Yes, maybe on a, provocative, on a provocative way, I should say that the problem you, you address is, more, is not so much a regulatory problem, but a political problem. It's a political issue because regulation is adapted to regulation of industry, of companies, but the question of regulating and incenting consumer on, on a systematic basis, for me, is much more... Uh, a political problems also because, but it has also been said, not all the, 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 the user and the, and the consumer are the same. If you are thinking of the situation in rural area or in urban cities, it's a completely different way. If you think, for example, of the transportation of the uh, Uber Eats, uh, Uber, and uh, Amazon delivery and so on, the question is, is completely different if you have access to all the service within uh, 15 uh, minutes uh, in the city, of if you are 20, 50 kilometers from, from a shop in, in a rural area. And, and the difficulty to provide a global perspective for all, the consumer, for all the consumer is also this one, and this is a political issue. It's not a regulatory issue from my, view, from my perspective. Okay, well, uh, Ulysses and Matthias, uh, thank you very much for bringing those questions uh, to life for us on the stage today. Good to have you up here uh, with us. Uh, we hope that you found our third and final uh, roundtable interesting. Yes, we can certainly give the gentleman a clap. Absolutely. 
Uh, we hope that you found that the third and final roundtable uh, informative. Uh, we've looked at kind of key market trends, consumer trends, and the pr principal concerns, you may say, for, for us as, as consumers, and also uh, some of the challenges that uh, regulatory boards are facing. I want to say a final thank you to Thibault, to Isabelle, to Pierre-Jean, and also to Serge for really bringing our third and final roundtable to life today. Thanks so much. It's been really informative. I'd just like to say a warm welcome back uh, after that uh, very short break. Uh, I'd like to move into our kind of fourth uh, area of uh, the conference, if you will. We've changed the setup on stage, as you'll see, so no more panels as such. But we will be having an experience uh, sharing moment. Uh, the session will allow us to give a multi-actor perspective, if you will. Uh, we've got three guests who will come up on stage individually to have a chat with myself. They're from different parts uh, of the world, completely different parts of the world, so it's really a very international uh, theme that continues. Um, they're looking at how to influence and how to implement change and, and policy uh, when it comes to climate change. So with me today on stage will be Kahia Pacheo. She's the co- or the co-executive director of the Women's Earth Alliance uh, from Hawaii in the United States, all the way from Hawaii. Uh, wonderful to have you. And her talk will ultimately be uh, in title, if you will, because we do like to give uh, titles to our uh, segments, Environmental Protection, uh, Placing Women at the Heart of the Matter. Um, after Kahir, we'll be joined by Radrindra Shinde, founder of Green Tear Foundation, the former director of the UNEP, a coordinating lead author of the IPCC, which was awarded, many of you uh, will remember, uh, the, uh, where are we? the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. He's joined us today from India. Great to have you, Rajendra. And then we'll have Tiasha Fitko, who is the deputy mayor of uh, Ljubljana, uh, in Slovenia, of course. Uh, green ambition, harnessing international or environmental awareness uh, through citizens. So those are the three talks that we'll be having today. Um, without further ado, let's welcome Akehia onto stage. Here we'll be uh, playing some of the images of uh, the wonderful work that you're doing uh, on the on the screen for us. Uh, the Women's Earth Alliance centers on uh, women's knowledge and leadership. Your mission, if I understand correctly, is to protect the environment and end uh, the climate crisis. Uh, concretely, you're technically training women uh, leaders, and that's to harness both uh, climate and environmental initiatives while connecting them, and this is important as well, while connecting them with their peers. You say that there's a contradiction, and that's what I really liked when I read uh, this information about you. Women are disproportionately impacted when it comes to climate disaster, yet when it comes to leadership roles, uh, they are essentially uh, not so much uh, being implicated. Your uh, association is working to change that. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for having me and for the question. What we've seen in the 17 years that um, we've worked and, and stewarded this alliance is that women are often those most impacted by the climate crisis because they are at the heart of our communities. They're the backbone of the communities, providing food, providing water, um, providing energy, caring for our children, caring for our elders. And because of all of that, when disasters strike, when the climate crisis gets worse and worse, um, and because of women's social positions in communities with climate change being uh, um, exacerbated by the, uh, with all of women's positions being exacerbated by climate change, sure. we see them kind of falling to the wayside. We see them honestly dying. Women are, you know, 80, um, 18, 14% more likely to die in climate-related disasters. 80% of climate refugees are women. Um, and because of that, and because of their position, because of their, they are in charge of these resources and their, their families, oftentimes they'll know what's best in their communities. Um, they'll know if their community needs to change a water source. They'll know if destruction of a forest, how that's impacting, what, what's gonna be needed. But they're not getting seats at the table. Um, you know, we as 
founding meeting in 2006, we held it in Mexico City because there was one of these big international water conferences and um, the women there were not getting heard. They had a lot of grassroots women leaders there from all over the world and they were not getting a seat at the table. Their issues were not being listened to. Their voices and their solutions were not being heard. And so they created a side event almost. 30 women leaders from 26 countries around the world wow, huge. came together to create something that didn't exist. And that was a place and a resource for women. And they identified that they were unrecognized at decision-making tables underrepresented in media, and under-resourced really in every single way. And that became the blueprint of Women's Earth Alliance to address those needs, to provide capacity building support, to provide appropriate technology, economic development training, um, business support, um, mentorship, financing and access to financing, and then this alliance, linking them with one another. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's stay with that because one of the things that struck me about uh, the alliance that you work with was this kind of groundbreaking strategy. You're not content with uh, building a well in a village or ultimately you know, getting people access to loans. It, it's more about kind of fundamental grassroot change. Uh, talk us through what that looks like at WEAR. It's really about wraparound support. We're looking at things holistically. We are whole people. Our challenges are whole challenges and they need whole solutions. Providing grants is great. The grant runs out. Um, there's a, a kind of a infamous story in, in the not-for-profit world where an organization went into a community that needed access to water. Women were walking very far to gather water. And so the, uh, the organization, the charity, built a well right in the middle of the village thinking this is gonna solve the problems. They came back in a year and nobody used the well. The women did not use the well. And when, Why? Asked, Why? when asked, they said, well, the only time we as women get to talk to one another without the rest of our community without the men in the community kind of watching us and listening is on these walks. That's where we su provide support to one another and sisterhood. Why would we give that up? Um, but if the organization had just asked the women, the women who collect the water, where they could cite a well, they would have cited it in a place that was actually useful for the community. I mean, it's interesting. We've been hearing all day about the solution having to match the community in which it's offered. If it doesn't, you know, if you're taking away uh, women's time to, to talk to one another without the watchful eye of others, then it's perhaps not the best solution. There are several women's uh, associations, initiatives in the world. Why are we? Uh, why was the Women's Environment and Alliance so important for you, Kahir? So I joined Women's Earth Alliance about 12 years ago. Um, at the time, they were one of the only organizations that were looking at the gender and climate nexus, that really critical intersection of women's rights and, gen and climate change. And it's not to say, I don't say that because there was a lack of choice, I say that because there's um, a values alignment there. I wanted an organization that took an intersectional approach uh, recognizing the holistic nature of our issues and the holistic need for our solutions. And Women's Earth Alliance was that. Um, and I also think, you know, Women's Earth Alliance, we do not really operate on a top-down approach. Our, the solutions that we are supporting through women's leadership aren't top-down solutions. They're from the grassroots up. And at the end of the day, I am an indigenous woman from a isolated, climate vulnerable island community and I am going to be accountable to that community, to my elders, to my ancestors, to my descendants and one day my, they will ask me, those ancestors will ask me through the mouths of my grandchildren, what did you do to create change? And I want to be able to say I listen to the solutions from, from our communities. I listen to your wisdom passed down the wisdom that really is the only thing we have seen in our history to sustainably steward our, our earth and our communities. And 
I try to amplify those. I try to make, scale those and bring those to the world. It's very powerful when you talk about the accountability and wanting to have an, an answer uh, at what you've managed to achieve. We spoke about women being impacted by uh, the climate crisis uh, disproportionately. Indigenous women, as you just made reference to, are equally very, very impacted by uh, climate change, the most severe consequences uh, targeting, or not targeting, but hitting, let's say, indigenous women. When it terms, in terms of kind of the transformation and how things can, can change, how is we are tackling that? A great example is our work on environmental violence. Um, a few years ago, we were looking at not just climate change, but climate change inducing industries. So extractive industry in North America and the impacts it was having on indigenous women, um, indigenous women, girls, and two spirits actually. And um, we were seeing that, and in sites of extractive industry, increase in crime, increase in violent crime against um, women, increase in missing and murdered indigenous women, in drugs, um, in substance use, and so, uh, we did um, the first of its kind a uh, research report where we spent three years talking to community members. Um, and I come from a legal background, so I anticipated that the solutions, the way they would want support to help uh, addressing this would be carceral approaches, would be um, changing policy, enacting legislation, updating current legislation. Um, and while that was identified as important, what the community really asked us for was resources, a toolkit on community-based medicines and healing practices and workshops so they can educate their own community on what was going on, what environmental violence is. And so that's what we did. We worked with community members to create um, almost a recipe book of ways they could use plant medicines that they, in their own indigenous communities, for um, healing on you know, water walks and at Standing Rock, for healing from trauma after sexual abuse. Um, we had an environmental violence assessment they could take in their communities to educate their communities about environmental violence, but then also to figure out how their communities feel that they can address it. So that's an example of a really community-based solution. That, that was a request that came from the communities most impacted that we helped them to create. It's a fact, studies have shown, Kahir, that when you increase a woman's economic uh, power, or economic empowerment, you might say, uh, the outcome for families, for communities is colossal. Walk us through, give us concretely, one of the projects that you've had a hand in uh, that's, that's really stuck with you throughout your career with uh, WEAR. Yeah, so for um, more than 10 years now, we've worked with an organization called Women in Water and Natural Resource Conservation in Kenya. It was founded by a WIA leader named Rose Wamawa. Um, her pictures are probably, this is a training she led. Um, and she came to WIA in um, 2011 as part of, as a participant in one of our trainings um, through the Global Women's Water Initiative. And she got hands-on tools around economic development, around water sanitation, um, wash pro uh, projects, mentoring other women's groups to create um, sustainable design development plans, things like that. Um, and now she is leading our work in East Africa. And with her, we are supporting thousands of women. I think currently it's over 13,000 women we've trained with um, Rose and her group. And those women have gone on, for example, to launch tree nurseries because they are protecting the last tropical rainforest in Kenya. Um, the land has been completely degraded. And so rather than just planting and growing trees in the forest, women are launching tree nurseries as an economic opportunity because all of our projects have to include some sort of sustainable livelihood component. We cannot ask communities to change, to bear the brunt of the solutions that have to happen in our world. Um, so don't deforest, don't cut down trees for your firewood because it's bad for our, our climate. But then what's the solution? How are they going to access the things that they need? How are they going to make money if they're not allowed to deforest? Well, you train them. They can launch tree nurseries that can then replenish the forest, that can then sell trees and tree stands to their community members. So that's one example of women leaders creating economic opportunity or 
the program creating economic opportunities for these women leaders who then, you know, most of the time, the feedback we get from the women leaders, the first thing they'll tell us is, I was able to pay for my school children's fees for the year. Like, I don't have to worry about that for the year. The first thing a woman will do with her money is ensure her children have the things that they need. So, so that's one of the reasons that we incorporate that into all of our work. Absolutely. I mean, this fight, and we've been hearing uh, all throughout the day, this fight cannot be done alone. It needs to be a question of multi-stakeholders, uh, their involvement in kind of uh, creating, if you will, new regulation, adapting existing ones. It's challenging, though. Challenging, but not disheartening. What would you say? Um, I would say I'm stubbornly hopeful, um, as, as many of the women leaders we work with are. I've been hearing a lot of the word multi-stakeholder um, today, and I think the question that comes up for me and for a lot of community members is, are our communities one of those stakeholders? And I think they are, and if they are, then when we're looking at these, these large international schemes and bodies and, and conferences where decisions are being made, you know, when we're looking at the COPs and, and the bonds and and all these conferences where there's negotiations happening behind closed doors, how is it possible to say this is multi-stakeholder if one of your key stakeholders is not allowed in on those negotiations? So I think I'm, I'm stubbornly hopeful and I'm, I still see the challenges because if we don't have community involved, then that lends that leads the way for even more challenges down the road. We're gonna end up imposing state and corporate-centered solutions rather than community-based solutions. We will end up imposing one-size-fits-all solutions. We will end up having, because of that, inequity when we're implementing those solutions between the, for example, the developing world and the, not, the um, developed world. So I think those are some challenges we see. I don't think they're insurmountable. I think one of the best things we can do moving forward is to um, partner with communities, not just consult communities, not just check a box for consultation when we're working with indigenous communities and local communities, um, but to actually form deep and long-lasting partnerships with communities so that we can, we can center their leadership and hear their solutions and hear the needs that are actually in the community. Um, and that's what, that's pretty much the basis of what Women's Earth Alliance does. So would uh, your kind of takeaway message today, Kehea, be that all stakeholders need to be around the table or that partnership is part of the path? What would you tell us? Can I only have one? <laughs> Both of those things. And also I think like one of the things we always say is when women thrive, our communities and the earth thrive. And so that would kind of be before those two sentences, I think, because it leads nicely into them. You're right to put them in a, in a hierarchy. On that note, Gahir, thank you so much for shining a light on the wonderful work that WEA is doing. It's a real uh, pleasure to have you here sharing your experience today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so that was Kahia all the way from Hawaii uh, to speak to us today about uh, the uh, work that uh, the Women's Environment Alliance is doing. Why don't we welcome on stage now Rajindra, Rajindra Shende, founder and director of the not-for-profit Green Tear Foundation. We've been chatting uh, as we could today, uh, getting there's so much to, to say about uh, the path that you have uh, taken uh, to be, uh, you know, founding uh, this Green Tear Foundation. Uh, just to uh, recap, you were the uh, coordinating lead author of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Uh, you won the Nobel Peace Prize with that group, and hence you own kind of a Nobel Peace Prize citation. You describe the Green Tear Foundation as an action forum. You say that it's about, uh, it's to think is good, but to act is even better. I really like that. It's one thing that I pulled out from uh, your, your bio. You're tapping into the minds of youth communities, equipping them with the skills to transform the ecosystem and helping them essentially to, to build. Building blocks is key. 
Youth is at the heart of what you do. Youth, young people, uh, students. Why is the emphasis on youth so important in the work that you're doing, Rajendra? Thank you, Roshal. It's, it's nice to be getting interviewed by you, and particularly with uh, Eric Labai listening to it. So I'm inspired. <laughs> the first question itself is quite uh, more inspiring. Because at present, uh, let's look at uh, the situation that we heard throughout the day. We are really standing on a cliff. And uh, we are watching that there are two bombs that are ticking. The first bomb is about climate change. Um, and the second bomb is about demographic situation. There are about 1.5 billion youth on between age of 18 and 24. Yes, the population is getting aged more and more. Every country is facing the problem of aging. But at the same time, we have the more and more youth coming forward with out-of-box, innovative and creative ideas and telling the older generation that probably you're looking at in a very set ways of finding the solutions, but we have another way of doing it. And that potential, that potential of creation, co-creation, that potential of innovation, and that potential of bringing to the table some of the solutions which can be utilized in an urgent way is what youth is defined with. And it is also important to say that youth in the universities particularly, their minds are getting molded. Their behavioral pattern can be streamlined. Mm. They can be trained and skilled to face the today challenges by way of actually doing it and learning by doing it. And that kind of a skill exercise that the youth can do particularly in universities between age 18 and 24, is going to be extremely useful for us. And that's why youth is at the center. I mean, you use the word innovation and this idea that you need to think outside of the box because using the same ideas is not necessarily going to give uh, new results. Uh, sustainable solutions are at the forefront of what the Tear Foundation does. Thinking outside the box before uh, for your foundation looks at clean energy, at water security, at waste minimization. I ask you here, and the same question to you, give us a clear, concrete project and how it's working for you. Yeah, thinking out of box, there are a huge number of examples. I'm amazed. I don't belong to that age group of 18 and 24. But when I look at their ideas, I feel that, yes, the climate change solution is there. Some time back, there was a report on how much emission takes place by mowing your lawn. Okay, because lawn mowers use the electricity or fossil fuel to run it. Some, of course, use their muscles to push it. But most of the time, if the lawn is bigger, you use the electricity. So there are a lot of emissions that take place from there. So for making the lawn green, we probably emit a lot of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Sort of a greenwashing as well, which we <laughs> have been ways, hearing yeah. since morning. So the university in Australia as well as one university in India, by looking at the probably Australian example, and the university in California, they found the nature solutions, which is totally out of box. And that is, get the herd of sheep and make them sit down in the lawn by fencing them so that they can start eating the lawn. And amazing, the sheep eat the lawn not as a greedy one at one place. They eat it very uniformly. They also, their excreta is used as a fertilizer. So imagine what nature gives us. Nature tells us a systematic way of doing it without any emissions. So this is the way they found it. There's another one, quick one. Is the, is the university, is the MIT ADT, not the MIT USA, uh, 
And I want to know what MIT in a campus does it. I know they publish a lot of papers and, and research. But this is a MIT ADT is in India. Then they have the green campus. But we look at only the green part of it. But whatever the residue comes, whatever the leaves fall down, and whatever the residue is coming down, they collect it along with the canteen waste. There are about 8,000 students in that university. And they churn it onto the fertilizer. And they sell it. Because that fertilizer is so much that they can't use it in their campus. They have to sell it. And it is becoming very popular. So at one point of time, they have to increase the price of it so as to get more benefit out of it. And they use that money for the tree plantation, not in the campus, because there is no place in a campus now, but as a social forestry outside. Okay, so, so there are a number of examples of out of box. And particularly those who universities coming from villages, they have these nature solutions. In urban area universities, we have forgotten those nature solutions. So sometimes we need to look for the, the simpler, uh, innovative right. solution or the, right. the sound of the box. Right. I want to think a little bit about carbon neutrality, which of course is an aim for many countries by, by 2050. It means striking a balance between uh, emitting carbon and also absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. How has Green Tear, how has the foundation been kind of looking at finding that very fine uh, balance? Uh, I, I don't think that is a challenge. I think uh, learning by doing, using a springboard rather than a blackboard, and trying to incubate the talents, that itself provides a balance. And I don't think the person like me need to teach them how to get the balance. One of the things that they can do very easily is the energy efficiency in a campus. Our project is called as Smart Campus Cloud Network. The smart means it uses digital technology. Campus is a campus. Cloud is a tool for sharing the information. Mm. Now, what happens is the students start incubating their ideas for implementing in a campus. So the campus becomes a living laboratory. So you don't have to have a physics laboratory or chemistry laboratory or any uh, uh, what is called as uh, atmospheric measurements, but the ca whole campus becomes a laboratory on which you can do the experimentation of it. So start with energy efficiency. See your emissions going down. I mean, you said in the morning, uh, just now in the beginning that to think is good, but the act is better. But performing and measuring the impact is the best. And they can see the in importance of energy efficiency by emission reduction themselves, by the sensors, and by digitalization. Next step is to go for the renewable energy. And renewable energy can give you further reduction in the campus of the emissions. And then whatever you cannot do that further, you want to make it to the neutral, you go for the offsetting. So there are two ways, insetting, through the energy efficiency and renewable energy, offsetting by planting trees, either in a campus or outside a campus. So it is not a rocket science, it's not a challenge, it's doing it yourself. I think the United Nations Secretary General, I come from the United Nations DNA, so he recently said climate change may be a challenging problem, but more severe challenge is our feeling that somebody else is going to solve it. That is more serious problem. And this particular campus network of schools takes out that particular challenge totally because you yourself are doing it in a campus. Somebody else is not going to do it for you. I want to tap into your experience, Rajendra, at uh, the UN, if I may, for a second. Um, I know that you worked there for a while, specifically with the IPCC. Uh, what do you make of some of the milestones that have been set? So we spoke there about carbon neutrality by 2050. Are these uh, milestones that, in your opinion, can be reached? Should we be uh, stubbornly uh, hopeful, as we heard uh, said earlier, cautiously optimistic about you know, moving forward with this fight against climate change? 
Rochelle, at present, the way the world, the speed is going, uh, I don't think it is a possible way. See, we have a target of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Indeed. Uh, that is a challenging target. Two degrees centigrade is probably slightly relaxed target. But in the morning, uh, Eric told that the measurement in this campus already is saying we reached 1.5 degrees centigrade. Mm. So how can I say that it is possible? I don't want to have false optimism. I, I am definitely a dangerous optimist, mm. but I will not, at this speed, the way the world is going is not possible. And I feel climate change is a pandemic waiting to happen, or probably already started it, and there is no vaccine for that. And the only vaccine is, if at all I may symbolize it, is the youth in the university. They are the one who are going to make change. I mean, most of the people here, let's say eight years after, only the students will be in their prime age. The others will be probably retiring and having a retirement benefit depending on the age which Emmanuel Macron will decide. But let's say 2050, I think we will be all above 80 or 90. But the youth is the one, is the vaccine for the climate change pandemic. Okay, very, so I'm optimist for that. Very, very good analogy there about youth being uh, the vaccine. Uh, if we come back to the Tear Foundation, let's think a little bit about human habits. They're often a deeply embedded society. We've been asking today, how do we make change? How do we uh, look to evolve? And I want to get a sense from you. How do we get the younger generation who is perhaps not on board to want to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle? Yeah, there is a one initiative which was launched by United Nations Secretary General, along with Prime Minister of India, my country, is called as a life. It's a lifestyle for environment. And I think uh, only probably the youth will be able to get that because the adults are already used to some other lifestyle. And the youth can have the lifestyle which is uh, nature friendly, which could be harmonizing with the nature, uh, and it could also help in uh, reducing the emissions. How that can be done? It can be done with a combination of incentives to be given to the youth. It cannot come. You cannot say that youth is somebody who, who will learn it fast. What kind Unless of incentives are you thinking that's of? That's right. That's right. So I'm coming to it. I'm proposing a totally different idea and just an example of it. It is probably out of box. That the student gets up in the morning and then travels to the school, and in the school he eats, then probably in a canteen, then takes uh, uh, probably a round, sits in a class, and then goes back home. Let's say these are the top typical things. Now at every stage, if there are sensors put, it's not impossible to do, it's already being done. You measure the student's carbon emission. Okay. And that carbon emission can be disclosed to the president of the school or the pro-host or any other person. And the better the figure is, that student gets, gets a good credit. So suppose I travel by the public transport. The public transport should say, based on you use the sensor to use the public transport. So the information is just available. You don't have to fake, you don't have to greenwash saying that, no, today I came by public transport. It is on the record by the census. And then how much you travel is also on the record. It's not impossible to do it. And those kind of things probably will change the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I'm proposing a digitalization that today's smartphones, the coding and algorithms can be used to change the lifestyle and then the incentives and the regulations of the universities can give him a credit or can give him any other incentive. Maybe 50% less car canteen food because your today's carbon emissions was better. Yes. And the Chinese students are working on that. Today, the Beijing University and Chunghua University are trying to find such kind of a digitalization of individual carbon footprint. Do you think that could raise issues for privacy? So say it again. Could that raise issues for privacy if we're tracking? Oh. It will, it will, it will. But look, uh, 
take the, the pandemic we have just passed. Did we think about privacy issue there? We didn't. Not a great deal. No. I think we, everybody was uh, exchanging the views. You're telling that I have a COVID-19. And somebody will say, why I should declare I have COVID-19? Why I should say that uh, I need a help? Because this is my private issue. We didn't do that. And that's why I say, in a climate change is the crisis where the issue of privacy in such cases probably second, take the second priority and probably should not be used as a right for doing something. Ajinja, I just want to get a, a final uh, question from you about the priority of uh, green tear going from here. What would you say? Is it, it's a difficult question because I would imagine you have many things on the agenda, but the, the major, if you will, uh, priority for green tear. The priority is make it as a worldwide movement. And I was talking to Prohost and the president of uh, IP of Paris. Make it a global movement that all the university youth come in that. Just like a vaccine program was a movement, we have the youth in university as a movement. So for example, in India, many universities, today there are 500 universities in a network, which probably have maybe a few tens of thousands youth already working on it. And they are proceeding with uh, uh, reducing their carbon footprint. But let's say IP of Paris becomes a hub in France for the universities in France. The Peru already has one hub, hub in their Catholic uh, university to have all the Peru universities into it. So similarly, we are going to have it in UAE, the universities, if they become a hub. And then they spread this kind of an learning by doing and, uh, and uh, what you call it, a monitoring by sharing and speeding up by digitalization. And if you do those kind of things, probably we will succeed in that. So doing, so you ask the question, what is the future plan? Make it as a global movement and just do it. And no more interviews <laughs> and no more round tables. <laughs> just get on with it, really. Yes. <laughs> Rajendra, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much Thank for you. sharing the work. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So when we came, what we did was, you know, there was a lot of silences. So different departments, environmental department also having their own agenda. And uh, what we did, what our mayor did, so uh, he decided that we have to be informed. So we are a city of approximately 300,000 people. So we are a small European capital. Mm. And at the city uh, administration, we are around 500. But then we have our public companies, we have our public institutions, kindergartens, primary schools. Uh, uh, so everyone, so all together we are 12,000. So that was first, get everyone on board. And when we talked about sustainable vision, I communicated to everyone, to our legal department. I said, if you think that you don't have anything to do, with our green story, with European Green Capital, come to me, I will convince you otherwise. So you have a lot to do with that. So that was first. Second thing, being close to the people. In terms of uh, our mayor has all, all these years open door days. So more than 25,000 people were already, you know, talked to him per person to person to, you know, share their ideas, critics, proposition, whatever. Uh, so being close to them, and then I think really important thing was uh, changing those habits. Uh, if you take something away from the people, and maybe I will have the, the opportunity to share some uh, concrete e examples, then you have to give them something. You know, they have to understand why they are changing their behaviors, you know, why this is good for them. So this idea of the carrot that uh, Rajendra was, was talking about. Yeah. In, in terms of naysayers, some will say, well, look, there's only 300,000 people ultimately to convince. I want to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that convincing people in a much larger city is possible as well? Or is it infinitely more complex? I think it's possible. Of course it's possible. You have to have as much ambassador po as possible. Is the same story. I think the recipe, you know, I never talk about what, what others should do. I can just share our story. Mm. But I believe that if you have the same, you know, structure, informing at home, you know, knowing what's going on at home, and then trying to convince people and know what they need, know what they want. You have to, you, you have to go. Uh, you have to uh, go, you know, uh, to the people. You have to manage by walking around. You, you cannot do it out of your office, it's impossible. So make, maybe making the team bigger to reflect the larger size of, of, course. of the city yeah, yeah, is yeah. useful. Of course. Uh, people in uh, large cities and, and smaller cities are very attached to their cars. And we've seen, you know, it's very difficult to, to prize people. And because sometimes there's just no option. Other times, you know, it's, it, it's habit. Uh, one thing that uh, Ljubljana did was to modify the traffic flow within the city, uh, limit motorized traffic, and give priority to pedestrians. How difficult was that be to convince people that actually they might not need to depend quite so much on their vehicles? Today, it's a nice story because we succeeded. But uh, like 16, 15 years ago when we started, it was quite difficult. We had a demonstration in front of our city hall. So what we did, we decided to close the city center for motorized traffic completely, not only for private vehicles, also for public transport, so also for buses. So people said, yeah, it's you know, a nice idea, but please not for me. You know, I live in the city center or my favorite restaurant is there or I work there or I don't know, my hairdresser is there, please not for me. Um, but we stick with that knowing that we have to, you know, not, I'm coming back to what I said before, we have to give something to the people. So we closed around 10 hectares of the surface in the city center, uh, just morning delivery. We have with spe special permits, but we have implemented, for example, uh, electric vehicles free of charge, called Cavaliers, that people can use um, all the time. The, the drivers are really kind, they're really good ambassadors, know everything about a city. Uh, we have built additional bridges, 13 bridges we built or refurbished to shorten the distances for the people. So we did a lot of that, refurbished uh, completely the whole city center. So we tried to give something back to the people. And what happened, it was, for example, in model split before that change, uh, it was around 19% of people walking, distances three to five kilometers, and 60% driving cars, and then 13 with bikes and, and uh, public transport. Afterwards, uh, the model split change, uh, changed 
uh, in percentage that instead of 19%, 35% of people walked and instead of 60%, 41% uh, uh, of people drove their cars. So a big, a big change happened. We implemented bike sharing system. I know that you all have bike sharing systems in your cities, but what happened in Ljubljana, and that is something I, we have to consider always what the situation is in the city. You know, when you're watching other cities and what, uh, other examples, you have to know what is possible to implement in your city. And Ljubljana is a small city, it's compact, mm. it's flat. So this bike sharing sy uh, system has now more than 200,000 registered users in a city with 300,000 people. Not too shabby. Not and too we bad. have more than 55,000 active users. That means that they, have been dri they drove their, their bike in the last uh, three months. So it's really, you know, popular. Then we have car sharing system that is 100% uh, electric. So going away from fossil fuels and uh, many more examples like that. It's so interesting. So the carrots clearly have worked, whether it's, you know, free access to electric cars, to bikes, the bridges, encouraging people to walk more. All of those carrots getting citizens together and raising their environmental awareness. I want to talk about uh, procurement policies because another thing that your city did was to implement green procurement uh, policies. 70% of all city purchases, purchases, I can't speak today, purchases. It's been a long day, you know, <laughs> and you're speaking all day, so <laughs> thank you. Had to kind of, you know, meet that criteria. Again, that must have been pretty challenging. How did you kind of get those purchases up and running? I think that uh, national level helped us here because Slovenia was one of the first countries, if not the first one, that adopted the EU recommendation about the green public procurement mm -hmm. as a binding regulation, so that helped us. But yes, of course, we decided what we want. We decided to go green, we decided to, to be sustainable, and that's why we've been always analyzing markets, what's happening, what the new solutions are, and then decided for you know, for that kind of things. With really small and simple examples, like for, for example, we decided that our um, uh, paper towels, hygiene paper, you know, that we are using toilet paper uh, in, uh, in the city administration, in our kindergartens, in our public uh, uh, institutions, uh, we are buying the one that is made out of uh, recycled packaging of uh, milk and juice. So it's a small, small difference that you, that you can do, but you know, it can mean a lot. And then it's easier to convince your citizens to follow your, your example. I would imagine uh, in 2016, when you won this uh, European Green Capital Prize, many uh, European cities and those further afield looked to you for inspiration. Wow, how did they manage uh, to do this? A pretty uh, nice position to be in with people kind of looking up uh, in awe at what your city was able to achieve. How can you or how have you uh, tried to inspire other cities who are looking to make the same kind of changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. I don't know if we are, yeah, of course, we are inspiring other cities, but at the same time, we are learning actively, which is really a win-win situation. I have to say that, yes, we won that award, but we had some really good predisposition. We have, you know, Ljubljana really is a green city. When I talk about that, we have, like, almost three-quarters of all the surfaces are green surfaces. We have... 560 square meters per capita of green areas. So what was, I think, crucial for us was not just changing things that were not sustainable, but at the same time knowing that we have to preserve what is sustainable already. So green spaces, biodiversity, high quality potable water, and so on. And what we did in, in sharing our story, we just kept our, our doors open all the time. So we are active in different uh, city networks, Eurocities being the biggest uh, of them, uh, being really ready you know, for all the study visits. Uh, there are a lot of people are coming to, to Ljubljana. When we won this title, we thought, okay, we will be a role model for our part of Europe, so central and southeastern part. Uh, for the Balkans, uh, but now everyone is coming, you know, from Scandinavia that we look up to them, you know, in, in terms of cyclism, in terms of different sustainable stories, but a lot of uh, countries and cities are, are coming to Ljubljana, and as I said, I'm always asking and learning at the same time.
Um, I'm sorry. I think your city will have some visits from IP Paris as well. We're being sold here, definitely wanting uh, to head out to check out you, you, your city. Uh, we know that the jury uh, who you know, decided that you'd be the European Green Capital uh, in 2016, we know that they took into account the city's uh, sustainability uh, strategy, the vision of 2025. I just want to get a, a, an idea from you about what that vision looks like now going forward, having learnt what you have over the last few years. We are preparing new vision, 2045. We have a new deputy mayor now since uh, the January, no, December last year. And uh, he's an uh, architect and urbanist, so we all know that urban planning is the crucial part of, of preparing the vision, so he's now in head of that. Um, but, and we are also part of the Mission 100, so going carbon neutral by 2030. We all know that it's, you know, it will be tough, uh, maybe even impossible. But uh, anyway, we, we want to go uh, and, you know, we want to just go further on that path. We try to include uh, the private sector because we know it's, we cannot do it alone. Uh, and all the other stakeholders that we are working with. I think the important questions for the future are uh, how to be self-sufficient in the field of food, in the field of energy how to be better in waste management, how to be better in circular economy. So all of, this, all of that is happening now in, in um, creating new vision. What is challenging for me personally and also I think for my colleagues are these uh, fast changes that are happening. You know, you have to be really clear about your basic values because other things are happening really fast. And then you have another thing that happened in being European capital involving everyone is that now our, our citizens are really much more demanding uh, about uh, sustainability. You know, they are really very much aware of what is going on, which is good. I always say we can be better and faster and, and we can go, uh, you know, further together. It's normal, but uh, we have much more criticism now. You know, yeah, you are European, or we are European green capital, and we still have, I don't know, some waste dump there. Or we still don't have electrified uh, public transport. Or we, so we have a lot of really active communication with, with our citizens, and it's much more difficult than it was like 10 years ago when we prepared all of those things. Uh, so that will be a big challenge. And what I wanted to say, and then citizens, they, they come and they say, look at Vienna, they have this, you know, they're the city with the highest quality of life. Maybe they say, look at Paris, you know, different things. And then it's really difficult to explain that, yes, we see those things, but at the end of the day, we have to decide which things we can take, we can implement. Uh, you know, uh, there are some solutions that maybe Paris as a big city or Vienna or, I don't know, maybe Oslo, Copenhagen are suited and Ljubljana you know, has to, has to do it a bit differently. So that, that is this big challenge, and I try to return to these basic, basic values that we have. So being green, being hel healthy, trying to create this high-quality environment for our citizens and for people that come into Ljubljana and stick to that, because all the other things are really changing really, really, really fast. Okay, so keeping what's essential for uh, Ljubljana uh, is key. It's interesting, isn't it? The more you achieve, the more that ultimately the bar is set high and, and people are, are, are expecting more, which is interesting, you know, citizens Which are, is good. Absolutely. Which is good absolutely. at the end of the day, but it's hard. <laughs> it's hard, but yeah, as you say, citizens have the right to kind of demand yeah. the best for their city. At Tia Shafiko, you're the Deputy Mayor of Ljubljana. Thank you so much for coming in to speak to us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. Yeah, Thank you. Paris. Uh, welcome uh, on stage now. We had, I mean, I just want to wrap that up because the experience sharing is so key. Um, it's really good to have uh, three individuals from such different projects from different parts of the world come up and explain the work that they're doing. And we keep hearing it over and over again, the very fact that we cannot do this alone. And this is what this international forum is about today. We need each and every one of us implicated, even if it's at our small level, uh, to work towards uh, tackling climate change.
I'd like to welcome next to the stage, uh, we were going to have uh, the UAE ambassador, but we have in place uh, Ali Al-Mori, who is uh, looking at, who's in charge of, I understand, Ali, the uh, 2028 or COP 2028 activities at the UAE uh, ambassador, uh, embassy, I should say, here in France. So if I uh, take it, uh, let you come up to the stage. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be speaking at this special event. I would especially uh, like to thank uh, Chairman and President Eric Labbe for his invitation. <clears throat> Today has been a great opportunity to come together as scientists, politicians, diplomats, corporates, and representatives of civil society to further understand and discuss ways of addressing climate change. This collaborative spirit is exactly that with which the UAE plans to host COP28. By making it an inclusive, actions-driven conference that leaves no one behind. COP28 is different from other COP summits as it will host the first ever global stock take measuring the world's progress on the targets laid out by the Paris Agreement. Much of what we have heard today tell us there is more to do. We are off track. And to reach our goals, we need a moment of real community, cooperation, and transparency to embark the world on the right path to limit rising temperatures and keep 1.5 within reach. Our path is clear. We need to triple global renewables by 2030. Hydrogen production must be doubled by 2030. And carbon emissions must be slashed by 43%. Through consultation, collaboration, and determination, COP28 aims to deliver an action plan that seeks, that speaks to the global south and the global north, to the public and the private sector in order to achieve concrete results. All of us, especially in the global south, have seen firsthand the effect of climate change over the years. The assessment is clear. We need real, urgent action and robust regulations to hold everyone accountable. As a country prone to extreme weather, the UAE has had to continuously adapt and evolve to become the dynamic nation that we are today. We know what is at stake, and our commitment to fight climate change is not new. In fact, we were the first country in our region to commit to the Paris Agreement, and the first to set out a roadmap to net zero. Rising temperatures are not just a concern for us, they are a matter of survival. Let's be realistic. Considering the growth of energy demand, we know that the energy sources used today will continue to be part of the global energy mix in the foreseeable future. As such, countries around the world must work together to decarbonize while we build a new system, one capable of transitioning even the most heavy emitting industries. We must be laser focused on phasing out fossil fuel emissions while phasing up viable, affordable, zero carbon alternatives. This is why the UAE started over two decades ago, diversifying its economy and embracing the energy transition. Today, over 70% of our economy is non-oil based. And our target is ambitious, hit net zero by 2050. We are already taking decisive action to meet this goal. 
We are one of the world's leading investors in renewable energy, operating three of the largest and lowest cost solar plants in the world. But one nation cannot fight a global challenge alone. This threat affects us all, and the scale of investment needed to achieve a clean energy transition requires a collective effort. Regulation cannot happen in a vacuum either. Cross-border partnerships are essential to make a lasting impact on the energy transition. The success of France-UAE partnerships in the field of energy is a case in point. By bringing together the vast resources and expertise of our two nations, we have redefined what is possible and accomplished milestone projects on the road to sustainability. One such project is the Al Dafra solar plant, which is set to become the world's largest solar plant and is the result of the close cooperation between Paris and Abu Dhabi at all levels. Another example would be NG at Masdar, capitalizing on their synergies to develop projects with a capacity of at least two gigawatts by 2030, with a total investment in the region of over four billion euros. More recently, Airbus and Masdar signed an agreement to support the development and growth of the global sustainable aviation fuel market, one of the most polluting industries in the world. Partnerships and cooperation across all sectors, public and private, are happening everywhere to address the challenge of climate change. Looking ahead, we need a collective, concentrated push to make sure impactful policies and regulations are implemented on a global scale. This month of June will be decisive in preparing for this. The first international summit on a new global financing pact announced by President Macron at COP27 will lay the groundwork for a new contract between the countries of the North and the South to address the global crisis. Key issues on the agenda include reforming multilateral development banks, solving the debt crisis, and finding innovative financing measures such as international taxes, special drawing rights, and so on. To unlock increased global action, we must ensure the delivery of existing public finance commitments and obligations. It is vital that by this year, developed countries demonstrate that they are fulfilling the $100 billion commitment on climate finance. Regulation is essential for this, and that is why our frameworks must keep evolving to ensure we reach our objectives. And while agreements and regulations set the framework, we need to ensure that public and private collective action follows. Delivering on the Paris goals will require broader transformation and reform of the international financial system and mobilizing private capital. What I can tell you today is that as part of its push to support vulnerable countries and build resilience, COP28 will aim to double financing for adaptation, reaching $40 billion annually. The poorest nations make up over half of the world's population yet they account for only 12% of global emissions, while 800 million people have no access to energy at all, giving back to vulnerable nations that have suffered losses from climate change will be our priority. The decision for the UAE to host, to host COP28 is a real honor for us. We are deeply committed to ensuring it is a real turning point in our concerted efforts against climate change. What will be decided in December will chart a path for the years to come and will be a determining factor in whether we can reach the goals we have set for our planet. All are welcome, and everyone is entitled to a seat at the table. My country and our embassy here in Paris are hard at work to make this COP a success. And in this journey, every voice counts. If you would like to take part in these discussions, please reach out. We want to hear from you all. Thank you. Ali 
of the uh, UAE Embassy in Paris. Thank you very much for sharing a vision uh, going forward for the COP28 uh, summit. For our closing speech, I turn my attention to uh, Kez van der Beek. He's the Vice President of the Research of Institute Polytechnique de Paris. He'd like to reflect on the importance of today's conference that's gathered participants from far and wide, as we've been saying, uh, to share their expertise, research vision of how to combat climate change. So, Kez, over to you. Yes, Rochelle, thank you very much indeed. So, it's truly an honor, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, here with you, uh, with all of you, uh, to the end of this uh, 2023 ed edition of the uh, Reflexion Conference here at the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. You have seen many discussions, many presentations on a very broad set of topics, all linked to climate change, and I hope that uh, it was thoughtful, that it brought about your thought, made us think that they were enlightening. Uh, and in spite of the seriousness of uh, the threat, that there is maybe some uh, glimpse of hope and of a path uh, that we can follow to solve these very serious issues. So to make, when we were preparing to make the, uh, the discussion as fruitful as possible, what we sought is, first of all, plurality to gather a wider range of competences, experiences, expertise. But first of all, we are an institute of science and technology. We are scientists. We want to put science back at the center. If we want to solve a problem, look at it scientifically and try to find the best solution. It's the spirit of Institut Polytechnique de Paris since its founding four years ago in 2019. And it's the roadmap that we are following. We wish this institution to be at the highest level, international and unified around the, around the common concern, the common objective. That's to apply science, to find solutions for innovation, for society and for the common good. In order to do this, we reach out for our education and research to the best talents on this planet. And that's what happened today. Today, we welcomed the very best experts on the issues of the regulation of climate, of uh, coming from all over the world. Scientists, decision makers, representatives of NGOs, business leaders, students, they were all to the, here today to share their ideas, their good practices, and to combine strengths on how we can uh, think about build and implement regulation, the most efficient rules to do something about climate change, but also about other things, inequity, etc. I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank uh, Madame panier Runacher, the French Minister of the Energy Transition. I wish to thank warmly also uh, Mrs. Teresa Ribera, Spanish Minister of the Ecological Transition. I really want to thank uh, Excellency Mrs. Hint Olataibi, who is the United Arab Emirates ambassador to France. Thank you for being here. Even if it was remotely, I would like to very warmly thank all of you, especially those who have traveled from far away. And thank you so much, Rochelle, for leading the debate with energy, with wit, with intelligence. So what did that science have to say as to regulation? Well, I think the first takeaway no delay. It's been said for so many years, but here we are, no delay. There's another point, which is equity. We can talk, we can think, but it was said by the previous speaker and many others, there are those who don't have access to the infrastructure, to the means to contribute. We should help them together. It's a global issue to think together about solutions and how to implement these solutions how to implement laws and agreement. If we could do it as institutions, as states, uh, groups of states, we will gain in credibility and mobilize global communities. Then there is, what does science tell us? A systemic approach. We won't solve the climate issue without thinking also about other indicators, biodiversity, world food supply, energy supply, etc. 
There are the diverse tipping points, they are related and we can ignore none of them. It's the same thing as technology. We can implement technology, but in doing so, its volume increases and it's not the road to a final solution. There is innovation also, which is how we think about, how we use technology, how we apply it. We have talked about green finance. Well, there was a bottom line, just why are we do still doing uh, fossil fuels? It's really an issue. We must innovate. There have been speakers who have insisted that the funds are there. We see it in a, in a, in a lesser uh, setting here in France. Funds can be mobilized. We've seen it during the, the COVID pandemic. Funds can be mobilized if it's necessary. We are here before a great emergency and the funds can be mobilized. These can be public funds, but also private. And even the last few speakers have all insisted on this point. It is a common issue and we should all mobilize. Bonds must be sustainable. They should be truly sustainable, no greenwashing, which will just lead to skepticism and the population, the society turning their back on the issues. As technology, green technology adds to more technology and not necessarily to innovation, it can even defeat the problem, make it worse. Green finance can finally add to finance, so we need to innovate here as well. About market regulation, consumer choices, again, the issue of equity. There is not only sustainability, but can we afford it? Can everyone afford it? It's not clear at all. I know the answer at the moment is no, and we have to have everybody on board. And so, again, we have to have a systemic approach. Companies are in the same situation, like in the treadmill. Sustainability, yes, but they have to survive. They have to make a profit. They have their balance. How do we solve this? And the only thing is, again, by working together. I believe it has been said many times, uh, working together by trust and by regulation that is built together with all society's actors. The president of our Institut Polytechnique de Paris, Eric Labaye, in the beginning of this uh, conference, he highlighted the assets that we have at Institut Polytechnique de Paris in sustainable development. We try to move ahead on our own road together with our partners. There is the interdisciplinary center E4C, its living lab. We are very proud of it. It's the first step on the road uh, that we wish to follow. So many of its researchers were here today and I hope you could exchange with them. There is the climate plan at Institut Polytechnique de Paris that we have developed and are still developing. But I think that most important of all, what we have at an institute such as ours, it's training, it's the young, it's the training of the youth, the students that come here every day and are building our future. The youth of today, and you've seen a small sample of them here today, with their worries, their problems, the issues that preoccupy them, they are the leaders of tomorrow. It is our responsibility that they arrive in that tomorrow fully equipped, well-trained, with the scientific knowledge and understanding to face these issues. Maybe generations fail, but new generations stand up, and it is our responsibility to prepare them and to train them for these greatest of challenges. Therefore, I should like to thank all the students who participated in this international conference, all those who will be writing the white paper based on today's discussions, and which will provide uh, summary and recommendations to decision makers. I'm a researcher and I know how important it is in my work to be challenged, to be challenged by young people, to be proved wrong. That's how discoveries are made and how innovation is done. So for today, I would really like to thank Alicia Bassier, Yekaterina Gorsch, Johanna Trottin, Mathias Gilbert, Margot Milaret, Ulysse Collet, Lena Monas, Audrey Beauvais, Baptiste Vier, Isabelle Steger, Anselme Godard, and Marius Le Enaf for all their contributions. 
Today, I think the big takeaway is we cannot manage without education. We cannot manage without science. Uh, going through this century without it is hopeless. So we must put it at the forefront, pursue it, and develop it, and convince society of its usefulness. The second takeaway is we must collaborate with all stakeholders in society, public, private, local, international, and it is our duty to contribute to building trust between them. We hope that the white book that will be written will be a small stone, a small tool that will help current generations to lay the foundations for this, inspire future ones, future engineers, researchers, scientists, decision makers. Thank you so much for being here. We are thinking about the next uh, reflection. It will be in uh, two years from now at IP Paris. So I hope to see you all. And again, thank you. I applaud you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>